Is yeah. there a text difference? I'd like to come back to this one. Come back, because if, yeah, it, if, if it's, it's in, the same... I think it's included in 20045. Uh, no, well, I, I was going to double check, but I believe when I looked at them last night that that one was included in here. All right. All right. All right. All right. We'll come back to it. Okay. What's next? 2060 are the mortality tables. That Judge, our objection was they gave us 60 pages. They didn't tell us which page they're putting in. Surely they're not planning on putting in over 60 pages of, maybe they are, but that was our objection. What, what pages are, do you want to use? We'll be happy to look at it. Which tables are you going to seek to use? Oh, and the reason we put it all in was completeness. We didn't want them objecting. We didn't put the whole thing in. Uh, Judge, if, if you flip through these, you'll see they are separated out by male, female. I, 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 I've yeah. seen mortality tables many, many times. I'm asking you which one or ones do you wish to use? Non-Hispanic, white. No, I, Judge, a page. Just, yeah. What, what page number? I, I can't believe that this is necessary for today. It, it, if right, they want to give us their page numbers, we'll be happy to look we'll at it. We'll carry it over tomorrow. We'll adjust yeah. the page numbers. Thank you. Next, Your Honor, is uh, 2175. These are text messages produced to us between two of the oppositions. Your Honor has seen these on several occasions before. There was a motion in limine filed before the last trial in which they tried to exclude these. The court ruled in our favor in that issue. Uh, again, it's an exchange between Dr. Laura Vos and Dr. Tepa Sanchez, two of the critical care physicians that were involved with Maya's case during the admission. Okay, but what am I physically looking at right here? You're looking at the text messages as they were produced to us with the redactions. Are you on 2175? This doesn't look like a text message. This looks like a call on. It's 2175, page one. Maybe a voicemail message. Page it's one. next page, Judge. There, there, there we start with the text message. Zero, zero, 003. Keep going. There we go. Can you zoom in? And so who's in the green again? We need to continue the next page. No, no. Who's in the green and who's in the blue? Um, Your Honor, I believe Dr. Tepa Sanchez is in the blue. We have a demonstrative aid that clarifies this issue. And Dr. Vos. Who's the other? Those are the two in the conversation. Okay, and what page or pages of this document are you seeking to use? This this page here, Your Honor. And then this so, page. So when you say this page, let's three. Page three. Yes, Your Honor. And page four. Okay. Anything else? I don't believe so. Unless they want for completeness, I mean, it, the documentation of exactly when and where was in with it. The kind of metadata is contained on that additional pages. Judge, um, we object to page four. These uh, text, four, please. text messages. First of all, have no relevance to any of the claims currently before this jury. They don't go to any of the allegations regarding any communication with the, uh, the plaintiffs. There's no indication that the plaintiffs ever knew about these text messages until well into this litigation. They don't go to, to battery. They don't go to uh, negligence. They don't go to breaches of standard of care. These are text messages months after either of these doctors had any contact with any of the Kowalskis. And so we object to them being uh, admitted. We object to testimony regarding them. Well, I mean, I, over the weekend, overruled the... Well, we were going to ask to revisit that with your judge, actually. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to let in pages three and four. So I guess the question is, do you want the balance of the document or just pages... No, I think this I shows the time two. and date of them on the right. The rest would be just a duplication of the same messages, Judge. 
So, so it's two, three, and four, uh, Mr. Whitney? Uh, two, three, and four, Your Honor. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we, we, again, we object to relevance. Okay, I, I'm going to receive pages two, three, and four of Exhibit 2060. Judge, can we inquire? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I apologize. 2175. Can we inquire the court as to the relevance of these text messages done in January? We honestly don't understand the relevance to. Your Honor, uh, Maya in that hospital was treated like property and dehumanized. And these confirm that. They refer to her rather than her name as ketamine girl. And her treatment. They refer to the involvement of Sally Smith earlier on. Parent agency is an issue in this case. Um, they refer to the attitude towards the mother and the intentional infliction of emotional distress. All of these things are materially relevant to this lawsuit. The methodology of, of grief counseling is also important. Judge, we disagree that that's relevant to any of the issues in this case. I, I, I see that these uh, text messages are highly relevant in this case, and I'm going to overrule the um, request not to admit the, the text messages. What's next? Your Honor, we'd, I'd like to skip uh, down to the second page, if, if we could. To, to the second page? Yes, of our exhibit list for today. And uh, focus for a moment on 2529-055. If you could pull that up, please. This is a photograph of Maya Kowalski with a friend and fellow patient of Dr. Cantu's while in Mexico. She's been questioned about this witness in depositions, and uh, we'd like to use it during Maya's testimony this morning and this afternoon. Well, what, what relevance does this other person have, and why are we uh, invading that person's privacy? The, well, she's, she's gone, Judge. She, she passed. The witness passed. Well, that family's privacy. And she was an adult at the time, I believe. She was over, was she over 18 at the time? So, Judge, the uh, relevancy is this is another patient for the treatment. It was Maya's uh, friend there, and the mothers were friends as well, and that's indicated there. You can see that this patient has CRPS of a pretty uh, amazing degree, and we can show you in the next photo we're moving in. That's our yes. Oh, the, the, with the leg, okay. So there's a companion photo that is in evidence, Judge, and we just found this uh, with uh, Ms. Maya Kowalski uh, yesterday. She, she, she didn't know she had this one. Um, and, oh, it has been our list? We just forgot to move it in. So there you go. And if you compare the two photographs, you'll see that uh, this, uh, that the friend here has significant CRPS as identified by the uh, lesions on the leg. And uh, Maya Kowalski can testify to the degree she has. And the important thing is- You already have photos at this time of Maya Kowalski's CRPS. So why are we putting in this other photo? What, what relevance does this other person have in this case? The relevance is that she has advanced CRPS and is still capable of smiling and appearing as though she's not in, quote, ultimate pain, despite the fact that she has this debilitating disease, as does Maya Kowalski. And it also goes to demonstrate the atmosphere and the uh, care that was taken at the hospital during the ketamine infusions in Mexico. And so, and we're going to have to get into all of this. Judge, it's our understanding that this young lady died under Dr. Cantu's care, but beyond, so that will have to be discussed if this comes up. But beyond that, who's testifying that this young woman in the photo with Maya has CRPS? There's no doctor that's coming in. It's a, it's a, remote issue. It's not relevant. There's already pictures, several, at least three, I believe, at least two I know of, that of Maya 
while she's under Dr. Cantu's care of her smiling and in the wheelchair. So it's... This photo, which is 2529-00, sorry, 055, is uh, not appropriate. Uh, it's going to introduce other issues that are collateral to this lawsuit, and it would be cumulative with respect to um, photos of uh, Maya Kowalski at the time that she was with Dr. Cantu in Mexico. What's next? 2583-007-008. This is a, a birthday card written by Beata Kowalski uh, on or around December 10th, 2016, that the Kowalskis attempted to get to Maya and was intercepted by the hospital and never delivered. And Maya can authenticate it as her mother's writing. That's for all. Oh, I can't see the page eight. I'm sorry, Judge. Um, 2583-007 and 008. Yeah. Judge, the, uh, here it is. Sorry, I was looking for my copy of it. Um, we object that it's hearsay. We object uh, that there's no testimony that this was intercepted by the hospital. What is the foundation for that? Um, those are our objections. I, on the hearsay. It's not offered for the truth of the matter. It's offered for notice as to the existence of this birthday card. And, and most judge, important, I, Judge, this, the fact is there are a number of these items that were intercepted by Ms. Beattie or someone else at the hospital, and we can demonstrate that. And Maya Kowalski can testify to learning later about these. And so this goes to the standard of care or non, non, lack of standard of care in terms of how they treated Maya Kowalski at the time. And we can show several different items that were sent to go to Maya Kowalski, were intercepted, and never received. Now, we only have a few because we only retrieved a few. But the court will see as the testimony goes on that this is one of a series of things that goes towards their plan, intent, motive, and uh, generally the, stand, the, the care that Maya received there. Judge, first of all, this interception issue, was it by DCF? There's no testimony to substantiate, and I don't know how Maya would know who intercepted them if she didn't get them. And that's going to leave another implication with this jury that is not uh, substantiated and, again, blur the lines between DCF and Johns Hopkins. How, how is the plaintiff going to get the testimony that this card was actually transmitted to the hospital. Jack Kowalski will be on the stand this morning and can testify that he delivered this card to the hospital. Okay. We only have a copy because Beata took a photograph before it was delivered to the hospital. If they want to bring in someone to say that there's DCF personnel in the hospital intercepting birthday cards, so be it. But the hospital had possession of this card. Not only that, Judge, like I said, we can demonstrate that Ms. Beatty did this on other occasions. And so this would go towards that. Well, how about who did Mr. Kowalski provide this card to? Let, just saying the hospital is probably not good enough. Who, who did he give it to? Coming in, I believe he had to give everything to Ms. May we? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Kowalski. He's right there. able to move on to the next one? Yes, Your Honor. 2597-015, is that the next one? Yes, Your Honor. Judge, you've already ruled on this. They previously attempted to get it in when they put in the package of photos. Number 15 was specifically denied. 
This is a different than the photos that were excluded. This is a photograph in the room, and Maya Kowalski will testify to these were the cameras in her various rooms. Judge, this is exactly the photo that they tried to admit the other day. It's part of 2597. You specifically did not admit number 15 along with the other photos of the cameras. It's the exact same argument they made. It looks very similar to something that I've seen and, and precluded. Well, Your Honor, then we'd ask you to reconsider because Maya will testify that these cameras existed in her various rooms that she was moved around in. And so and it's relevant to how she was observed in this hospital. And considering the fact that they have made a big deal about Maya Kowalski self-harm by scratching herself, and these lesions were not lesions, they were scratches, the issue becomes if you had a camera in there and you were so concerned about this child's health or that she was faking it or that, to use Sally Smith's words, this was all a charade, one would think it'd be relevant and material that they had the, ob they had the ability to observe her any time they wanted in these rooms. And in fact, the court's aware they did so on for a 48-hour stint. Is this the EEG room where she was secretly videotaped? No, Judge. This is her hospital room, and that's why it's important. They had the ability to observe Maya at all times, and the court will see as the testimony comes on. And, and again, this is a 90.105. I mean, if we don't demonstrate through the course of our case, that they were saying that Maya did things that she never did, we should be able to ask them, well, you had, in fact, you know, we're going to ask them, you had, had camera phones, uh, phone cameras, rather, where's the evidence? If this is such a big deal, why isn't it in the medical records? Why didn't you take any pictures? Why didn't you, obviously, you were concerned there, put her in a room where you could watch her to make sure she didn't inflict self-harm. Apparently, they did this, although I don't think it's for self-harm. So this is relevant material. It can be stricken if we don't lay the proper predicate as time goes on. But right now, we need Maya Kowalski to identify this. We want to move it into evidence and then subject to under 90.105. Yep. This is the exact same argument they made when they tried to put this exact same photo in the other day. There's no – they want to leave an implication that we had film – that we're not showing the jury. There's no evidence of that. This is highly prejudicial to the defense, and there's no evidence that there, in fact, was any video or any recording done. My, my, uh, I'm going to stick with my original ruling. I'm going to preclude the admission of 2597-015. Now let's go back to 2583-007008. Who did we give... Who'd you give the card, the, this birthday card to? The birthday card would have been to uh, Kathy Beatty. And you're going to testify under oath you handed yes. it to Kathy yes, Beatty? Yes, Your Honor. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, we, okay. I mean, we have documentation evidence to the contrary. If he wants to take the stand on that, we, full disclosure, we have an email from Yada Kowalski emailing this card to Charlotte LaPorte at DCF, but if Mr. Kowalski wants to take the stand well, and testify to the contrary, well, the, how, 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 how could, I mean, maybe it was a picture of the card, mm -hmm. but the actual physical card. Right. Okay. Well, we, we have the email. The email chain regarding this card was from Yada Kowalski to Charlotte LaPorte at DCF looking for clearance on the matter. Yeah. Again, two forms of delivery as the court spotted. Yeah. I, assuming I'm going to get under oath testimony that he handed this card to Miss Beatty. I wrote it down. Okay, yeah. then I will admit 2583 007 and 008. What's next? Do you need Mr. Kowalski to leave at this point, Your Honor, or may you stay in? He's a party. He can stay if he wishes. If he wants to go outside, that's fine too. Okay. All right, Your Honor, we have sure. just a few yeah. minutes, and uh, well, you we have three okay. exhibits we need to discuss, if we can get to them, please. I'd like to begin with 2116. The court has seen these text messages. The I'm last sorry, time. I don't have that on my list. 2116? 2116 is these text messages between Dr. Sally Smith and Paula Dees. With, with the it's down thing. under the carryover exhibit portion yeah, of this list. I don't... That wasn't on okay. my. The, the reason that, that we're wasn't on the again. exhibit list I got, Judge. 
It's been addressed previously. The last time the issue was with redactions. We wanted to show the court that the redactions have been made, show the defense the redactions have been made, and have it admitted now that the redactions have been made. Judge, I don't know why, can, if I can have a moment to look at them, and I don't know why this is essential for either of these witnesses since they're not party to any of these texts. <laughs> they put Maya in a room and videotaped her for 48 hours. Have you previously given the redactions to... Yes, Your Honor. When? Judge, Judge I'm, I'm not really saying they right. haven't, but my point is this. We're going to be objecting if they're trying to use these exhibits with either Jack Kowalski or Maya Kowalski. They're not party to these texts. They're not aware of these texts at the time they're happening. So I don't I fail to see why they're relevant to any of the today's proceedings. And I, I just didn't look at them again because I didn't have them on my list, to be honest. My, Maya's going to be testifying about what she was told or not told about why she's been put in a room for 48 hours. And these texts establish the chain of events leading Paladis and Sally Smith to decide to put her under video surveillance. Is Maya Kowalski going to testify that she saw any of these texts, were told about any of these texts? Not at the time. Then, she, then then why are we using these texts with Maya Kowalski's testimony? It's our understanding if as a party admission and they are admitted, once in evidence, an exhibit may be used with any witness for any purpose relevant to the suit. Judge, they, they, they want to ask Maya Kowalski questions about things which she didn't know about just to put it in front of the jury. It's improper to request that a witness simply, again, read a document that they're not part of. How many pages is this document? How, how, what? how many pages is this document? Ten pages. Ms. Crowles, you might want to take a gander at it. And I, I'm just told we were provi we provided these in redacted form on October 3rd. We've also provided the demonstrative aid that we would use that is just the text messages. Judge, again, I would object to them using a demonstrative aid with this witness or Mr. Kowalski for something that they were not part of. That's not a demonstrative aid, first of all. We object to them putting up what's in evidence and calling it a demonstrative aid doesn't make it a demonstrative aid. And secondly, neither of these witnesses have any knowledge about any of these texts until well into the litigation. So it's improper examination of the witness rather than standing up and objecting at the time, Judge, since they've forecast what they intended to do. Well, that's a little bit different than the issue of whether it should be admitted. I understand, Judge. I'm sorry. I'm looking for my copy. Um, and I did. Your While Ms. Crowles is trying to find that, can we go to the next one? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, 2661. It's a, it's a video, Your Honor, of Maya Kowalski in her wheelchair at home. September 2015. Go ahead. This shows her condition at the time. Maya Kowalski will testify. Obviously, she's in a wheelchair. She'll additionally testify to this being reflective of her physical condition because she's not using the pedals on the piano because of her dystonia. Right. Ms. Crowells or Mr. Shakira? Yeah, that's fine. Um, Your Honor, we, this is undated, but we'd be, we don't see what this is probative to. They have multiple videos, cameras, photographs, and evidence. It's undated. It's not probative to any issue in the case. I'm going to overrule the, the relevance objection and admit 2661. What's next? I'm sorry, what was the date again of that exhibit, please? They contended September of 2015. Yes, I can get you the exact date. I think that's been provided previously, but I'll get it to you. Uh, next, Your Honor, is 2666. It's uh, October 4th, 2015 video of Maya Kowalski at home. 
uh, on the bathroom or kitchen floor, and, and it's showing the symptoms of CRPS, the, the involuntary spasms and the dystonia that's developing. Or your tummy, when I touch your tummy, that feels good, right? Objected to hearsay, Your Honor. And who's dating? And the date. We, we don't have an authentication on the date either. October 4th, 2015. Who? What about the uh, Beata Kowalski's statements? Not, and to the extent anybody can make them out, it's certainly not for the truth of the matter uh, asserted in any way. This is simply uh, through the course of this to find out the response and then. As the guardian, parent and guardian of Maya Kowalski, again, we believe that this is an 803-4, and, excuse me, uh, 3, because she is the guardian at that time, determining what the physical condition of Maya Kowalski was at that time. And Maya, Maya Kowalski can testify to that and verify as necessary. Judge, to revisit the date, there's nothing on this video that says the date. So for them just saying a date doesn't make it evidentiary, the date. Is there going to be testimony as to the date? I, I think we've got metadata that, that shows what the date is, but I will double check that. And I don't think, if we don't have metadata, and I'm sorry, Judge, there's a lot of exhibits. I know that we can identify it generally to this period of time, to, to it being the early mid fall of 2015 with Ms. Kowalski. And she definitely remembers that, that it was at that point uh, before she had gone to Mexico and after the point where she had been treated by uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick. I don't believe uh, Beata Kowalski's statements really are hearsay in the sense that they're being used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. But even if they were, it does seem that 90.803 parent 4 would apply because uh, Beata is asking Maya about her physical condition, which then will be relayed to medical providers. So. In either event, I do think it, it would come in. So the court will admit 266, 2666, yes, um, inclusive of the audio. So that takes. If we just go back to 2116. 2116. Is that the last one? That's the last one you need Because it's yes. past 9 o'clock at this point. Yes, uh, yeah, Judge. I, I've, I've found my copy of <laughs> 2116. Um, and so uh, we had no objection. The 2116 comes in. Redacted version. Um, oh, did you say you had no objection? Or? Right. We would object to the use of this with either of the witnesses, Judge. I guess we'll have to do that timely but uh, when they do it. But again, they're not part and parcel to these communications. So, okay. so why the court, they would be the court, allowed to testify as to them. The court receives 2116. Anything else before we bring in the jury? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, and our plan is Jack Kowalski first. How long is he going to be on the stand? I hope no more than 10 minutes. I only have a few questions, so to speak. That's a famous phrase in this courtroom now. Okay. Let's bring in the jury. Is that true? 
Please be seated. Happy Monday. Did you all have a good weekend? Glad to hear that. I want to confirm that since you were last with us that you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you did no investigation, and you received no information. Is that all correct? And has anyone approached you since the last time you were with us about this case? No. And have you seen any media coverage since the last time you were with us about this case? No. Okay. Mr. Anderson, your next witness, please. My name is called Jack Kowalski. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. State your name for the record, please. Jack Kowalski. Mr. Kowalski, were you here this past Thursday when the deposition of Kathy Beatty was played concerning certain alleged conversations? I was. Can you tell the jury whether you ever gave Kathy Beatty permission in any way to touch your child? Absolutely not. Undress your child? No. Photograph your child? No. Put Maya on her lap? No. Hug your child? No. Kiss your child? No. Say anything to your child in any way having to do with sex? No. Objection. Or video. Objection. Objection. No. Other than the transfer form in evidence to Nemours for Munchausen by proxy as the reason, did Johns Hopkins ever present you with any other attempts to transfer Maya out of there? I didn't understand that. Could you repeat that? Was the Nemours transfer form the only one you saw? I had never seen a transfer form. From Nemours? Uh, I did not. You did not see it? No. And did you ever have any discussions with Kathy Beatty having anything to do with her, quote, providing Maya comfort? No. And at any point, Mr. Kowalski, was it ever brought to your attention that there was an ongoing plan to separate you and Mrs. Kowalski and Kyle Kowalski from Maya Kowalski through adoption or foster care? Objection, uh, mischaracterization, foundation. I'm going to assume that you need to rephrase. Sure. What, if anything, did Johns Hopkins, anyone there, ever tell you about in early November of 2016 a plan or goal of transferring Maya into foster care? I was not aware of that. So, if we could, in evidence, uh, 1001-3795. And Mr. Kowalski, will you note the date there under the psychological prog progress note? What is the date? It's, uh, it's in the middle of the page. Oh, in the middle, I'm sorry. 11-2 uh, of 2016. So how long then after your admission, or Maya's admission, on October 7th of 2016 was this memo? How many weeks? No, that's almost a month, pretty close to it. Can we see the next page? 3796. If we can enlarge. Uh, there at the top, if you'd please review what has been marked into evidence. Now, did Dr. Katzenstein or anyone at Johns Hopkins inform you that within a month there was a plan 
to transfer your daughter into, quote, therapeutic foster care setting? Objection, mischaracterization, foundation, system. Were you ever made aware of what is uh, stated in the interval history here? Same objection. No, I was not. When various things, like it, did you make notes on or during the time of Maya's stay there, which, in which you documented some of the things happening? I did. Do you remember every single one of them, or specifically? Uh, there's quite a bit of things, so it'd be kind of hard to. Would it, refresh your would it refresh your recollection to see a note from that time? That'd be great. Your Honor, for the record, this is 2380. We're going to refresh his recollection, and we're going to only show it to him and not the, right. and not the uh, jury. Okay, now it can be put up. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, for the record, this is 2380-013. May I approach? Or do you already have a copy of this? I do not have it with me. No, Your Honor, this is simply to refresh. This is marked for ID. Mr. Reyes, uh, for whatever, I guess, how you two have split this up, I just saw it up on the gallery TV, and I, I have turned that off. So I'm going to need you to switch over to your table left and then run it that way. I'm sorry, we'll have to reset it. I can't have it go up to the gallery monitor. May I please record? Right, but it's going to take Mr. Ray a moment to change us some cables. May I please record? I can tell you. Mr. Kowalski, will you please review 2380-013? Yes. Does that refresh your recollection as to what notes you made and what you were told at the time about Maya Kowalski's treatment? Yes, sir. Oh, and what you observed? Yes. Maya Kowalski's treatment? What is the first point there that was of concern regarding Ms. Beatty's I just took it down. If it's being used to refresh his recollection. I understand. So I just took it down. I understand, Your Honor. Okay. You what, if anything, did Ms. Beatty tell Maya about Beata, your wife, and mental treatment? Objection, Your Honor. Leading. Overall. I remember one time I came in there and Maya asked me, she uh, asked, if mom was in a mental hospital, and I asked her why would you come up with that, and she stated that the social worker Kathy Beatty told Maya that her mom's getting mental treatment. I was outraged. Was it was that true in any way, shape, or form? No, no, it was not. And what, if anything, did you learn as to Miss Beatty's? involvement with Maya about comforting her? There was more than one time. Uh, she states that uh, Maya, when I say she, uh, Maya stated that Kathy Beatty would place Maya on her lap, stroke her hair. There was a time she said, I know I'm not your mother, but I can be. Uh, she kissed her on the cheek. Maya was not uh, acceptable of having that done. Uh, it was very disturbing to hear this. And what, if anything, did you learn about 
uh, Catherine, uh, Kathy Beattie's behavior during supervised phone calls? Um, Maya, uh, Maya would state while speaking with her mom that was a special time for both of them to get to talk to each other. Um, Kathy Beatty be supervising it. She would have her phone on, on the bed. Um, and while mom and Maya were talking about different things, Kathy Beatty be rolling her eyes or making fa facial expressions. And a very, very destructive, you know, for Maya to pay attention to mom. Uh, what, if anything, what emotions or fears did Maya have concerning retaliation from Ms. Beatty in court proceedings or because of court proceedings? Maya stated she was extremely scared to mention a lot of things. She was worried that she would not be able to go to the courthouse or talk with the judge on the phone. Um, uh, so she was very worried to say certain things um, because Kat, she was worried about Kathy interfering with her her chance to talk to the judge on the phone. What, if anything, did Ms. Beatty and or the nurses attending uh, your daughter tell her about her illness as to whether it was physical or psychological? Object uh, of speculation and contact. What, if anything, did she relate the nurses were telling her about her symptoms and her illness? Most of them said that it was all in Maya's head, and I'm sure she'll testify to that. Now, upon being told this, did you relate this to your wife? Yes, I did. And what, if anything, was her reaction? The same as mine. Which very, is, very upset. As you came home and told her about more and more of these things, describe for the jury how she was reacting. Well, like any mother would, to hear something like that going on and it's not true, she was outraged. Right. And there was nothing she could do about it. Now, at or about the time it occurred, January 6, 2017, did you make notes concerning the preparation, if you will, of Maya for her court appearing that day? Yes, I did. Do you remember everything about that, or would you need? I remember a lot of what I wrote down, um, yes. Right. Do you need refreshing, uh, your recollection refreshed, or can you just tell them? I'll, I'll try to go okay. from my memory. Go ahead. Tell them what you understood was done to your daughter immediately before going to the Courthouse. Maya was finally coming to the courthouse for the first time. Uh, and, she, and was this important to her? To get extremely to important. She was looking forward to this day. Um, she was going to go to the courthouse and then also be evaluated by Dr. Duncan. And then I believe a uh, doctor's evaluation from Dr. Hanna after that. Uh, prior to leaving the hospital, the social worker, Kathy Beatty stated that Maya needs to strip down and she has to take pictures of my daughter. Maya was not agreeable on that. She said, if you do not get the pictures, you are not going to court. Maya cried. Another nurse came in to assist the social worker and took the pictures of Maya. Do you recall, uh, immediately before we started here, seeing a, a birthday card, and for the record, Judge, it is 2583-007 and 008, written by Beata Kowalski to Maya Kowalski? Yes, I remember that card. And can you tell the court and the jury how that was delivered? Who did you deliver it to? Well, first of all, I remember that card very, dis you know, I, it, I have the memory of that card because I remember Beata. She put lipstick on her lips and she kissed the card to put the lip uh, in, you know, her lip marks on the card for her. 
Um, I did bring that card. At that time, I brought it to Kathy Beatty. Prior to that, all the stuff went to um, the CPS or whoever it was. But at, at that time, that's later on, uh, uh, Kathy Beatty was doing the scheduling for the visitations and that. So who did you hand it to? Kathy Beatty. Did you learn out? Did you learn later whether your daughter had actually ever received that card? She did not. Do you want to publish yes. uh, may we publish your honor? It's in evidence. Right. Go ahead and publish. Like I said, I remember her in this card. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if we could, uh, let me ask you whether you ever learned from Dr. Vose, Dr. Tepa Sanchez, Kathy Beatty, or really from any other doctor or nurse there, whether they had given Maya a an internal nickname. I heard of one. Um, we'd like to uh, publish 2175 in evidence, Your Honor. See, yeah, uh, just objection in terms of the time frame based on the proffer from earlier. <clears throat> when did you first learn of it? After, after she was released, right. and we publish. Uh, I think zero three and zero four. All right. If you could review that for us, Mr. Cross. Very top one. Mm -hmm. Ketamine girl. Did they ever confront you and tell you that they thought your wife taking herself out of the picture in some form would be the best thing for Maya? Object to the statement of the more. Any doctor or nurse during this period of time at Johns Hopkins? Same objection. No, the only time uh, Kathy Beatty one time asked me if I ever considered divorcing my wife. It was just a weird situation, and I, I said no. And I said, why would you ask that? And she walked away. Were you aware that Ms. Vose had another mother do the same thing, apparently commit suicide in this situation? Objection, foundation, speculation. Sustained. What, if anything, did you learn during this time that Ms. Vose had knowledge of a prior incident? Same objection, Do you know? I didn't know at that time, no. And Beata taking her own life, was this the right thing for Maya? It stays there. There's no right thing. There's no. But the basis of this conversation was never conveyed to you? No.
Mr. Kowalski. Good morning. Just to make sure I understand your testimony about the transfer, your testimony is that you never saw the transfer forms? I did not. So the rejection of transfer was made by your wife? The rejection of the transfer was made after we read the codes and found out it was not for CRPS, it was for conversion disorder or Mauchausen. The jury will see the codes again, but if I understand your testimony, even though Nemours Children's Hospital recommended this transfer was in the best interest of Maya, and even though all children's hospitals... The objection, the predicate, stating facts, and the question sustained. Okay. Even though the transfer was recommended in the best the interest of Maya, cross-examination, Yeah, that's fine, but... Okay. Sustained. The rejection was made by Beata because she did not like the way it was framed about her, correct? With that code, yes, because that didn't happen, so she was not going to accept that code on there. Even she would admit guilt. She was not asked to sign a statement of guilt, Mr. Kowalski, was she? If you sign that form and that's on there, you're signing, you're agreeing with that diagnosis, with that code on there. So no, she would not agree on that. Even though the transfer was recommended as medically necessary for Maya, correct? Sustained. Okay. Well, let me ask you about the questions about medical foster. You were aware that that was a DCF consideration being made, correct? I did not know about that. Okay. You were not aware that the question about whether a DC, whether medical foster was being made, you weren't made aware of that at the time? Mr. Anderson, you've got to let the question be asked. I understand. Okay. And then just only legal basis. Mr. Shapiro, what's your question? Okay. Did, did your lawyers ever discuss with you whether a DCF recommended medical foster was being contemplated? Objection calls for attorney-client privilege. Communications okay. sustained. I'll re-ask it, Your Honor. You were never made aware during the course of Maya's treatment that there was a DCF consideration for medical foster. Is that right? Not that I was aware of until just recently. The um, talking a little bit more about Kathy Beatty, you testified earlier to this jury that you were upset that the caregivers at All Children's were being cold to your daughter. Do you remember that? Yes. And in this situation, you heard Miss Betty by video testify that she was trying to provide comfort to your daughter when she found out that DCF was not going to release her on Christmas. Is that right? Say that again. You, you were here when Miss Betty testified by video. Yes. That the reason she was trying to comfort your daughter was because she found out that the court and DCF were not going to allow her to be released by Christmas. You heard that testimony, correct? That's what she said. Okay. She testified she was trying to provide comfort for your daughter after hearing that emotionally devastating news. True. She does not have the right to comfort a, a girl and kiss her on the cheek and stroke her hair. I'm sorry. You, you're, you knew that Miss Betty also brought your child to the chapel to pray? Yes, I, was, I found out about that. Well, you, you certainly wanted your daughter to receive communion, true? Not by Kathy Beatty. Well, let me ask you about that. Is it fair to say that you never personally witnessed Miss Betty say anything inappropriate to Maya? No, I didn't. I'm, I'm correct. You never witnessed Miss Betty say anything inappropriate to Maya, correct? That's, I never witnessed, no. Okay. The, the supervision of the phone calls that you spoke about earlier, you agreed, do you not, that uh, your wife, Beata, was making statements about Maya's medical care that were not in Maya's best interest, true? Objection. Legal basis. Assumes facts not in evidence and assumes those facts. Overruled. Say that question again. Sure. 
During the period of time where your wife was calling Maya, she was calling and demanding medical treatments, and you yourself did not agree with your wife doing that, correct? Not all the time, and my wife had the right to question medical. We still had our parent rights. You, you actually told your wife to knock it off. That was after I was told to leave the hospital. Mr. Kowalski, my question to you, yes or no, you had told your wife to knock it off when she was calling the hospital. Let me finish where that was because you're, you're taking it and putting it somewhere else. That was the day that I had to walk out of your hospital and I was told my daughter is not under my custody anymore. I drove all the way home from St. Pete. I caught myself doing 15 miles an hour driving on I-75. I was so upset. And when I got home, my wife was on the phone talking to the nurse at the hospital. And that's why I told her to knock it off. So that's where that was. So don't put it somewhere else. But you also told your wife to stop calling the hospital and demanding treatment even after that point, true? That was during that time. Mr. That was that recording. With regard to the photographs, Mr. Kowalski, <clears throat> you did not find out about those photographs until after Beata passed away, true? That I didn't see the photographs, that's true. Okay. And Beata didn't see the photographs either before she passed no. away, did she? You were unaware of the photographs at the time Beata passed away, true? Say that question again, I'm sorry. You were unaware of the photographs before Beata passed away. True? I believe that's true. One moment, Your Honor. I appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Hold on, Mr. Kowalski. <coughs> Mr. Anderson. Mr. Kowalski. DCF never told you anything about any plans to transfer your daughter out of your care? No. Did you call the insurance company to confirm those codes, the ones that were on the Nemours form? Yes, I did. Was there a place on that form, although it's in evidence, to see the, where you had to sign it as a parent in order to effect the transfer? Uh, the transfer form? Yeah. After I finally seen it, yes, there is a... And when you walked in, Ms. Beatty wouldn't talk to you much at all about what she was doing or anything, would she? No. It kind of went dark when you were there. Yes. And so during this period of time when you had your daughter taken from you in this first week without any authority whatsoever, what was the stress level between you and your wife? What would you imagine? It was extremely high. And during this period of time, can you tell the jury whether you and Beata maintained, by court order, the right to participate and direct Maya's health care? That is correct. If we could uh, bring up trial exhibit 2003-001, the All Children's Health System Summary of Patients Bill of Rights. And I'll focus you down uh, to uh, the sixth one, a patient has a right to be given. And by the health care provider. Right. Mm -hmm. And the next one, did the yep. hospital guarantee you have the right to refuse treatments? That is correct. Anything further, Mr. Shapiro? Just two questions, Your Honor. If we could put back up that trial exhibit 2003-001. Well, just in the interest of time, Mr. Kowalski, you saw it said, a patient has the right to refuse any treatment 
except otherwise provided by law, correct? Yes. And you were aware, because you had your own attorney as well, there were multiple orders from DCF governing what treatment your daughter could get, true? Say that question again. You were aware, because you had lawyers appearing before you, before the DCF tribunal, that there were multiple orders governing patient care, true? Yeah, but we tried to leave there prior to all the legal. Well, we'll, 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 we'll get back into that later, sir, but let me just ask you this about the transfer. Did you ever go to either All Children's or Nemours and say, I agree to the transfer, but I disagree with one of the codes? Did you ever do that? No. Thank you. Okay, members of the jury, do any of you have questions? Okay. Mr. Kowalski, the jury has a question. You said you did not see the photos we were just discussing. Did you have the opportunity to hear about them, perhaps from Maya as an example? Uh, at that time, uh, before I seen them, yes, I was advised uh, around that, that rate shortly after that, yes. Um, anything further from the plaintiff? Uh, no, Your Honor, the witnesses, uh, may the witness not be excused, but nothing further. Okay, you may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, members of the jury, in a moment we're going to take a break. I should have done this before Mr. Kowalski testified. There's two instructions I need to give you. I'll give you these two instructions and then we'll take a, a short break. On Friday, September 29th, 2023, you heard the testimony of Mrs. Meg Boland. She is the woman who testified by Zoom from North Carolina. During her testimony, a Facebook text message that she received on November 17th, 2016 from Beata Kowalski was introduced into evidence. That text message was introduced as evidence of Beata Kowalski's state of mind on November 17th, 2016. The text message was not introduced as proof of any of the factual statements or opinions that Beata Kowalski made in that text message. In your deliberations at the end of this case, you should consider this text message only as evidence of Beata Kowalski's state of mind at that time. So that's the first one. The second instruction. During the testimony of Dr. Henschke, there was evidence presented that Ms. Kowalski has experienced stress related to this current lawsuit. Although I have determined that this evidence is relevant to the issues in this case that you will be instructed on later, any stress that a party to a lawsuit experiences because of their involvement in a lawsuit is not a matter for which damages are recoverable in that lawsuit. Okay. With that, uh, members of the jury, we're going to take a short break. Let's try to keep it to 10 minutes. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. And we'll see you in about 10 minutes. All rise. Your
seated. Uh, Mr. Reyes, uh, now that we're done with the refreshing recollection and I don't have to worry about the gallery, you can go back to how it was. Are there any issues we need to address prior to uh, us taking a break? Nothing from the defense. Okay, let's try to keep this to uh, 10 minutes at the max. Thank you very much. We'll be in recess for 10 minutes.
Please be seated, everyone. Okay, uh, welcome back. Just for everyone here in the, in the gallery, I know it's kind of tight in here. We are opening up an overflow courtroom in courtroom F, as in Foxtrot. It's two doors down, two courtrooms down this hallway. If anyone wishes to have a little bit more space, uh, feel free. We're turning on the feed there, so you'll be able to, to see and hear just like you're in here but you'll have a little bit more arm space. Just to let you know that that will be an option if you wish. Your Honor, update on uh, Dr. Newberger. He uh, is very, very doubtful. We designated his deposition. There are three volumes. The last one is video, which we would want to show after, of course, edit. Uh, the first two are, we're not videotaped, they're just regular depots, and so, we would like to, in our uh, trial plan, play him tomorrow at some point. The defense, uh, we, we called and, and asked if they could expedite their uh, designations, but we, we wanted to just check with the court and advise you because we know how busy you are and how much stuff you've got going on and get a feel for whether it would be a, a possibility of playing him at some point tomorrow or the next day. Well. First off, will the defense have an opportunity to do what they need to do? Well, Judge, I, I've been through one volume. Um, I, you know, we got that message at some point over the weekend. I had other things I had to deal with. I've been through one volume. Um, I haven't been through the other two volumes, so I doubt that the court's going to be able to rule on them kind of in order to be edited and played tomorrow, Judge. And we have. Uh, large objections we need to deal with. Uh, we can we can put off till till Wednesday. And so the defense knows, although there are a number of designations in the first volume, the second volume has almost none. Okay. Well. Well, to the extent that there are designations, by the time we leave today, whatever designations and objections that exist, if I can have them, as well as the full size transcript. That always helps when I get the, the depot transcript. Yeah, Judge, understood. I'm not sure what exactly happened over the weekend. It was sort of a mishmash, but um, I won't be able to finish that until tonight, Judge. I, I understand, but if if it's three volumes and you've already completed one. I haven't typed it. I, oh. It's not like completed. Okay, well, if, if, it, if, if you have it. I do not. Okay. I, I was just going to try to start my work. But, I mean, if it's not, then it's not. Okay. Anything else? Uh, just if we could clarify the schedule. We understood that Ms. Kowalski and Mr. Kowalski are going to be testifying today. We have two witnesses that are in the audience that have been apparently um, attending part of the proceedings this morning. What witnesses do we have? Uh, that would be Dr. Corcoran and I believe Dr. Brewerton. To name designated experts, the court uh, granted us the exempt exception to uh, sequestration. So Dr. Tim Brewerton, who's the expert uh, psychiatrist, and then Joe Corcoran, who's the expert in uh, hospital administration, and hearing this testimony would obviously be advantageous in forming their opinions. Anything else? But I guess my, my point, was, that was one point, the other point is, we understood they were coming tomorrow. We're not trying to squeeze these in today. Something like that. No, no, no. I, I, that's not my intention. I mean, if we ran short today, we'd either play a depot, or I guess we could start one of them. But I really don't think we'll have much time today left after Maya Kowalski's te uh, testimony direct across. Okay. For your planning purposes, tomorrow, Tuesday, October tenth, we will have to take our lunch break over the noon hour so we will have no matter where we are we'll have a hard stop at four or at 1155 if we haven't taken a break so just understand that i'll have a hard break at 1155 
And then on Wednesday, the 11th, we'll have to take a break, a lunch break at 11.30. So we'll have a hard stop at 11.25. And we'll talk about Thursday later. Was, any idea what the length will be? They're, they're just meetings that, like, I've got a meeting with the chief judge, so probably 30 or 45 minutes, but we'll just take our lunch early. Right. That's fine. Yeah. Anything else before we bring the jury in? We are still trying to work it so that we will finish Friday afternoon, Judge. It just depends on how long it takes to get the witnesses we've informed them about into evidence. And, of course, uh, Dr. Newberger, which is why. And I would have obviously done designations earlier, but I was hopeful he would testify live. Nothing from the defense, sir. Okay. Well, we're starting to pass over that time of being ahead to being behind. So let's do what we can to try to keep up. Okay. Let's bring in the jury. Please be seated. So I hear with that announcement, Deputy Coley is trying to keep you on your toes. I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and you received no information. Is that all correct? Yes. Have you been approached by anyone since uh, we last saw each other? No. And have you seen any media coverage? No. Okay. Mr. Anderson, your next witness, sir. Plaintiff's call Maya Kowalski. I do. Please state your name for the record. Maya Kowalski. I have a very soft voice, so you'll need to get that microphone up there close so everybody can can hear you. And where do you live? I live in Venice, Florida, in a subdivision called Stonewalk. And how old are you? I am 17 years old. Where were you born? I was born in Elmhurst, Illinois. Outside of Chicago? Yes. What kind of neighborhood? It's a really small neighborhood. There was barely any houses. There was houses on both sides of the street, but only a single street. And how were things growing up in your family? And we'll publish 2528-45 for this. Then you can continue. And we'll just... Okay. Um, so here I am pictured with my dad's deputy chief fire helmet. You could tell I'm feeling pretty cool there. <laughs> um, growing up, Elmhurst was amazing. I loved it there, and it was like a quiet little place. And did you get to spend some time with your dad and mom? Both of them, yes. They both worked? Yes, they did, but they always made time for their children. Did they ever, uh, did your dad ever take you to any fires? He actually did take me to a few, um, but eventually he started dropping me off at my neighbor's house. Uh, the grandma was Polish. So Kyle and I could communicate with her pretty well. Okay. And so during your time there in Elmhurst, did your mother or your dad introduce you to different hobbies and sports? Yes. I was a ballerina at one point. I was a gymnast and then a figure skater. And then Kyle, he played soccer. He did piano. I also did piano. And then Kyle tried out gymnastics for a little bit. 
Okay, let's show 2528-102. Is this your mom and you uh, ice skating? Was yes. she your instructor at first? At this point, no. Um, my mom didn't teach me figure skating. She actually started after me. Here, we're in the Wizard of Oz production. I was a munchkin, and then my mom was a cowgirl. <laughs> okay. And did you... Let's, let's go to 2528-115. How, how old were you when you were introduced to gymnastics? I started gymnastics in Illinois. There was actually an incident on the playground. I approached a few girls, and they were practicing their floor routine. And I asked if I could try, and they told me, no, you're too small, you'll never make it. So I went home, I told my mom, sign me up, she did, and I was actually really good at the sport from the beginning. And you continued that through when you moved to Florida? Eventually? Yes. All right. And um, so were you able to spend some leisure time with just your mom? And we'll look at 2528-124. And by the way, so your mom didn't introduce you to gymnastics. You had the idea? Yes, I did. Um, same with piano the and then ballet, all of them. They were all my ideas. And your mom supported you in those? Always. And that story you told, has that been indicative of your life when people tell you you can't do something? Oh, yeah. I'm going to prove you wrong. All right. So this is you and your mom now. Where is this? Is this once you reached Florida? Yes, so this is actually Casperson Beach. It's the shark tooth capital of the world. There's a cute little restaurant there called Sharky's, and near it is this little pier, and after dinner we would walk on the pier and watch the sunset. Mm -hmm. Was that something you and your mom did regularly or tried uh, to do? Yeah, we did it quite often, actually, all of us as a family. Uh, how, uh, how was the transition from the suburbs of Chicago uh, down here to the Venice area for you? For me it wasn't too bad. I did have my mom's family there and friends, but I was hopeful that I'd make new friends in Florida and the idea of having a pool was really cool. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that helped. Mm -hmm. That was the inviting thing, the, the, the bait. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, when you moved to Florida, and, and really during this period of time before the CRPS, can you tell the jury about your health generally? Generally, it was really good. I mean, I did have asthma. I was diagnosed in Illinois, but it didn't bother me so much. Okay. And just childhood illnesses for the most part? Yeah, I did break my arm at one point. So tell us about that. Yeah, so... In our subdivision, the road, it went up on a hill. So I rode up the hill, and then I did like a little U-turn, and I was going down, but there was a car behind me. I saw it, I freaked out, and I crashed into this curb, and then I fell into a ditch directly onto my arm, and I broke it. After that happened, I didn't cry. I stood up, picked up my bike, dragged it out of the ditch, hopped right back on it, drove home, and I told my dad that my arm hurt, and he didn't think anything was wrong because I wasn't crying or acting, you know, all dramatic. He told me to go lay down. I did. We didn't think much of it. A um, few days went by, and I was holding it in a weird position. And my dad was like, we should probably go get that checked out. <laughs> so we went to the doctors. They ordered an x-ray. We went home. We got the call from the doctor that it was fractured. And only then did I cry because I realized I wasn't going to be able to do any of the activities that I enjoyed. So how many days did you have a broken arm without complaining to your mom or dad? Three. How was your pain tolerance generally? I've always had a really high pain tolerance. So how old were you when you moved to Florida? I was in third grade, the beginning of third grade, so I would say eight. And how was that? How, how was the transition? It was good. Yeah, I liked all the new animals. The uh, lizards were really cool. Um, I actually used to catch them and pinch them on my ears so they looked like earrings. Um, 
And then Kyle and I, we loved going outside. We had like a little alligator in the back, and we named him Jin Dobre, which means hello. Um, we did that for my mom. <laughs> and so uh, I want to talk for a second now. Your mom, uh, first generation Polish. Yes. Right? And how early did she start you t- uh, learning Polish? How well, early? we grew up learning the language. We heard it from our family and whatnot. But she enrolled us in Polish school in Illinois. In Florida, we didn't continue with that. We just did Rosetta Stone because there was no Polish schools in Florida. But Kyle and I hated Polish school in Illinois, but we did it for her. Pardon me for asking, but what does one do in Polish school? It's So the teacher exclusively speaks in Polish, which is kind of hard because then you don't really know what English words match up with the Polish words. Um, we learn the alphabet, the numbers, and then different materials relating to reading and whatnot. Would your mom speak Polish to you at home? Yes. How often? I would say every day. I mean, I heard Polish from her, and I actually asked her to speak to me in Polish so I could get a good understanding of the language. And um, you had relatives that spoke just about only Polish? Yes. Most of my mom's family only speaks Polish because they grew up in Chicago, which is one of the biggest um, ethnic areas for Polish people, so there's not really a big need to learn English. Did you actually go to Poland at some point? I did, yes. I went there for a month. When? About? How old? Let me put it this way. Was this before or after you moved to Florida? It was before I moved to Florida. Uh, Tell us what you did there. We visited about every city you could think of, all the cool cities. Um, We saw like street artists doing cool things. We went to different shops. I actually bought a Polish doll there, which I was really proud of. We visited family, my mom's old house, and then my great-grandma, actually, I visited her. Was your mom proud of her, of being Polish, Polish ancestry? I would say so, yeah. She was very proud to be Polish. Did she, did you you know about her story? Did she ever tell you how she ended up over in the United States? I know that she moved over when she was a teenager, and she had to learn the English language. It was difficult at first, and a lot of people told her she's not going to make it into the profession that she wanted to be, um, but she proved them wrong. Now, was this during, when, best of your knowledge, uh, when she moved, uh, strike that, did she grow up under communist Poland or free Poland? I believe it was communist. Did she tell you stories about that? Not too many. Um, Kyle and I were really young, so... Mm-hmm. And is that still important to you, your Polish heritage? Yes. All right. And so um, I want to ask you about the neighborhood itself. Did you have friends there, friends on or near your age? Yes. Several of them? Yes. And did you get along with them? I mean. Yeah, we got along. All of us did. Where did you go to school? I, well, for elementary school, I went to Taylor Ranch Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And how was that? I really liked it. The teachers were amazing, and it was very different than Illinois. What was the difference? Well, something cool about the schools, which is kind of normal for Florida, but very foreign to people who live in Illinois, is that the hallways are actually outdoors. So you walk outside to get to your classes, so it's nice just to see some daylight. You can't really do that in Illinois. (laughs) No. Not if you want to keep your toes. All right, so uh, did you generally do well in strike? How did you do in school over this period of time, uh, having moved to Florida? I was a straight-A student. And um, you liked your teachers? Yes, I loved them. All right. So let's uh, jump ahead then. Um, What grade did you start at once you moved to Florida? It was third grade. Third grade. So you completed second grade? In Illinois. In Illinois, so it was third. Mm-hmm. And I actually did a week of third grade in Illinois as well, um, but I did the remainder in Florida. I was going to ask you. So yeah. They come down and visit you every once in a while? Anyway. Some of my friends, yes. Mm-hmm. Now, um, 
by this point, uh, was your dad still in the fire department, or had he retired after all those years? When we moved to Florida, my dad had retired. And what did he want to do uh, with his career, if you know? After, well, once he retired? Yes. Did I think he, he just wanted to take care of us, spend more time. Did he have any uh, dreams or, or aspirations, to the best of your knowledge, about working for FEMA or some something else similar to what he had done in the fire department? I've heard of that, but again, I was really young, so I didn't really know his career plans. Well, let's jump then to July 3rd and, and July 4th of 2015. Now, how old would you have been then? Uh, so it would be... Uh, um, I would... 2015? All right, yeah, I so this would be... Uh, you've been in Florida, I think, yeah. Tw you moved in 2014, so this would be one year after you moved. I probably... Hmm. I was nine then. All right. And um, then we can show uh, 25281291. Or what's happening here, although the jury, I think, has seen this. Yeah, so my subdivision, we're really close, and the adults of the neighborhood, they organize special things for the holidays, and one of the biggest ones is the 4th of July parade. Everyone is welcome to hop on their bikes and ride around our circle. We just celebrate, and afterwards we usually eat food. Uh, were you able to ride that bike uh, well, or do you have any physical injuries at this point? I know I had an injury to my ankle, but again, I was always pushing through, so here I don't really look like anything's wrong, but I did have, I hurt my ankle. How, how uh, soon before this was it that you hurt? Was this like a month before, a week before, or a day before? I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure, but I know that it was pretty close. I just don't know for sure if it was like weeks. Well, days. how bad was it? Was it a sprain or... I believe it was just a sprain. Did you get any medical care for it at that time? Do you know? I don't think so, no. Did you even tell your folks? That's a question. Yes, I did. My mom had wrapped it and everything. Oh. But by the time of uh, this photo, 25281291, it looks like you can pedal the bike. Yes. Well. All right. And that's your brother next to you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he got rid of that beer eventually. <laughs> yeah. All right, so what happened? Tell the jury what happened over that 4th of July weekend that changed your life. I had a severe asthma attack, and it was one of the worst asthma attacks I've ever had. I was taken to John Hopkins All Children's Hospital, and I think I stayed there for a couple of days, if I'm not mistaken. Well, on the day that it happened, did they take you to the ER someplace else? Doctor's oh, hospital? doctor, yes, yes, my bad. All right. So if, the, if it happened on the 4th, then, uh, was a matter of a couple, three days before you went to Johns Hopkins? Can you repeat that? Sorry. Sure. About how many days after you were treated at doctors and you know, after after you had this asthma attack did you go to Johns Hopkins? I don't know the number of days all I know I wasn't feeling well. Okay well, let, uh, let me show you uh, 2529-5 and I'll represent that uh, that was taken on or about uh, the 7th or 8th. Actually set it down there. The yeah seventh. the 7th. All right what's going on here? I am in a bed at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Okay. And did you walk in to Johns Hopkins on this? I visit? believe I was able to walk in on this day, but when I left, I was having extreme complications with walking to the point where I had to be wheeled out in a wheelchair. Well, the jury needs to know how this came on. Uh, you just wake up one morning and bang, you were in extreme pain? Or how did it start? It wasn't like that. It was pretty gradual, but not in the sense that it took like three months until I had excruciating pain. It was day by day I noticed that there was a pain in my right leg that was just getting worse and worse. So it started in your right leg? Yes. And did it stay in your right leg or move? Unfortunately, or it did move because I wasn't diagnosed for quite some time. Did it move or start moving during this stay or after? In other words, during this, this, was it just in your right 
uh, foot and leg at this point? At this point, no. It had traveled to the left leg as well. So about how long did that take for it to... Um, it would have been three days then. And so there I, they give you something. I know you were very young. Do you remember much about this day? I'm sorry, I don't. Well, they'll have those records. All right, so after this, now, uh, did you go home or did you go to another hospital from there? Well, after this day, I know I went home, but then I was at one point transferred to another hospital. Was that the one back up in? Illinois. You know if you went to back to Johns Hopkins for a visit before you went to Lori's or not? I know I had been to John Hopkins a few times, but I don't, it's really hard for me to remember. I was 10. Every hospital was the same to me at that point. Yeah, and the, re and the jury has the records. All right, so let's uh, publish 2529-19 and uh, tell us what's going on here. This is after I got off the plane that I landed in Illinois. My dad had some of his old firefighter friends pick me up off the plane and transfer me in an ambulance. And then the chief, I believe, um, went to baggage claim and got my mom and I's luggage. So his old firefighter buddies helped out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at this photo here, uh, it doesn't look like you're having much fun. I hate to put words in your mouth. But oh, yeah, what, what's, do you recall any of this? I remember it was a very difficult plane ride. I mean, I was trying to be respectful to all the passengers, but when you're in pain, it's just so hard to stay quiet. All right. Well, by this point then, about how, uh, this is what, a few weeks or a month after your, after the onset? Yes. What happened with the pain? Did it stay the same? Did it decrease? Did it increase? It had increased. And where did it increase to physically? Were there any new places or the same? There was new places at this point. It was at my midsection and it was, I don't know for certain, but I know it did transfer to my arms at some point. I just don't know the specific date. When you say now uh, midsection, explain a little bit more. Are you talking about your tummy or your abdomen? Where? Yes, I'm talking about my stomach. At this point, had you started to have problems with uh, any digestion or going to the bathroom, or was that later? Yes, I had constipation issues, and we later found out that it corresponded to my diagnosis of CRPS. And what happens there with those uh, going to the bathroom issues? Do you mean like how CRPS is connected to it, or just... Just physically, how did it manifest? What, what was the problem there for you? I was just constipated, and when Miralax didn't work, we had to go to the, the hospital. So did this start right off the bat once you had the pain in the midsection? Um, yes, yeah, I did have constipation. Was it fairly consistent throughout your various stays at Johns Hopkins? You had um, this problem in the midsection where you'd get stopped up? Yes. All right, so do you recall what they did for you there at Lurie's? I know that they suggested an intensive physical therapy program, but they also missed the diagnosis of CRPS. All right, so they didn't, at this point, did you know what was really causing your pain? No one knew. And what was the effect on your mom and dad not knowing? Here you are a month or so after you, you, it manifested, it came on. How did it affect them? Well, my parents were extremely worried, and in turn that made me more anxious because as a kid you look up to your parents for the answers, and then when they look up to the doctors for the answers and they don't even have them, you're just so unbelievably anxious. So you came back home then, I guess? Yes. And uh, did you go to another hospital after that? Yes, my parents had taken the suggestion from the Illinois hospital, and we went to an intensive physical therapy program at Tampa General. About how long was it from Lurie's, the hospital in Chicago, to when you went up to Tampa General? I'm sorry, I don't know the dates. Uh, oh, the same summer period? or? Oh, yeah, it was the same. Mm -hmm. okay. And how was your pain doing at this point? 
My pain was still pretty bad. Had anybody approached you at this point at uh, Lori's and, and said anything about this just being all in your head, or was that, did you know anything about that, or was this just something you found out later? I found that out later. And was it in your head? No. Okay. So let's talk about and publish 2529-23. Okay, and where is this? This is in the PT room at Tampa General Hospital. And what are they having you do there? This is a machine that is intended to strengthen your arm muscles. Okay. Uh, how many hours of PT were you doing a day there at this time, if you recall? I don't know the number of hours, but I remember Marissa, the physical therapist, because it's an intensive program, the PT, I believe, was like two to three times a day. And what did they tell you about why you had to do the PT? Well, none of the doctors knew what was wrong with me at the time, so they just assumed that strengthening my muscles would maybe help get me to walking again. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the space you're making here, uh, does that fairly and accurately represent you uh, in pain? Yes, I am trying to smile here, but unfortunately I was still experiencing a lot of pain. Well, uh, had it traveled up to your legs, I mean to, to your arms at this point? Or? At this point, yes. Had you manifested any other symptoms? Now, looking back, you know, not that you knew at the time, during this day, if you know. Um, I can't say for certain, but I believe I started seeing some lesions, and I was very sensitive to touch. I know that for sure. So how was PT for you uh, at Tampa General? It was very challenging. Um, it's excruciating. Mm -hmm. And uh, was Mar Miss Marissa who testified here nice to you? She was lovely, yes. All right. And were you outpatient or inpatient? I was words, inpatient, yeah. So you, mm -hmm. you stayed there? Yes. And you remember for about how long? A month. All right. Now here, were your parents allowed to stay with you? Yes. All right. And let's then publish 2529-34 and ask about this. All right. Now, um, is that Marissa there in the green? In the green, that is Marissa. And what's that on your feet? What are you doing there? So that machine is for pedaling, mm -hmm. again, just in hopes of strengthening my leg muscles. Right. Now, uh, at this point, a couple months maybe past when it, when it came on, uh, it looks like you still have some pretty good muscle mass in your legs. Yes, and then I don't know if you could really tell, but you could see that my dystonia is starting to get worse. Uh huh. That means your toes pointing in. Correct. Tell the jury about that. What, what, there were allegations that you somehow made made this up. Could you <coughs> did you have any control over your feet when they started to go into that position? I had absolutely no control over that. What did it feel like when they began turning in? It was extremely painful, and it was like tense, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Who's that person behind you? That is Bonnie Rice. Uh -huh. I kind of call her like the Kathy Beatty of Tampa General. She was a nurse, but overstepped in many ways. So she followed you around? Yes. Right. And she wasn't quite as nice as Marissa? Definitely not. <laughs> Why did they have a nurse following you around everywhere? At the situation, she knows. Sustain once you re-ask. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, do you know about why uh, Bonnie Rice was following you around here? I had the understanding that Bonnie Rice, even though she was a nurse, she believed that I had either conversion disorder, so I was like making out my disease. I don't know what child would want to pretend not being able to walk and not being able to play with their friends, but she drew that conclusion. Um, she also had some problems with my mom because she expressed these concerns to my mom. My mom knew I was not making this up. She knew her daughter. 
So wherever you went, there was Bonnie Rice? Yes. So eventually, uh, and, and at this point, were you completely in a wheelchair? Yes. Okay. And so then, did you even have to go to school? Once, once you got out of there, um, did you have to go to school in a wheelchair? I did visit my school in a wheelchair for the lemonade stand fundraiser they had for me. Okay, let's publish 2529-39 and we'll come back to TGH. Now what's this? This is the school bus that had the lift so I could be brought to school in my wheelchair. Okay, um, and this it looks like it's September 21st, 2015. Was this after TGH? To my understanding, yes. I believe so. Okay. Well, let's, uh, or maybe it was before. Um, let's uh, go back to TGH. Now let's publish 2529-41. Now what's that? That is a CRPS lesion. Right. And tell the jury what's, uh, in, what, how do you identify that? Well, at the time, I still didn't know I had CRPS. Nobody did. So I started getting these open sores on my body, and I was very concerned because it's something I've never had before. And they're very painful, especially when you touch them. Mm -hmm. And did they hurt? Extremely, yes. To the touch or just whatever you did? When you put touch on them, it amplified the pain. And so let's look at uh, 2661. Uh, now this is a video, and I'm going to ask you after this, what's significant about, um, first, was this after TGH? I don't know what day, oh. All right. So after this, I want you to tell the jury what's significant about this. And the date on it, I believe, is uh, September, sometime September of, uh, again, People, you probably don't notice this if you're not a pianist, but there is a distinct sound when the pedals are being pressed. At this point, I was not able to press the pedals even though the song called for it, so I had severe dystonia and that limited me from being able to do that. Were you, obviously you are able to play piano, were you able to do any of the activities that you, you had before? Or? Other than piano, I was not because all of them required me to stand and walk and jump. Okay. Now, um, here we are in September of, of 2015, and you're in a wheelchair. Uh, what other signs, what if any other signs of, or symptoms of CRPS d did you note at this time? At this time, I was twitching. I had the allodynia, dystonia, lesions. There was the temperature changes in my limbs that we started to notice. T t then, tell the jury about the temperature changes. Why is this any different than just you know being chilly or like being too hot or too cold, turn up the air conditioning or down the air conditioning? Because it happens at random times and it's not influenced by external temperature. It's all internally happening. And then another thing that was weird that started happening is I would sweat in different areas, but not all over my body. What areas, if you recall? The back of my neck, um, and then lower back. I don't remember all of them, but those are the two that I specifically remember. And were these dependent on whether you were cold or the exterior temperatures at all? No, they were not dependent on the external environment. Well, what else? Uh, anything with the ears or eyes? 
I did have tinnitus, which is just ringing in the ears, which I've never had before. And then with my eyesight, at this point, it was okay. All right. And, okay, so your eyes are all right. So um, through this period of time, did you get to see Dr. Wassenauer? Yes, I did. And he couldn't figure out what was wrong yet either? No. All right. So then did there come a time when somebody did know what was wrong with you? Yes. All right, if we could publish a video of 2666, um, and then you'll tell us if uh, about this in a moment. But doesn't feel good when I touch your legs, right? Or your tummy, when I touch your tummy, that feels good, right? stress there? Yes. Was that the kind of reaction you would get sometimes when people would touch your legs? Yes, it's just from the allodynia. All right, so the jury wants to know uh, if you have this effect when someone touches your legs, how are you able to deal with uh, blankets being pulled over, uh, clothes being put on, any of the usual things you do if, if you have this reaction? A common misconception with CRPS is that all of the symptoms from the beginning to whenever you have it, they're constant, and then they stay that way. But in reality, the symptoms can change on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes, you, like we saw in the video, you would have the blankets off of you and sometimes on? Yes. Depending on the day? Correct. Was this frustrating? It was. Yeah. It was annoying to constantly have to tell people to help you with certain things, especially with the temperature changes, because you want to be comfortable, and here you're asking people to change either the thermostat or help you with blankets or help you change into something else, and you know you can't do it for yourself, so you just feel like an inconvenience. Yeah, have you always been a pretty independent person? Oh, yes. Did your mom want you to be that way, independent, able to handle things on your own? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you know how, just if you know, uh, you got to Dr. Kirkpatrick from the prior doctors you'd seen? I do know the story. Okay. Tell the jury how you ended up at Dr. Kirkpatrick's, and then we'll show, I think we can bring up a photo, 2529-42, and if you could just tell them what, what uh, happened, how you got there. Yes, so my mom was an infusion nurse during this entire time, and while I was at Tampa General, Bonnie Rice, the nurse I told you about earlier, she had a phone conversation with my mom, and that's when Bonnie said that she thinks that I was making up my condition. My mom told her, no, there's no way. My mom listed all the symptoms I was having and said, how can she be faking these? My mom went back into the room to treat her patient, and he said, I'm sorry, you know, I... What did she say next? Objection to the What did... Who said next? What did... Try it. Uh, when... How did you know that Dr. Kirkpatrick might have some answers without telling us what somebody told you? I know from the person who told us. I mean, that's how we found him. Oh, sure. So, and and I who, mean, who suggested it? It was the patient of my mom, Dave, because he has a daughter with CRPS. So a dad of, a, of another girl that had CRPS? Yes. Suggested? Correct. Um, now, so you went in and saw Dr. K, Dr. Kirkpatrick? Yes. And tell the jury... Uh, what he did in order to determine what was going on. He had a very lengthy examination of me, and it included multiple different tests, and he took all the data, and then he said that my symptoms and my condition aligns with CRPS. 
did he explain about the Budapest criteria? He did. And so what types of symptoms did he, did, did you show in front of him, if, if you recall? I believe he did a temperature test of my extremities. He noted certain lesions I had. You could see one on my right arm. And then I had extreme sensitivity to light. It's just with CRPS, the nerves are hypersensitive. I also had dystonia at the time. I believe at that appointment, there was no, um, rec like there was no signs of sweating, abnormal sweating. But again, that's just every day is different. So what's what's up with the sunglasses? Why the sunglasses? I was sensitive to light, and that's just because the nerves in CRPS patients are hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. And then another, obviously, the big giveaway that I had CRPS was the burning pain. Mm -hmm. And the feet turning in there. That's the dystonia he noted. Yes. And about how long did he have you over there to uh, examine you? It was quite a few hours. It wasn't like in and out like other doctors' offices. Mm -hmm. And did Dr. Kirkpatrick keep you in the mix about what he was doing and why? Yes, he always told me what he was going to be doing, the certain tests. He asked me if I was comfortable, uncomfortable. He listened to me. All right, now this photograph is dated, I think, down there in the bottom left. It's October 5th, 2015. Uh, had you seen him before this visit? I'm not sure September? what day I saw him, but I know that he had an examination of me, and then the next time I went in, after trying pool therapy, we tried out the ketamine infusion. Okay, so important to know, did Dr. K immediately go to ketamine, or did he have another uh, therapy he thought might work? No, he wanted me to try the non-medicative route first, which we did. Mm -hmm. And what was that non-medicated route? It was warm water therapy. My dad had bought a system to heat our pool. So I think like 10 out of 12 months of the year it's warm. Mm -hmm. So I was able to practice my therapy in there and try to gain some strength. And did you try hard at that? Yes. Uh, how to do? It helped a little bit, but it was not the improvement that Dr. Kirkpatrick was hoping for, or any of us were hoping for. So he decided it would be best to try the ketamine infusion. In terms of physical therapy now, well, let's talk about what you had already been through at the different places, at Tampa General and so forth. Uh, had you had physical therapy so far? Yes. This point? Had you had, uh, I guess, occupational therapy, upper body stuff? Yes. And had you had some uh, psychological evaluations? Yes, I had counseling. Mm -hmm. And did you uh, then have warm water therapy? Yes. And what kind of meds had they put you on up to this point of the ketamine? What, what were you taking? I'm going to be honest. I was, again, like really young, so I didn't ask what medication I was taking. But it's my understanding I did try some prescribed opioids from my doctor's remember anything about whether they worked or not? They didn't. All right. So you'd been through physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychotherapy, uh, warm water therapy, opioids. Now you were trying ketamine? Yes. Tell the jury how that went. The ketamine infusion? Mm-hmm, yes. So Have we put in 2529... Four two is that already up? All right. Let's see. Um, go ahead and explain what. So the ketamine infusions were very different than anything I had tried previously. It's this like really small room with a bunch of different equipment and then a nice soft bed, and then a super adjacent to the bed is like a little TV so the patients can watch whatever they want while they're getting the infusion. I slept for most of it. So I don't really know the duration of the whole treatment, but I know it was over the course of a few days. Well, you said you slept during most of it. How were you sleeping at night at this point? Oh, I was not sleeping. It's very difficult to sleep when you know, you're know you having excruciating pain and pain that you've never felt before. And so even with your high pain tolerance, um, describe for the jury as best you can so they can understand what it's like, the CPR, CRPS pain. 
How I describe it to people who don't have CRPS, it's like I was born with gasoline deep within my body and some incident, whether it was that sprained ankle or the severe asthma attack, was like a match and acted as a catalyst that just set my body on fire and I have to live with this burning pain. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, so how many of these, uh, let's strike that, during the time at uh, TGH, did you also have uh, physical appliances applied to your legs and ankles to see if that would straighten out some of your symptoms? Unfortunately, yes. Tell the jury about those in addition to physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychotherapy, warm water therapy, opioids. So with CRPS, you have to be very careful with the type of therapies that you provide. And with physical therapy, you have to be especially gentle. Now, I was put into an intensive physical therapy program. And again, at the time, we didn't know we, I had CRPS. So we didn't know that it was actually doing more damage than good. One of the doctors noticed that my dystonia was getting extremely severe as my stay went on. He suggested that he breaks my feet, have a corrective surgery to straighten them out. Let's uh, publish 2529-35. And that was Dr. Kornberg, I remember his name. Okay. All right, so are those the uh, corrective boots you wore? Yes, yeah, so this was like part one of his plan. He wanted to see if the boots would straighten my feet out, and if it didn't, he was going to resort immediately to surgery. Now, I can't quite see your mouth there, but what are you feeling there? in that facial gesture? Forcing my feet to immediately go from, I mean, completely turned in to straight was an awful idea. It was extremely painful. I remember just crying and crying. And did your mom want you to try it though? She did. Um, she knew it was hurting me, but again, at the time, we didn't know what was going on, so she was just listening to the doctors. So the jury knows, did your mom ever push you to, to do any of these treatments? Or was this something that you wanted to try too? I also wanted to try it because I had my trust invested in the doctors. I thought they knew what they were doing. Through this entire period of time, uh, did, were you ever pushed uh, by your parents to, to uh, continue a therapy that wasn't beneficial or uh, strike that? Were you ever pressured to do any types of therapies or things that maybe you already knew didn't work? No, if we figured out that it didn't work, they were okay with listening to me and not going on with it. Okay. So how many of the ketamine therapies do you recall having for this at, at, with, with Dr. K? Um, so after um, Tampa General, I had, I believe, one, like, not like a single treatment, but because it spanned over a couple of days, but itself it was just like one session, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, in, at this point, if you can recall, I think we have a video, I don't know if we'll see it, but can you show the jury about how high you could raise your arm um, going into all of this? Can you so, demonstrate about how high you could get it? Yeah, at Dr. K's, I believe I told you about the examination. And part of his examination was like a physical like range of motion examination. I was only able to lift my hand to about ear level. Nothing past that because of the pain. All right. And so then after that, um, how did the ketamine therapies do for you, the ones at Dr. K's? At Dr. Kirkpatrick's office, the, the, the ketamine definitely helped. It had helped me more than any of the previous therapies I've tried. So... I wanted to stick with that in addition to trying the warm water therapy and continuing going to counseling. Um, but ultimately, Kirkpatrick noticed that his treatments weren't going to get me to where he wanted me to be, so he brought on another doctor. Okay. And were you continuing the warm water therapies with when you were doing the ketamine? Yes. How did the ketamine affect your ability to do physical therapy? 
Well, obviously I couldn't do it like immediately after. It's a new drug and I did have some side effects. I was a little bit confused coming out of it, but the confusion doesn't last long. By the end of the day, I was talking in my normal self. But uh, could you do more, more and more physical therapy using the ketamine as without it? Yes. And why was that? It's just because it alleviates my pain. It's maybe for the first time something is actually helping lower that burning pain. So I wanted to try even harder in physical therapy. How did it feel finally having a diagnosis that made sense? Obviously the diagnosis itself isn't great, but it's nice knowing what it is so you can develop a course of action to try to tackle it. Did your mom, uh, best of what you remember, start researching what CRPS was? Yes, so my mom, she was an infusion nurse and she's pretty familiar in the medical field, so naturally she wanted to learn all about it herself. In terms of the uh, medical analysis, if you will, for you, between your mom and dad, who would take the lead? My mom did because that was her field of expertise. Okay. So your mom uh, was kind of your home physician or home nurse? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, and she was teaching you Polish? Mm -hmm. And would she take you to different events and places, drive you places? Yes. And was she helping you with your piano? Yes. And was she helping you through ballet? Yes. Okay. Did you have a good relationship with your mom through this? Yes, I always did. How about the fact that she wanted you to try some of these therapies that were hurting you? Did that harm the relationship? or? No, it didn't because again, you have to remember at this before we went to Dr. Kirkpatrick, we didn't know what it was. So I think her willingness to try everything was actually a sign of love. How did your dad react to finally hearing that this was CRPS? I mean, mixed or I mean, no parent wants their kid to have like a chronic illness. Um so they were sad but I think at the same time they were just happy to hear a definite answer. And how do they react to you telling them that after these ketamine infusions that it helped? They were so happy to know that, you know, something was helping finally, like one thing we try is actually doing something for me. And up to this point when could they do anything for you when you would have when the pain would be at its worst? Was there anything they could give you or do for you that would affect it? They, before this, no, not at all. I mean, I remember laying in bed and just crying and crying, and I have this memory of my dad. He took my monkey. You'll probably see in a bunch of pictures, but he would take the hand of the monkey and rub it on my forehead until I fell asleep. And were you sleeping, uh, t tell us the sleeping arrangement once uh, this, this got really bad. Once my pain was to the point where I was just crying and screaming throughout the entire night, I, well, the way our house is arranged first off is I'm on the opposite side of the house and then there's my brother's room right across from mine and then the other side is my parents' room. So I couldn't walk um, to go and tell them when I needed help going to use the restroom. So. We implemented a walkie-talkie system. It sounds silly, but I didn't have a phone at the time, so I would talk back and forth to them so they could help me in the middle of the night. Could you tell how it was affecting your folks that, that their little girl was moaning all night in pain? I try to keep it in as much as possible because... Do they like, appear to be under base. some stress? Yeah, they were definitely stressed out. And how about Kyle? Oh, for sure. I mean, we used to play together all the time. Were no. you and your brother close? Yes, we were. Even when we were really little, we had a very good relationship. It's like you're the big sister? Yeah. Okay. How, how far apart are you two? We are 18 months. Mm -hmm. right. And then we do have an older sister as well. That's right, Corrine? Yes. How, old, how much older is she? she? I think she's 16 years older than me. Okay. And were you close, are you close with her? Yes. How was Kyle reacting to hearing his big sister in this kind of pain? 
Well, my parents try to keep him out of the loop when we didn't know what it was because you don't want to worry your other child as well. But obviously he knew something was wrong. I wasn't walking, I wasn't playing, I wasn't laughing as much. I didn't go outside because I couldn't. Um, so I believe he, you know, he tried his best to distract himself with the neighborhood kids playing football and whatnot. Mm. But he was heartbroken. Yeah. And so for you, uh, was it difficult to see the other kids uh, outside playing and you in the wheelchair? Yes, very much so. There was actually one day I was invited to the YMCA, which is where I used to do gymnastics. And I was wheelchair bound at the time. And I, I never went back to watch them because it just ate me up. Do you want to get out of that wheelchair? Yes. <laughs> All right. So now, we've tried this, and how long approximately would Dr. Kirkpatrick's ketamine therapy benefits last? After you stopped, how long would it be before the pain would come back? I would say, I don't know the exact days, I really didn't keep track as a kid, but I believe like maybe a week and a couple of days, but it just didn't last as long as we hoped. Mm -hmm. Alright, so did he make a referral then to try uh, a, a different approach? Yes, he did. And where did he send you? He um, called Dr. Cantu, he's a doctor in Monterey, Mexico, and I went there. Do you remember that? I do, yes. Remember the hotel you stayed at? I do. I remember pretty much everything about the trip except the five days when I was sleeping. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, leading up to it now, did you have some conferences with Dr. Cantu about what was going to happen? Actually, I had a discussion with Dr. Kirkpatrick first. He explained some of the risks um, associated with the ketamine-induced sedation, the prolonged sedation. And then when I went to Monterey, Mexico, I was then again told about the risks. And how did it strike you? I know you're only, uh, had you turned 10, I guess, by this point? Yes, in December. Um, yeah, because your birthday is when in? December 10th. Okay. Um, so uh, what was your reaction, from what you recall, on your age at that time, to hearing that there were some... Uh, possible complications, some possible risks with this procedure? Well, I was presented with the worst case scenario, which was a 50% chance of death. Even though that's not completely true, they always give you the worst case scenario just in case something bad happens. Had you heard that with other uh, medications and things? Yeah, I mean, every medication has like a ton of side effects. But you know it's bad when like a 10 year old is willing to take that risk. I mean, that's how bad my pain was. Uh, so, the um, hotel you were staying at, uh, was it fairly close to Dr. Cantu's office? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, you, uh, at this point, were uh, displaying pretty prominent uh, CRPS <clears throat> symptoms? Yes. That's published 2529-58. Uh, record reflect, this is uh, November 18, 2015 in Mexico. All right. Uh, tell the jury what's going on here. What are these? These are CRPS lesions. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, What's the deal between the round one and the one that's a line? Although, if we can, can we go any closer on that to see? So, what it to the naked eye, it kind of looks like a scratch, but in reality, with CRPS, sometimes these lesions do present like that, but they're actually connected. All right, and so down there, right above the green band, I mean, is that another lesion there right off of it? Y yes. Okay. And were you seeing more of these? I was. And what was your worry? I mean, had you, I realized you were only 10, had you read up on CRPS? I personally did not read up on it, but I knew other people who had it. Tell us how you knew other people who had it. So there's actually this, well, she used to live in um, Mexico. Uh -huh. She had CRPS really bad. Um, she had it when she was a kid. She went into remission for a couple of years, actually, and then she got bit. Your Honor, I, I apologize for interrupting, but we're in a prior discussion.
question. I do object to this line of question. Okay. About her having a friend? May I ask her about the friend? Let's move on to your next question. So you had friends down there? Yeah. And had it come to your attention from various sources that CRPS could take your life? Yes. Had you seen examples of that? Unfortunately. Okay. And had you seen examples of it going into remission and then coming back? Yes. So let's uh, publish 2529-60. The record reflects this is in Mexico, November 19th, 2015. More examples of lesions, is that right? Correct. And where are these? These are on my ankle. My, do you have any lesions right now? I do have a few on my leg. My right leg, that is. All right. So um, then let's uh, publish 2529-61, looking at symptoms. Now here, uh, although obviously you, uh, were you unconscious at this point in yes. this picture? Yes. And why is that significant in light of uh, <clears throat> different allegations people were making against you at Johns Hopkins? Well, because when you're unconscious, you don't really have control over your body movements. So my feet still being in that fixed position, like pointing inwards, shows that I was not making this up. All right. And so you, knowing about the risk of you and your parents, did you talk about whether you wanted to do this? Yes. They specifically asked me, and I know I was really young at the time, but they gave me pretty much full authority of whether I was going to go through with the um, like prolonged sedation or not. Have you always been uh, pretty mature for your age? Yes. I mean, at least in, in these ways, and, analysis yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were aware of your body and uh, how to take care of yourself. Yes. Overall. All right, so um, then let's publish 2529-69, and I want you to tell the jury a little bit about your relationship with Dr. Cantu. Is that Dr. Cantu who came and testified here? Yes. He is so nice. Um, he was, I mean, in addition to Dr. Kirkpatrick, he was one of the very few doctors who really listened to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, did he speak mostly uh, English to you or Spanish? What? He mean well to us. He spoke English, but huh. when we couldn't really communicate with him because we didn't know Spanish, um, my friend, the one with CRPS, Jessica, her mom, she spoke both language fluently, so she helped translate certain things I for see. us. Okay, and did Dr. Cantu? tell you about this procedure that you were going to go into? Yes. Okay. Now, behind you there is a photograph uh, of another patient, I think, next to you? Yes. Was that another CRPS patient? Yeah, Your Honor, will be objection in the HIPAA violation. There's no... She's in not the in the picture. In multiple basins about talking about other Sustained. Patients. All right. So... Uh, did Dr. Cantu then go over with you the specifics of how this is going to go and any problems you might have from it? Yes, he was very in-depth. And so you underwent the procedure. I want you to uh, tell the jury what the procedure was like. Um, well, I met with the team of people who are going to be taking care of me prior to going under, I talked to all of them, and they explained what their role was in my care. So I trusted them, and I understood what they were going to be doing. I was told about the potential side effects, what it might be like when I'm coming out of it. I was explained the risks. Um, yeah, I got a full, in-depth picture view of what was going to happen. Now, was your mom aware of other uh, CRPS, either studies or, or real people, uh, where CRPS had gone into remission and then come back to cause their death? Yes. Speculation, Your Honor. Overall. Yes. All right. So you, uh, how long does the procedure last, this first procedure? I believe it was seven or five days. I think it was five or seven. I know that 
I think it was like five days of the actual medication of ketamine, but then there was two days for me to like slowly come out of it. Mm -hmm. And coming out of it, how were you doing? I mean, it was a little scary. I had the tube taken out of my throat and I was coughing. I was a little confused about what was happening, but that all went away. How long did it take for those uh, symptoms or side effects, if you will, to subside? I believe it was a day until I felt completely myself, but by the evening I was somewhat okay. And when you say somewhat okay, you've just been through this procedure. How did you feel, Maya? Oh, like as part of me, like physically, I was feeling incredible. I actually asked Dr. Kanchi, I'm like, hey, could I try walking? And he told me I couldn't do that because I could potentially, you know, go back to where I was. He said, just baby steps. So you felt good enough to think you could get out oh, of that yeah. wheelchair? <laughs> I wanted to try. Okay. All right. And uh, so um, the pr this procedure was under general anesthesia, is that right? Correct. So you, were, you were out? Yes. So you don't remember anything? I about? don't remember anything at all. Now, did Dr. Cantu recommend that you have a booster soon thereafter? Yes. And what did you understand why the booster was necessary? I know that he had performed this procedure many other times, and it's pretty standard practice for a patient to return and get the booster just to help. Okay. And that procedure, now, was that back uh, completely under, you know, intubated and completely under, or was that like the time the times you had it at Dr. Kirkpatrick? No, it was very similar to Dr. Kirkpatrick's. So you were not unconscious in oh, any way? No, no, no. And about how long did those procedures take? Those were also a couple of hours. Um, I remember taking a little nap, but again, it's just because of the sleeping problem. Between the two procedures, uh, did any of the symptoms come back briefly or uh, to the point where you're concerned? Or? I, I honestly don't remember. I know I was doing very well after the prolonged sedation. I think... Again, it's just like pretty standard to get a booster. Sure. All right. And then you headed home. Yes. So how did you do that first 30 days after this, this long-term ketamine uh, procedure? Tell the jury what happened physically in terms of the pain and all of these symptoms and, and effects that you had from CRPS. I felt significantly better. My dystonia was much better. My feet were almost straight on certain days. And just in generally, they were like significantly like better. I mean, just straighter and everything. My pain was much lower. And then my lesions had almost completely healed. And we'll see some photos on that. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to break into the another section do you want me to continue on or do you want to I think we keep going sure all right returning from Mexico um, let's look at 2530-3 and so this is it looks like uh, December 24th Christmas Eve yes 2015 so uh, were you out of the wheelchair no, I was still in the wheelchair, but if you look at the my arm, the lesions are a lot less prevalent, mm -hmm. and then my feet generally look a lot straighter. There was some dystonia can we, still. Can we focus in on the feet there? So. Okay. All right, there's a couple of black dots there. Uh, what, what are those? Are those? Those are just healing lesions. All right, but they were not active? No. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, I notice you're smiling here. Is that simply because of the Mickey Mouse ears, or <laughs> are there other reasons? No, I was just a happier kid in general because my pain was, you know, I had some relief finally. And my mom and my brother were not in Mexico for the booster treatment, so I was happy to see them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's uh, then publish two five. 30-6 and ask you whether you were getting strong enough to uh, do some energetic playing in the pool. 
Most definitely. So at Dr. Kirkpatrick's pre-coma, I said that I my I could lift my arm like ear level, and now it was above my head, mm-hmm. and I could handle my brother touching my legs here, and my feet are much straighter. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, December 28th, almost the end of the year. Yep. Okay. Uh, then let's publish 2686, uh, see how you're doing even a week later. Really cute. Got it. That, who's that? Was that your friend from Chicago? Yes. She had come to visit me. And it was perfect timing because I was feeling a lot better than I had been. Okay. And could you have moved your arms and legs like that before you had the infusions in Mexico? There are some days where you could see some movement, but nothing like that. All right. And then um, published 2530. Uh, dash two seven. Did the improvements continue for you? Yes. All right. And again, um, I see you're holding up your arms. Could you hold your arms up that high before the Mexico treatments? No, I could not. And I noticed your legs there uh, sitting sort of uh, cross-legged. Did you sit cross-legged a lot? Yeah, that was pretty typical for me. Um, I don't know why, but when I was sitting in that position there was some difference in my pain. It wasn't as dramatic as I would have liked it to be, but generally it made my pain less. Was it the most comfortable position for you uh, on sitting on things? By far. Okay. That uh, eased some of the dystonia? Yes. All right. So let's then uh, look at how you continue uh, to improve. And, And did you continue to improve through the spring and summer? Yes. Okay, let's publish 2691. And um, as, as we're doing it here now, your family likes to scuba dive? Yes, that's right. a common So we can thing see what, uh, what's going on now. And what's that on your wrist? That is a bracelet that my cousin Matthew Klein gifted to me. Mm-hmm. It says never give up, and that kind of became my motto. Okay. Okay. All right, and the date on that of the record reflect is April 30th, 2016. So they, you try to spend a lot of time in the pool yes. to strengthen up mm-hmm. with the idea? And did your dad work with you a lot on the physical therapy? Yes, kind of my whole family did. That was kind of cool about it because it was also like family bonding time. Mm-hmm. All right, published 2530-41. And this is uh, May. Now we're into May. Okay. And you got your leg, one leg crossed sitting on the other. You are able to do that, obviously. Yes. And you're obviously capable of eating gummy bears. <laughs> yeah. All right. And did your brother feel better now seeing you able to do some things with him? Oh, yeah, for sure. Now, how did you get around uh, on the floor? Did you have to get you know, in your wheelchair to move from one spot to the other, or were you able to crawl or what? I was able to crawl a little bit, but I also used my wheelchair to get from like place to place if it was like longer distances and if the floor wasn't comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, another significant thing was I was actually able to push my own wheelchair, so I had some independence in my movements. Mm-hmm. And was that a happy making thing for you? Oh yeah, I was extremely happy. Gave you a little more freedom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so through the course of the summer there, uh, we were get, were you getting stronger and and feeling better? Yes. All right. Uh, was it always so, or did you have some ups and downs? Ups and downs, which is kind of expected with CRPS. All right. And um, so let's see. I would like to publish. Uh, who, who's your who back then was your favorite singer? I loved Megan Trainer. Okay. And let's let's talk about how you were doing in July of 2016 if we'll play the clip just uh 30, 3600 to 47 it's a brief clip from and you can tell us what you're doing here in a moment
at this point, had you did you have limited use of? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, July 28th, 2016. Uh, yes, yeah, July 28th. No, let's see. The clip is uh, 2659 on July 28th, 2016. You're moving pretty good there, Mike. Yes. Okay, but still not out of the wheelchair. No. Were you hoping to get out of that wheelchair? Yes, I was on the track to be getting out. All right. And so when you had some uh, periods where the pain would come back, uh, were the, was it as strong or was it less than what you'd expected, what you had experienced before the Mexico infusions? It was less than what I experienced previous to the prolonged sedation in Mexico. All right. But did you continue the ketamine uh, program through the summer? I did because it's what worked for me. Okay. And so you would go back for sets when you needed them, of, and there were a lot of them at some points and none at others? Right. It just depended on my condition. Okay. Did you try other, with your folks, did you try other uh, types of, tr of treatments? Yes. So even though we established that the ketamine had worked for me, we learned about the hyperbaric chamber, so we gave that a shot. And... How is that supposed to work? If you know, if you don't know, it's okay. But I really don't understand the whole thing. But I did try it. But you were in a high oxygen environment for a while. Is that yeah, it? that's all I know. I don't really know everything else. You know why you wanted to, your folks, and you wanted to try a, a something different than the ketamine infusions? Well, they were always open to new therapies. They weren't just exclusively going to use ketamine. So when they heard about some success with the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, they gave it a go. And did they want you to try things that did not involve a medication? Yes. And so what about IVIG, the immune system stimulant? Did you try that? I did try that, yes. Right, briefly. And did that have do any good? I don't have much recollection of it um, being like substantial, but I know that it did help me because I was um, willing to do it again. Okay. Now, um, Maya, you were, as the record reflects, um, oh, okay, let's see. Yeah. Um, let's... Uh, I want to show how you were doing then in June and July of 2016. Now that we get into the summer, I published 2530-46. Yes, so here you could see my feet um, flat on the ground, which was a huge step for me. I was very proud of myself. I'm holding myself up with my upper body strength, and my dystonia is not present in this picture. I was really close to walking. Okay. And were you looking forward to walking? Yes. Yes. Uh, let's uh, publish 2530-50. Was it important for you to be working your upper body here? Yeah. So my goal was to strengthen my upper body enough to the point where I could hold myself up with a walker if my legs gave out at certain times, so I was still safe and would prevent injury. Even though it was painful, I pushed myself. Okay. Now, uh, continuing then through the summer, um, were you looking forward to getting out of that wheelchair? Yes. Tell the jury by August of 2016, did you believe you were going to be able to get out of that wheelchair? By the fall, I truly believed it, and I wanted to go back to school, walking. Now, um, did there come a time when you, um, oh, all right, uh, let's play 2659. Did your mom encourage you through these things? This is the uh, uh, that's not it, is it? Let's continue, and then they'll get that straight. Um, and it was uh, your mom encouraging you on the walker if we get to it. 
Um, and my next question is, were your mom and dad encouraging you through this period of time to get better, get out of that wheelchair? Always. They always were very positive around me. So driving you to these different appointments and things, was that a pretty significant time commitment for them? It was, and it was very difficult, but again, they wanted what was best for their children, and that included, you know, helping me with my treatments. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, and we'll get back to that one video in a moment. 2695. All right. Then let's do 2695. That's better. I love you. Now go down slowly. Now what's the goal there with the go legs? Go down slowly. Good job. Sorry, I did not hear your question. Good job. Very good. Excellent. Mr. Uh, Strainer, so I apologize again. Can you please tell me the date of the video? July 28, 2016. Thank you, sir. All right. So the goal here by this point, the end of July, was that by the middle of fall you were going to be out? Oh, yes. Right. And then did there come a time when you wanted to avoid going back to school in a wheelchair? Yeah, I was the only kid in a wheelchair, so I didn't want to be that kid going back to school. How were you going? Uh, what was Homeward uh, Homebound? So that's a program where the teachers will come to your house and actually give you instruction. Okay. And did you like that? Did you like your teachers? I love my teachers. I mean, the fact that they were willing to take time out of their day to come and teach me, it meant everything. And could they work around your treatment schedules? They did, yes. What was your concern with going back to school insofar as your treatment schedules? Well, I would be missing instruction. I probably would miss assignments and my grades would drop. And I really didn't want to jeopardize my education, so we tried a different route. Okay. And did it trouble you uh, quite a bit then uh, that you <laughs> were going to have to go back to school uh, in your wheelchair? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what did that lead to? It unfortunately led to a relapse. All right. Well, this is your first relapse since Mexico? Or yes. Your first relapse ever, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, so did you go back to Dr. Hanna to complete a, um, more of a ketamine infusion set? Yes, I did. We went to him because it's less expensive compared to Kirkpatrick. Okay. And through the course of this now, um, what were the symptoms that you were displaying insofar as your stomach? And remember what we talked about before, the intestines and so forth. What, what was going on in this relapse? Or strike it. What had returned? So with CRPS, it's pretty well known that it could affect some organs. And for me, it affected my um, large intestine. So I often got pretty constipated. It's because both, um, well, CRPS, it's an attack on the sympathetic nervous system, which also affects the digest, uh, gi digestive system. So I was pretty constipated regularly. And from time to time, did you uh, end up in an ER for the constipation that resulted? Yes. When our remedies at home, like Miralax, didn't work, we were forced to go to the ER. To get cleaned out. Gross, Correct. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then let's uh, publish 2530-61. And for the record, uh, this is October 6, 2016. How are you sleeping at this time, by the way, at I home? wasn't sleeping very well at night, so I took the opportunity whenever I was tired to sleep. This is during one of my infusions at Dr. Hanna's, and I'm taking a nap. Uh, were these infusions uh, painful for you by this point? or No, the infusions themselves were not painful. Okay. All right, then. Mr. Anderson, can I uh, see the attorneys for a moment?
Okay, members of the jury, I'm just cognizant of a time, cognizant that you haven't had a break in a while. I know we're a little early for lunch, but instead of taking a break short and then go to lunch, why don't we just take an early lunch before we get into the next subject of the direct examination? So let's let's call it. Uh, I could have uh, the jury ready to go back at twelve forty-five. Twelve forty-five. Okay. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. And I'll see you back after lunch. Plaintiff defense, do you um, think we're going to need some time after we come back from lunch, but before the jury? I'm just trying to decide what time we need to come back. I think we have one issue that might take five minutes. No, nothing from the defense. Is this the famous five minutes? That I don't think it's the famous five minutes. I think it's the real five minutes. Can you advise us what it is? Sure. Sir? So right now? Yes, please. Uh, we filed a declaration last night of Dr. Kirkpatrick regarding... Uh, 934 in recordings. So I want to discuss that with the court. That sounds like more than five minutes. All right, then we'll it's do it. So definitely more than five minutes. Jordan. We will be back at 1230, which gives everybody about an hour and six minutes for lunch. So I will see everybody back at 1130. Judge. Oh, sorry, 1230. If I might, that, that issue may take more than 10 minutes. I'm just wondering if maybe that can wait till after the jury is through today. Well, I don't know what the issue is, so... I've got about 15 minutes time between the time we come back and the time the jury comes back. Okay, so 12.30.
Let's. What were the issues, uh, Mr. Whitney, that needed to get addressed? Uh, Judge, we had one. But I guess I can put my bag on. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick and the recordings. We have filed. And I'm not sure it's got a DIN number yet. It was filed at 9:33 p.m. Uh, was yesterday, and it's notifying declaration of Dr. Anthony Kirkpatrick, and he lists, uh, I believe. Then the, um, not exactly, but he tells us what the categories of the recordings he approves or that he gave, gives consent to. And he gives consent to everything that, that he recorded. And he gives consent to anything that he recorded and uh, Viata or someone else recorded as long as it's contemporaneous. He objects to anything that was recorded without... Yeah, any recordings made? Can, can you give me context as to what we're talking about? Sure, Judge. They, there are some recordings of Dr. Kirkpatrick, oral recordings, and there are video recordings. By Beata Kowalski? The video recordings are all Kirkpatrick, and Kirkpatrick also has some audio recordings. Beata Kowalski has audio uh, recordings. So the court understands Dr. Kirkpatrick is okay with all the recordings, video or audio, except the ones that he did not also, also record. So there are a few of these recordings that he did not know or give his consent, if he did know, to the recording. I, there's not that many, but we think a couple of them made their way into evidence. We want to identify them for the court, and we'd ask an order in limine based on the 934 objections that everyone seems to be, rules everyone seems to be playing by at this point. So they went in, but without uh, the consent of Dr. Kirkpatrick, just as, the, as to those. Well, whatever exhibit or exhibits that that subset is, have any of them been played to the jury? No. No, Your Honor. Yeah. No. Okay. Do you have a list of those that fall in the subset? Yes, yes. Ten, joint exhibit 1076, 1077, and 1078. We have a copy for the okay. court. So the for court. now, let's not publish them. I don't know, has, the defense, have you had any opportunity to hear what's we on those three? Honor, and we have a, an argument about this in that Dr. Kirkpatrick has testified uh, contrary to his declaration of yesterday, that uh, he routinely uh, videotapes his encounters with patients. And there is testimony, and we're trying to, I had it right here, I'm trying to find it again. He, there is testimony to the effect that he videotaped the initial consult with these, with these, uh, with this patient, on 9/23/15, and a follow-up on November 2nd, 2015. That those are exhibits 1076 and 1077, respectively, I believe. There's also an audio recording, audio recording that is covered by this on 1078. But those two that I just made reference to. He expressly has testified that those recordings were made by video in the ordinary course of his practice. And then they were gone. But Mrs. Kowalski did, in fact, audio tape those. And the controversy that was about to be raised with the court before plaintiffs agreed to those two pieces of audio or being put in evidence was that there was agreement among the parties that they be audio taped, that Dr. Kirkpatrick had said expressly that he made those recordings, video recordings with audio in the ordinary course of his practice. And so he had no expectation of privacy when the audio was made by Ms. Kowalski, whether or not he had actual notice of it. 
Your Honor. So we were going to use those those things, and I, and frankly, intend to use some of them in the cross examination of of, Ms., of Dr. Kirkpatrick tomorrow. Are we using them with uh, Ms. Maya Kowalski today? Not to my knowledge, Judge. Your Honor, we'd ask for to the court to take notice that they're not giving you any testimony. They're not producing any testimony on this because they're misconstruing his testimony as to these dates. He's been clear for at least the past two years that there are no video recordings on those dates. None exist. <laughs> okay, so I beg to differ. At the end of the day, if there's not a clean issue of consent, I'm going to need to resolve that. So I will need to either see the competing affidavits or accept testimony on the issue. But the reality is if there is no consent that's clear or that it's in a situation where there's not a clear expect or not an expectation of privacy, then it's not coming in, not going to be played. So I understand, Your Honor. I'm just I'm I'm looking right now at a summary of follow-up evaluations of Maya Kowalski prepared by Dr. Kirkpatrick, one with the initial evaluation of 92315. It lists dictated initial evaluation, handwritten notes of the evaluation, new information form, new patient information form reviewed with the patient and mother, pre-treatment video performed with pain thresholds recorded, a similar set of descriptions of records available exists with respect to 11-2-2015. So the point we were going to make previously, again, before there was an agreement to put these into evidence, was that there was a, a, an intention on the part of Dr. Kirkpatrick to record those encounters as part of his records. And your, your Honor will be told, and we'll see, all the rest of his encounters with this patient were videoed. Perhaps, but... I so it sounds it, like well, I need just, evidence on this. It disappeared. At one point, this, this uh, allegation that there was agreement on these coming into evidence, just to remind the court, there were 151 joint exhibits. And in the days leading up to jury selection, the defense withdrew agreement on about 80 of those and then added a couple. These were among the last ones that they added. It was an oversight on our part, but there was never agreement to have these. Again. I'm going to need evidence on the issue until we get it resolved. 1076, 1077, and 1078 will not be played to the jury. And very well, Your Honor. And, but I, I will. It sounds I, like I, I'm going to need a few minutes to take testimony on that prior to this issue being resolved. Very well, Your Honor. But I, I will point out that there will also be a controversy over the authenticity of Dr. Kirkpatrick's signature on this declaration that was filed. Well, I'm assuming at some point Dr. Kirkpatrick it will be testifying, whether it's in person or from a hospital, but I don't know yet. But Tomorrow afternoon. I'm sure he'll be able to tell us whether he signed it. I'm sure you're going to testify. I'm sorry? I'm sure you're, you'll hear testify. <laughs> Sounds there, like I will. It's my understanding from counsel that the witnesses tomorrow are, are Dr. Brewerton, Dr. Corcoran, and Dr. Kirkpatrick. Uh, I, I think Dr. Corcoran was planned for Wednesday. It depends somewhat on the length of my Kowalski. Well, I'm just if, if, if you if you if you want if he if he wants to be Wednesday, that's fine. I just we just need to get up one way or the other. I think at the moment we are planning on Dr. Brewerton, Dr. Kirkpatrick. And Dr. Hannah tomorrow. Yes. Okay, that's different. Okay. That's different than what I was said. So, we, well, that, that, that also sounds pretty ambitious. Well, we have to be. We have to get this on by Friday, right? All right. So, to be clear, Judge, because we've been told, and I'm not faulting them, just saying it's shifted a little bit between twelve and now. Dr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. Hannah, and Dr. Brewington are tomorrow. That's what Mr. Whitney just said. Okay. And. Hopefully, we'll get through uh, Dr. Newberger's different excerpts and be able to play him in the next couple of days. Yeah, that, and that's not making excuses in advance, Judge, but he's, he had some lengthy depositions. The depositions was taken initially 
by uh, Mr. Haskell, counsel at the time for Dr. Smith, who was a party. Most of the deposition testimony was focused on Dr. Sally Smith's conduct, and much of it was focused on what was in her report or what went into her report. And so what I'm telling you, Your Honor, in a roundabout way is editing and going through that is no small task. Thank you. Like I said, I, that's all in volume two, and I didn't designate the, the Sally Smith stuff. I waited. I just designated the background training and experience in volume one, and then jumped to the third one, which is video. I, I beg to differ, Judge. I went through. I know we can look at this tomorrow, but I spent an hour going through it last night at eleven to midnight, and all the Sally, most of the Sally stuff was designated. So if they change that designation, I'm unaware of it. But in any event, I'll make sure I go through them tonight. And I'll try to make clear then if I'm not going to do something, so you don't have to do stuff that you don't have to do. Anything else? We're about three minutes before. Um, oh, Judge, I would. I'm sorry. This doesn't have to be now, but if you have time, I just wanted to advise the court um, on Wednesday. I haven't even told my co-counsel, but on Wednesday, um, one of my children has a appointment with a cardiologist. My other child is taking her. I'm just, we'll have to leave when they get in the room with the doctor. So I just want to advise the court around 1 30, 2 o'clock. I may get up and leave I don't, just to be able to accommodate that conversation with the doctor. I understand. Okay. And that's Wednesday's the date that we will have to take an early lunch anyway. I'm not trying to change the, the, the what's happening in the courtroom. I'm just telling the court I may at one point get up and leave, and that would be why. And Judge, we, we do have a motion for rehearing on for the exclusion of Dr. Brewerton's last visit and Dr. Kirkpatrick's last visit in light of the court allowing Dr. Kelly, a psychiatrist, psychiatrist, to be able to testify. And so at some point we wanted to argue that it's a, it's a binger argument and we're hopeful that the court will reconsider that because again, there's a video that shows uh, some symptoms. This, this is the issue of going to the doctors after the discovery deadline and then not bringing yes. that to the court's attention earlier. Well, yes, Your Honor, but to be clear, we didn't know particularly that they were doing that and we found out we reported it within five days, which was the court's order. The only uh, issue then was not going back after that and retroactively asking the court, but the defense filed a motion fairly quickly, uh, so it was going to come up before the court anyway. So it wasn't, let's put it this way, it wasn't the plaintiffs planning out to do some sort of uh, out of discovery period discovery. It was merely a follow-up. And the court previously, uh, in fact, noted that there were some problems with having the witnesses come up there and be asked, well, you saw her, you know, last time you saw her was three years ago or two years ago, however, what are they supposed to do? So we'd, we'd ask the court to, to at least consider allowing those in light of the fact that the court did allow them to bring in Dr. Kelly and he is more than capable of commenting on anything going on with those. Um, we have received a communication from Dr. Kelly that uh, places in question his availability to testify. We're in the process of reviewing that further. We're just so counsel is aware of it. That may be a moot point. Okay. Well, perhaps it was going to be rebuttal anyway. <laughs> could be, Judge. It could be. Anything else before we bring in the jury? Not from the plaintiff's point of view. Not from the defense And how long, and this is, I'm not holding it to you, but how long do you think your, the balance of your direct is? Oh, this is tough. Anything I say is going to be wrong. An hour and a half. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> two hours. <laughs> Do I have two and a half? <laughs> I, 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 it's so always the length of the right? questioning, the length of the answers, an hour and a half to two hours. Okay. 
I'm going to try, if, if you have not taken, if you have not rested up at the two hour mark, so at 2.45 we'll take a break. Okay. If I see the jurors start to get restless or the court reporter, then we might take a break earlier. But, you know, my hope is to just have one break this afternoon. And so I'm trying to push, push everybody to go as long as we can. I, I look forward to those breaks too. It's hard standing up there for two well, hours. I, I think you're on your feet for two hours. Okay, let's bring in the jury. Yes, sir. Okay, please be seated, everybody. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. And have, since you were last with us, has anyone approached you about this case? Have you seen any media reports about this case? No. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Maya Kowalski? If you come on down. And Ms. Kowalski, you understand you're still under oath? Thank you. May I please inquire? You may inquire. May when we left, we were right up to the point of the infamous October 7th admission. Um, I want you to tell the jury at this point in the midst of your relapse, your first relapse, uh, what symptoms you had. I had the same burning pain, but this time it was more amplified than it was when I was getting the infusions. And I had lesions coming back. I had discoloration and change in temperatures. And my dystonia was more obviously. prevalent. Sorry, I forgot. And you were obviously in a wheelchair? Still in a wheelchair. Okay. Now, before October 7th, um, were you still, had you had this uh, problem in the gut with being able to pass food through because of the CRPS? That was a problem that was more with my CRPS, yes, constipation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And had you been to Johns Hopkins the week before, October 1st, to visit? Yes. And what was that for? Was it for the same thing, the stomach issues? Yes. Of lower stomach issues. Okay. Um, and at this point, you were what, 10 years old? I was 10. All right. So let's talk a little bit about that visit. So... Um, do you remember the the why of going there that day, that um, morning? October 7th? The or, 7th. Okay. Yes. So I was in excruciating pain, and this time my stomach was also, like, it was awful. Um, I was complaining. My knees were up to my chest. I was crying. So my dad took me in. All right. So it was your father? Not yes. your mother that took you in? And then the week prior, my dad also took me in. Mm -hmm. Tell me something. When you would go back to Johns Hopkins or, or any of the doctors there, uh, were they 
immediately aware of the history or did your dad or mom have to explain it every time, your sure, history? Be speculation, Your Honor. <clears throat> Overall. Actually, yeah, my parents always had to re-explain my history of CRPS. From what you saw, was this frustrating for your family, to, your mom and dad, to have to explain the same thing every time you come in? Most definitely. All right. So, um, so you come in, and your dad gives the the summary of or describes your history. What do you recall after that? I remember just being in the ER, but I wasn't in the ER for too long. I remember I was transferred to the PICU. All right. And up to that point, while you were in the ER and up to the uh, uh, certain event, were, were you in, in pain? Were you calm? Were you active? What, were your, what was your outward manifest? I was actively in pain, yes. All right. Were you thrashing or acting out in any way at that point? At that point, no. So they took you up to the PICU and tell the jury what happened then. When I was transferred to the PICU, I remember my mom came in at some point. The nurses and doctors wanted to put a tube down my nose. And with CRPS, I mean, a blood pressure cuff, that hurts. So imagine, you know, like a tube being shoved down your nose into your stomach. And obviously, that would have caused so much pain. And I knew my body. I knew I was not going to be able to tolerate that. Um, that is the only time I asked for sedation. I didn't just randomly yell out, I need sedation, like depicted in the medical records. I only asked for sedation when they wanted to do that procedure. And then were you given sedation before they tried to put this tube down your nose? I was not. Um, and my mom was actually in the room and she listened to the doctors and didn't demand for sedation. Instead, about like, I would say two or three people held me down and tried to get the tube down my nose. That is when I was screaming, crying, and thrashing around. I did not curse at any of the staff. That is a lie. Um, but they were not able to get it down, which I suspected because of the pain. Well, you're fairly religious. Uh, did you curse as a matter of course as a religious 10-year-old? I never really cursed. I mean... I always thought it was really bad when people did it. Okay. Um, later on, you heard that in the hospital, though, from others. But yes, we'll from We'll talk staff. about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, they tried to do this. And so what? Ha how did it feel when the uh, doctors or nurses, I guess, held you down? Describe it in more detail. Where did they grab you and how hard they grabbed you so forth? Well, it was norm it was just like the upper body portion because they were trying to get the tube in my nose. So they were holding on my shoulders and just like my chest area. Um, but again, they were not able to do it. Ultimately, they had to use sedation. Okay. Um, and I want to ask something right now, uh, uh, Maya. Do you have a, a symptom that while you're up here, you might uh, manifest known as myoclonic jerking? Yeah, so... I don't know if people have noticed this, but normally when I'm sitting in the courtroom and whatnot, I have these like little twitches. It could be anywhere from, you know, my feet to the head. Um, they're kind of random. I'm not doing it on purpose. It's just a symptom of CRPS and it's involuntary. Um, and because I'm not getting my infusions at this point in time, unfortunately, they're going to be getting worse and worse. Okay. So now you're being held down and you got sedation. Uh, what do you recall after that? Well, I do remember um, the tube being in my nose. I remember my um, mom having to leave on a certain day, and this was the last time I talked to her. Okay. Now, and before I forget, there was... Uh, I'm sorry I'm jumping around a little bit. I'll make sure I get to this. Uh, before we go on, by this point... Did you know what having a ketamine infusion, the feeling of ketamine inside you was? Yes. Were you able to tell 
throughout this period and, and after you had started having them with Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Cantrew and Dr. Hannah, were you able to tell when your body was receiving ketamine? Yes. And how could you tell? I could tell because the pain level, first off, it was lowered, and there's like a feeling, it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but you could just tell, like, you feel a little bit funny. Um, mm -hmm. It's not your normal self. Okay. And then tell the jury whether, the best of your knowledge and for everything you saw, heard, felt, your mom ever gave you IV ketamine at home? Never through the IV, no. How did she give it to you? It was orally administered, which was okay by the doctor and everything. It tasted a little bit weird, so at one point I asked her to add Gatorade to it, so it's just easier to go down. And but the prescription itself, and, and if you're aware, great. If you're not, it's okay. The prescription itself, what, what did it what did it read? Did it say oral or did it say intravenous? Did it say... The bottle itself? Yes. Yeah, it said intravenous, but it was only for oral purposes. So you apl apply it out of the bottle to the gateway. Right, right. right. It never through the IV. So you never had an IV ketamine at home? Not at home, no. All right. So now you're... Sorry to jump around. You're back in the hospital, and did they start to examine you? Um, and if so, what happened after that, if you recall? Or do you recall much after you were sedated would be a better question. No, but I do remember being in the PICU. All right. Um, and was there anything else that you recall? Was it just one a nurse coming in and out, or were there more people there? In the PICU, you mean? Yes. Yeah, I this, remember, this. Um, well, because I couldn't walk or anything, I had to have help using the bathroom. And I remember it's quite embarrassing, but my dad was helping me clean up and a doctor came in or so I thought a doctor because I knew it looked like a doctor because all of them wear this like white lab coat and then there's colored squares across their chest. Um, usually there's like a name embroidered in, but I didn't see that on her. So I assumed she was a doctor. She came in very briefly, and it was awkward because here I am, you know, naked from the bottom down after using the restroom, and she's asking my dad questions, um, and then she left the room. And did you subsequently find out who that was? Later I found out it was Sally Smith. Did anyone from the hospital differentiate Sally Smith from any of the other doctors that you were seeing that day? Absolutely not. Did Dr. Smith... Uh, explain her role in any way? Never. And did she question your dad, and I don't know about you, but did she question you or your dad about symptoms and history? She actually believed in your honor. Overall. <clears throat> no, I do not recall that. Now, um, after uh, Dr. Smith then, was your mom telling the doctors, do you recall who was in there at that time, the doctor-wise, if you don't? Sorry. I don't know their names, sorry. Mm -hmm. Man, female, male? It was usually more than one, but sometimes they came in individually, and it was mixed gender. All right. And so was your mom explaining the symptoms? And she the always did. I mean, that was pretty routine. She had to do that for almost every visit. Was your mom worried from what you could tell or excited? How would you describe her? Well, she was definitely worried about her kid, and... Um, we had just moved to Florida, and I don't know if you know, but there was a hurricane during this time, so I think everyone was kind of on edge. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, learn at that time or subsequently why you went to Johns Hopkins as opposed to other uh, hospitals? Or Well, there was a Johns Hopkins in Sarasota, wasn't there? Um, I don't know. But it was a distance thing. We were staying at the Ronald McDonald House. Oh, okay. Because at the time, it was easier to get to my infusion place with um, Dr. Hannah rather than driving from Venice to wherever he was located. Um, and it just so happened that the Ronald McDonald House is very close to John Hopkins Hall Children's Hospital. So you're on campus, in other words, at Johns Hopkins? Yeah, pretty close. 
All right. And so your mom told uh, them about the symptoms. Do you recall them questioning you at all about your symptoms? No. So what happened after that, uh, to the best of your knowledge? Did you stay up, go to sleep, what? Um, well, like I said, there wasn't ever a specific time where I saw the doctors and nurses ask my mom to leave. It was only because this was the day that she had to go to work, and that was my last conversation with her. Whereas with my dad, I vividly remember people coming in and telling him that this was his last time to say goodbye to me. So was this the last time you saw your mom? Uh, the last time I saw my mom, my dad wasn't there. Um, I was laying in the bed. This was while you were in your room? Yeah, you Still gone? in the PICU. Still in the PICU? Still in the PICU, yes. So this is pretty close to when you... Checked in? Or yes. Got it yes. I, was, oh. I know I was still in the PICU. Um, my mom was, like, picking up her work bag and just, like, little things she had brought to the hospital. And she said, I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. And I never saw her again. Need some water? Um, I noticed you're wearing a necklace. Why don't you explain that? Yeah, so, um, so December 10th was my birthday. I had turned 11, and I was unfortunately still in the hospital at the time. And the hospital has this program where they collect funds, um, for children who are still in the hospital on their birthday. I was given $20 to spend, and, um... I remember the social worker came in and she asked me what I'd like to buy. I bought a Nerf gun for my brother. I bought my mom a necklace and then I bought my dad his favorite bag of mints because I didn't have a lot of money left over. But then my Aunt Wendy bought him this little glass Christmas tree and we just said it was for me. Um, but I bought my mom this very specific necklace that says I love you to the moon and back. It's just like she always said that to me. Um, and then I found out later that she wore it every single day. And when she was found in the garage, she was still wearing it. And I have it on my neck right now. Have some water. Sorry. We'll get through it. Can we publish uh, 27, excuse me, 2571-001? We're going to switch for a second there, Molly, and uh, ask you about uh, obvious symptoms at the time of your admission. Now, the record reflects it. This is October 8th, 2016, so this would have been the day after you you came was, in yes and was it a Friday and then this this one would have been on a Saturday correct all right and what is that there it's a lesion and again the same thing it's just smaller ones connecting okay now um, since that time have you had the opportunity to review some of the Johns Hopkins records that were supposed to be documenting your condition here and there yes. All right, let's uh, show 1001-2645, uh, and I'll represent for the record. It'll show it's the skin assessment for that same day. All right, so that's got one circular red scab and one circular pink? Yes. But nothing else about the other uh, lesions on your body? Correct. Did you have one on your back or not? I um, had one on my back, but I also had them in other areas, which they failed to document. All right. So the ones they're talking about here, and this can be confusing, they're talking about the one on your back, or did they ever talk about the one on your legs? They the never, ones on your legs. Yeah, no, they didn't. Not on that date. Okay. 
Okay. Let's continue then. Um, so you begin your stay there. Um, were your mom and dad uh, able to come see you in your room um, at this time? At this time, yes. Okay. Your dad. Okay. And then um, tell us about the rooms you stayed in during this period of time, October, November, December of 2016. Regular hospital rooms? Um, so first the emergency room, then the PICU. Um, the most distinguishing thing about the PICU, even though every room kind of has it, it's the circular clock. Um, and I remember that because that's all I looked at for days and I just heard it tick because um, I didn't have the strength to watch anything on the TV. And then when I was moved up from the PICU to a different floor, I believe it was seven. I stayed on seven a lot. I had multiple different rooms, even though their policy is every 30 days you switch a room. I think I had, I mean, I stayed there over 90 days, but I had way more than three rooms. And these rooms had surveillance cameras. And when I was placed in those rooms with the surveillance cameras, I was told that to not worry about them, they don't work. So now, if we could, there has been uh, allegations here that you were uh, outside your room 95% of the time. Can you tell the jury whether that's true? That's not true at all. Most of the time I was in my room. There were times where I went to PT, which I was outside my room, and there was a few occasions where I went to the rec room. Um, but for, I would say, the majority of my time, I was kept in my room. And was there... Did the rooms have the kids that were there, their names on the door or next to the door? So at one point, I started to get wheeled out into the hallways and whatnot, um, and that's when I was going to PT or the rec room. Uh -huh. And I noticed something really weird was that all the other rooms on the floor, they had name tags. It would say the patient's name and just the last initial, whereas with mine... I just had a sheet of paper in there with color-coded stickers. I asked the nurses what the color corresponded to and what that meant and why I didn't have a name, and they would not tell me. I asked multiple nurses, and all of them said, I can't tell you. During this period of time, do you recall an instance where your mom was trying to get in touch with you and the nurse said something different than just simply putting it through to you? Which instance? Was there a time during this period, this first week or so, mm -hmm. when uh, your mom called for you and you did not receive the call but overheard what was said? Yes. So I remember that my mom was um, on this phone call and the person who she was speaking to, a person at the hospital, I'm not sure what role they had, but they claimed that I never asked to speak to my mom. I was doing fine. I was okay in my room. I hadn't had any questions about why my parents weren't allowed to see me. And that infuriated me so much because all I did for days on end was demand to speak to my parents. That's all I wanted to do. And I most certainly wasn't just sitting in my room. I was crying. And I <laughs> So now, were there other kids on the floor? I mean, were there yes. you know, somebody to talk to, somebody you could, for lack of a better term, play with? Well, it's a children's hospital, so there's plenty of kids all around. I, um, again, I went to the rec room. So for people who don't know what that is, it's just like a playroom. You could do activities. Um, there's volunteers there. Um, so I remember going down there. Nurse wheeled me down. Uh -huh. And... I was just working on some art project, I don't remember what, but this really sweet social girl, she came over to me and she just started talking to me. How old would you, would you, did you think? She, she, was, was? she looked around my age, I would say, or maybe a little bit, actually younger, sorry, my bad, younger for certain. Um, and her mom noticed that she came over to me a lot and was talking to me. Come to find out, we were on the same floor, um, I was on seven. And I saw her out in the hallway one day, and I asked the nurse to wheel me out. So the nurse wheeled me out. She brought me to 
the area, so there's like this, on the floor, there's this huge window where you could see outside of the hospital. So you could see like the street and all the cars passing by. And there's a little chair um, that faces this window. So people who just wanted like a change of scenery could go over there. So her mom was there with Natalie, the friend that I had made. And I was wheeled over there and I talked to them. Another nurse observed this interaction and quickly told somebody. Next thing I know, Kathy Beatty is in my room saying I'm not to ever speak to a patient again. Um, and that day, Natalie had given me this little present because her mom noticed my parents were never with me. I think they just wanted to comfort me and I have it in my bag today. Did they ever give you any reason why you, as a 10 year old, couldn't just talk to the kid next door, for lack of a better term. I have no reason. I mean, they didn't give me any reason. And it was heartbreaking because, you know, they had my door open a lot and the blinds were open so I could see other people conversing and interacting. And here I am all alone. Mm -hmm. Now, were they at this time paying a lot of attention to your symptoms, uh, discussing your symptoms with you? Even though I told them about my symptoms and I pointed them out, it didn't matter. They they kind of just ignored them. Right. Before we go further, I think what I want to do, if we can pull up 2003-001, uh, the All Children's Health System, a summary of Florida Patients' Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, if we could. So... Uh, Maya, were you aware of any of this at the time, or were, did you become aware of these later? I was not made aware of them within the hospital. I wish I would have known them. All right. So you had a right, I'll just paraphrase, to courtesy and respect. Is that right? Correct. And individual dignity and protection of your privacy. Is Correct. That right? Uh, a prompt and reasonable response to questions and requests for you. Can Tell I, me about the bathroom. I just object to the on these lines of questions. Overall. Uh, tell me about trying to go to the bathroom during this period. Uh, when, how, what did you have to do to get to the bathroom? So with the whole like bathroom situation, obviously I was not able to walk and I couldn't push my wheelchair at this time. So the nurses helped me, which was totally cool. But it's when the showering happened where it was really weird. So I had to have the door open and they would have to watch me because they were afraid that I would cut myself. I wasn't allowed to have a razor. Later I was able to have a razor to shave my legs, but I just never felt good about myself. And it says here a patient has the right to know who's providing services and who's responsible for your care. Was it ever explained to you who was the person, other than Kathy Beatty, most responsible for your care? No. And so it says that uh, you have a right to know what rules and regulations apply to your conduct. Did anybody discuss that with you ever? No. Were you ever shown any of these rules and regulations or rights? No. All right. Did you um, receive any information from the Johns Hopkins nurses or the doctors uh, when they visited you about what diagnosis and, and, and what their, their plan was for you? So I, they never told me straight up. They never said, we think you have conversion disorder. They never said, we think your mom has my child's and by proxy. Instead, they would give me like little clues in the things that they were saying. So for example, when I expressed to them a symptom or like my pain, they would say, no, you're making it up or it's in your head. Um, and then at one point, the social worker, Kathy Beatty, said that my mom was in a mental institution um, making me think that something was wrong with her. And I asked my dad and it turned out to be a lie. Um, so they were trying to even manipulate me into thinking that my mom was sick and therefore making me sick, even though it wasn't true. Well, as the allegations of much hasn't by proxy, which are that your mom or dad are intentionally trying to keep you sick, did any of the doctors or nurses ever simply ask you about your relationship with your mom and dad? 
No, and as a matter of fact, they always told me what went down in my house. Dr. Elliot, he said that my mom was putting me in a coma every single week, and I told him no. But even though I told him no, he wouldn't accept that as an answer. Did they seem to have their own story they wanted told? Absolutely, no doubt about that. And so then it says the patient has a right to refuse any treatment. Um, were you ever given any right to accept or reject the physical therapy? No. What was the problem with that as time went on with the physical therapy? So even though physical therapy, like done in a certain way, does help CRPS, when you don't listen to the patient, it's actually going to be more harmful than beneficial. So my condition just went downhill. I mean, when I got back home after being released, it was, it was nasty. Well, I got to ask you now, there's been some testimony about withdrawal. Uh, did you ever experience, do you know what, what, what withdrawal is from a drug? Yeah, I've did, heard did about it in school, yeah. Okay. And remembering back and knowing now, uh, did you ever have any feelings after ketamine was stopped for a period of time of withdrawal? No, ketamine for me was stopped multiple times and for like sometimes weeks and I've never had, I've never identified with the symptoms of withdrawal. So no, no sniffling and anxiety and runny nose and severe headaches and all that? None no. of that? So did, the, uh, did they ever come to you and tell you that they thought you needed to stay there because you needed to be weaned off of ketamine? They have never told me that. Right. Um, it goes down there and it says uh, you know, about... About a third, two thirds of the way down, a patient has a right to impartial access to medical treatment or accommodations, regardless of race, sex, gender, identity, sexual orientation, national origin, religion, creed, handicap. You see that? Yes. All right. So, uh, tell the jury now first as to uh, being Polish. What does the term mamusha mean? If I'm pronouncing that correctly. I, I yes, you are. Objection sustained. 
Let's uh, take the down for a moment. And so it says, um, you also had a right to treatment um, where you, if you were deteriorating <coughs> from a failure to provide treatment. Uh, Maya, as time went on, did you let them know that you were not doing so hot? Yes, I did tell them whenever they asked, I told them of my pain. In the beginning of my stay, I told them constantly about my pain, but I soon learned that they weren't listening, so I stopped telling them, and I just told them when they asked. And how did you feel, if you could take the jury through it, from when you first got in towards the end? Take us through the stages of how your physical condition went. So when I first got in, I was in extremely bad condition because of the relapse. Um, once the constipation had passed, I did get a little bit better because the pain from the constipation was now gone. But my physical condition as I went on got worse and worse. And by the end, what was their physical condition by the time you finally got out of there? Well, and to paint the picture, I mean, before I went there, you saw me on the walker. Like, I was on my way to walking and being able to stand and bear weight. And then when I left, I couldn't even open a water bottle. Could you sit up by yourself, hold yourself up by yourself? No. Phone? All right. So I was asking you what the term mamusha means in Polish. What is that? It means mom. And what happened when you would uh, speak Polish to your mom or try to? So um, after some time, I was granted privileges to have phone conversations with my mom. And she, because I didn't have any Polish instruction at the hospital, my only way to maintain my Polish or maybe get better at it was by talking in Polish to my mom. So I would say things like, Dzień dobry, mamusia, jak się masz, which just means, hello, mom, how are you? Or, jako hamcze, which means, I love you. Um, and every time I spoke in that language, I was told to stop. I have to speak in English. I, they would get really Girl, worried. I apologize for the interruption. Same objection. Overruled. You can, can, fin you can finish your answer. Okay. But they would always tell me to revert back to English so they could understand. And so there was also a section in another one of the patient and families have rights that says you have a right to practice your cultural values and spiritual beliefs as long as they don't interfere with the well-being of others. I want to talk for a moment, and that the hospital's right there that you have. I want to talk a little bit about being able to practice as a Catholic in the church, in, in Johns Hopkins during this period of time. So tell us uh, how often you would uh, have communion, go to church outside of this. So pre John Hopkins, I went to church every Sunday, and I went to Sunday school, so I'd get communion once a week. All right. And once you got in there, what happened? Were you, um, how were your spiritual needs fulfilled? Um, they weren't. So... I was not allowed to have the communion that my priest from my church at home brought. Eventually, I was able to... Hang on, did, you, did they, anybody ever tell you, or did you ever learn why they weren't allowing in uh, holy water, communion, wafers, things like that? Objection to the they, the owner. The hospital people who were managing you, the nurses... Kathy Beattie, so forth. The people you were communicating with regularly. Yes. Did you ever learn from them or otherwise? If so, we'll explain why they were keeping communion wafers and holy water and the like away from you. I know the reason, and it was because they believed my mom was tampering with the wafer or the holy water and putting ketamine in it. And similarly, you know, there's a little off topic, uh, baked goods, any type of uh, food from home, were you allowed to have that? Oh, no, never. Only hospital food. Correct. What a joy. 
so let's get back to this now in terms of being able to practice your religion. What did you bring with you? Or if you didn't bring it in, what were you brought in terms of religious items to help you through this difficult time? All right, so going into the hospital, we didn't know how long I was staying there. Um, so eventually I was given the rosary, which is a standard like thing Catholics pray with. Um, and I was brought a prayer book so I could recite the prayers because there's a lot and I don't remember them all. Um, yeah, those were the two big things. And then the communion, which we talked about, and the holy water, which we already talked about. And did Miss Beatty or someone else from the hospital at some point take those from you? Yes. So now, uh, what were you told about your ability to practice your religion in the hospital? What did they say about it? Or they thought my mom was controlling me through religion, so they were really against me praying and doing that sort of thing. But Did they, would they make, what would they do if you tried to pray with your mom over the phone? Uh, they would shut it down. So what about a priest now? You had a priest from your church that you were comfortable with? Yes. Parish? And who was that? That was Father Jack. Okay. And tell us about visits from Father Jack. So he was able to, I remember two distinctive visits. The first one was an attempt to give me the um, communion, and we just chat a little bit. And then the second time I remember seeing him is when he came to help my dad announce my mom's passing. So were you allowed regular access to Father Jack? Oh, uh, no. Mm -mm. Right. Now... Um, as this was going on, these, these first couple of months there, did you, even though you're only 10, did you have an inkling of why they were doing this bizarre behavior? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, Strike it, this behavior. No, it's still objection again to the... Let's be more specific. Maya, during this period of time... What, if anything, made you suspicious, and what were you suspicious of? It was normally the comments that they made or the restrictions that they placed on me and not the other kids. Again, they never directly told me what was going on, even though I asked. So I had to figure it out for myself, and it did take time until I had a general understanding of what was taking place. And what was taking place, Maya? I was stripped from my family. They did not want you to go back to your family? No. And was this told to you in some form by Miss Beatty? She, well, she made a lot of comments, especially about my mom. Um, she was the one who came up with the mental institution comment. She also had a lot of ideas of where I should be placed. All right, and what was she su suggesting for you uh, as a place that they would place you? So I remember this one instance when she came into my room. She asked if she could sit on the end of my bed, and I told her yes. She sat down, and she told me that they were discussing in court the idea of foster care and placing me in a home. She cautioned me, this is word from word what she said, Foster care is nothing like it is in the movies. She said that, and then after saying that, she suggested that she take me in and she would be my foster parent. Let's pull up uh, 1001 All right, this is in evidence. Uh, let the record reflect from November 2nd. And uh, so... Was it at or around the time reflected here that Ms. Beatty was uh, initiating you into this concept that you would never go back to your parents, you would go to a foster family? I would, Objection, Your Honor, argument. Overall. <clears throat> I would say so, yes. I don't know the exact date that she told me, but I know it would, it corresponded to a I'm assuming, because she said it was a court hearing about foster care, and that's where she got the idea. 
Uh, now, this is uh, psychology progress notes. Let's talk about that for a second. Uh, when you came in, were you seen by a psychologist uh, to be given some testing? At the hospital? Mm hmm I later found that out, yes. All right. Well, tell us uh, who did that, if you don't recall. I believe his name is Dr. Lewis. Is right. that the one you're talking Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do remember that whole instance. I was wheeled into a separate room, and Dr. Lewis was in there with um, paper and pen and a bunch of tests. I did not want to be there. That day in particular, I was in more pain than usual, so much so I actually could not complete all of the tests. I complained of my hand hurting. Um, and then the nurse who wheeled me there, when she came to pick me up, I was in tears and I was crying. Well, subsequent, to, did, did Dr. Lewis engage you in any uh, analysis or conversation like analysis? He... I remember some of the things we talked about. Um, he asked about my family. He asked about, he, he regularly put words in my mouth. He tried to get me to agree to things and I would tell him, no, that's not true. Um, and yet he wrote it down on the piece of paper. Did you ever see his report? Oh. I, yes, and I, again, it's very frustrating because here you're going to a health you know, it's like a like a professional health place, and you have adults lying about what a child is saying. It's a whole nother level of messed up. You, it's just so unbelievably insane. Did you find out you know, whether he worked uh, for the hospital or whether he was working for DCF at the time? He never told me. Um, in terms of psychological counseling now, uh, do you know who Dr. Katzenstein is? I Did do. You? How often would you meet with Dr. Katzenstein, if at all? I think I relayed some information to Dr. Katzenstein, but I don't remember seeing them regularly. Okay. And in the visits that you remember, what happened? Tell us a little bit about them. Um, I, well, I remember relaying some information to the doctor, but I don't remember the visits themselves because, again, I don't really remember them happening. I want to go back to Dr. Lewis again. So there were all these statements in that report about things you said. How did those appear in there? He was the one suggesting that narrative, trying to get me to agree. And even though I did not agree, he still wrote it down as if I did. Did this add to your suspicion of what was going on here? It did, because I've been to hospitals before, and nothing like that had ever happened. Okay. Uh, can you tell us whether you had constant psychotherapy, or whether it was limited or next to none? It was next to none. I don't remember that happening regularly. There was a lot of PT, though. Okay. Now, uh, do you remember a time when you were put into a room and told you could not leave for some reason? Um, are you referring to the... 48 hours? Yes. Um, yes, I was told about that. Tell the jury what happened then. So I was told it was for like an EKG, and I don't know what that is, so I just said, okay. Um, I know now what an EKG is and what happened in the room was nothing like an EKG. They left me there for 48 hours under surveillance, which they did not tell me about. They had a commode in there, and they just put it far enough away from the bed so I would have to physically stand up and use the bathroom. Um, I called the nurses whenever I had to use the bathroom because obviously I'm not able to walk. And when they refused um, to help me go to the bathroom, I would defecate on myself. So let's show 2703-B, a clip from the covert surveillance.
you know you're being recorded through all this? No, they never told me. Continue. Is that it? Is that the end of it? Okay. Now, uh, so you had to have help? Yes. And was there any way to reach that commode uh, to relieve yourself without help? No. Not in my condition. And what would the nurses do when they came in and you had messed your bed? They would be pretty angry. I had this one nurse. Um, I would call her whenever I had to use the bathroom. And I, I'm understanding that you have other patients. I get that. She would come into the room, and I'm not even joking. She would yell, 10 more minutes, and then she would storm off. But again, my door is open. The blinds are open. I could see her conversing with the nurses. At, they have these like little council like areas, and I could see her talking. She was not busy. So I genuinely believe that they just wanted to push me to the limit of like, oh, I'm about to pee myself. I have to get up and stand. But that never happened. Instead, I just peed on myself. And you were not allowed to leave this room for 48? No. Two to 48 hours? No. And you would have left if you could? I wish I could have. So they kept you in there against your will? Correct. All right, let's use, uh, let's take a look at uh, 21116, a series of text messages at around this time regarding this particular visit. And if we could go move to the... Judge, again, we object to foundation uh, and through this witness. These are not her text messages. Senator so Edwards, you may proceed. So, uh, this next page. I'll get you highlight and get to the part and highlight it with uh, the description. All right, there you go. There you go. Uh, can we, yes, uh, it's 005 we're on right now. So, uh, this is with uh, Dr. D's and Dr. Sally Smith. Uh, now, does See, it says here something about pushing several feet in your wheelchair. Does CRPS involve paralysis? No, it does not. There are some patients with pain so severe that they might not be able to move their limb. Um, but that wasn't the case for me. I was still able to move my limbs. Obviously, I had my days, but I've never had paralysis. That's not associated with CRPS at all. But that's what they were concentrating on was whether you could move around or not? Right. So even though I explained to them that the symptoms vary, that's just the nature of CRPS. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they couldn't understand that. All right. So it, I think there's another one here from Dr. Smith replying to this. Yeah, one sec. It talks here about you being 10 and not being able to perform this charade. Uh, were you keeping up a charade, Maya? Not at all. Has anyone ever come into you, thinking back to the patient's rights, and explained to you that they were concerned that you were making all this up? No, they never told me that, but they did tell me frequently that it was all in my head, so they just planted the idea there instead of questioning me about it. Now, um, and at 10 years old, I know you're very intelligent for a 10-year-old, but were you equipped to try to outsmart or outthink or out whatever these doctors at this point? I wouldn't do that to a doctor. I'm just, I had an illness, and that's what it was. Now, there was a part of the, I forgot an event here. That's why I have Nick. So uh, it talks here in your rights about being able to have a another doctor or specialist uh, outside the hospital see you. 
Was there an attempt, to the best of your knowledge, to have Dr. Hanna come see you? In December? At or any time. I don't remember that. I know eventually um, down the line I was able to see him, but I was not made aware of any attempt for him to come to the hospital. Okay, so this was outside the hospital when you told Correct. Yourself. So during your time in the hospital, was any doctor outside of Johns Hopkins allowed to come in and examine you? No. Okay, now, um, I want to uh, pull up 2703-A and uh, ask you, were your CRPS lesions uh, prominent by this point? Yes. And did you from time to time ask the nurses to give you something to help them? I did. Um, I was without my special lotion that I was prescribed back at home with the lesions. And here I just requested Aquaphor because I believed it was the next best thing. Yeah, here I'm showing where all my lesions are. How, if you know, let's get finished with it here. Keep going. Is this pretty much what you did all day long? Sit in that bed? why all my belongings are on it. So you applied your own salve to them. Did it help? No. Did you tell them it was painful? I was explaining that to her, yes. So what was the hospital doing to help you deal with painful lesions? Well, they gave me Aquaphor, but again, it doesn't really do much for them. Were any of these nurses ever nice to you? I had a few nurses that were nice, but th I could tell that they were all agenda-driven. Um, like the whole Megan Trainer incident, I don't know if you want me to explain that now, but... I'm going to get to that right okay. after we talk just a second about what, how they're documenting this. So let's look, let's pull up, uh, like you were just applying to all your stuff, so all your CRPS lesions. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pull up 1001-2643. Uh, and let the record reflect that's a skin assessment for that day. And if we could focus there on uh, a particular day, or actually any day around there. Is there even one for that day? There's the 19th. Do you see anywhere where, after all that, they documented on your skin report any of these lesions? Even though I told them about them, they did not document them, trying to fit the narrative that I was making it up. Let's also then take a look at 2571-014. And for the record, I think this is a photo of your thumb. Now, that looks like a pretty small one. Yeah, it's just starting out. Okay. How, how did they progress, by the way? They start like that, and then what happens? Um, normally, without treatment, they do tend to get bigger, and they are open to the air. Um, they could be on any part of the body, even non-effective areas of CRPS. Mm -hmm. Could you have lesions on other parts of your body as of uh, this day, November 25th, 2016? Yes. yes. Okay. Then uh, let's uh, take a look with, I believe... Uh, one zero zero one dash two 
six four zero and four one to see whether they were documented. So that's was on the. Do you see anywhere where they are documenting any of your lesions on this? No. All right. Let's look at um, 2571-008 and see what that one says. Uh, that's not it. <laughs> that's, that's uh, not I think it it's, is it 2571-3013? Yes. All right. 2571-0013. All right. What's going on here, Maya? Well, first off, you could see the discoloration of my skin, which is a symptom of CRPS. And then you have some small lesions starting out, but they're getting bigger. All right, now and you we... can still see the dystonia. Sorry, I just wanted to point that out. All right, so let's then uh, compare that to the skin assessment for that day, if you've got it. Uh, I think it's 1001-2640, and uh, yeah, I think so. Yes. Is that it? There's a lot of paper. they know anywhere that you had this discoloration and lesions? No. All right, let's look at uh, 2571-026. Two, two, or did I just do that one? No, I did not do that one yet. Um, bring that up. And for the record, this is December 22nd, 2016. We could focus in on your forehead. Did you get them on your forehead too? Yes, I got them pretty much everywhere. So I have one on my forehead and then on my left knee I have one. Okay, and can we see the left knee then? Okay. All right. Now can we compare that to 1001-2637? See if they documented it. You see anywhere where they're documenting the fact that you're continuing to have lesions? No. All right, and then 2571-030. No, I'm, I'm sorry, is that, we just did that one, sorry. Uh, 2571-040. Is that the same lesion now getting worse? Yes. All right, and... Um, do we have the Do we have the skin re report for that day? No, the other 2571042. All right. So that's the 30th. Now. All right, that's on uh, December 30th. So what's happening with this lesion? Why isn't it healing? That's um, pretty standard for CRPS lesions. Normally when you have a cut, it goes away relatively quickly, but with CRPS, it takes a lot longer to heal. And then also on my hands, I have them again. All right, so now, and if we have it, there's a skin report, but I don't know if we have a skin report. One, zero, zero, one, four, five, six. One, zero, zero, one. Skinny jeans. Uh, when could you wear your skinny jeans? 
I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Honestly. I don't remember having skinny jeans in the hospital. I know all of the pictures. I'm wearing shorts, so. Okay. Uh, she also reported she now has RSD, CRPS, skin lesions in her hands and forehead. That says they're the usual lesions. What is the date of this? This is December 30th, 2016. We've been through now two months of lesions. Um, Top of the next page, I believe. She does not let me examine. Self-inflicted excoriations. Do you even know what a self-inflicted excoriation is, Maya? No, at the time I had no idea what that meant. Um, but again, the doctors were telling me I, it was all my fault. I was doing this to myself. Well, uh, did they ever ask you whether you were self-inflicting these lesions? They just told me. They never asked. And then when they told me and accused me of self-inflicting the lesions, I told them, no, it's just part of the CRPS. Okay. Um, are we on uh, 2116, page 001? So this whole time they were not documenting your, your lesions, other than to say that now you're scratching yourself? Correct. Okay, now um, here's a series of, uh, I believe, texts, messages back and forth, and if we could focus on anyone. Were they suspicious of your mom and dad at this time? Yes, so there was this whole ordeal with um, Kathy, assuming that I was emailing my mom. So my teacher, Jackie Dieter, she came over to the hospital and I was given a laptop for school purposes exclusively. And um, most people don't know this, but with the school email, so I only had a school email, which is like your end number, which is what you use to log in, and then it's whatever school um, county you're at dot net. So I could only send emails to people within the school district. That meant teachers and students. That is it. I could not receive any external emails. As a matter of fact, the whole system itself blocks external emails, and you cannot send external like emails to people outside of the system. Again, it blocks it. It will not let you. So there was this nurse who um, was in my room when I was on my computer trying to do homework and school, and she noticed that I was on the email portion of the platform. She immediately went, grabbed Kathy, told Kathy I was probably trying to contact my mom. Kathy came back into the room. She said that I can no longer have my computer because she was in fear that I was browsing sex websites. Did you know what a sex website was at 10 years old? I didn't even know what sex was. Apparently she was introducing this concept? Yes. So let's talk about your relationship with Kathy Beatty. Was she there <coughs> on just one floor so that if you switch from one floor to the next floor you got somebody new? So it's pretty like standard practice that whenever you move floors, there's like a social worker per floor. Um, but weirdly enough, Kathy Beatty literally followed me wherever I went. So from the time assigned to the end, she was there? Yes. And how would you describe her interest in you? Was it the normal interest of a nurse or social worker? Or was it something? What, if anything, was unusual about Kathy Beatty's approach to you? I, Overall. <clears throat> I have a lot of stories about Kathy Beatty, uh, so it's going to take some time to go through them all. But there is the whole chapel incident where a nurse wheeled me down to the first floor where the chapel is located. The nurse left when Kathy Beatty approached me. Kathy Beatty then kissed me, said, I'm not trying to be your mother, but I can be. Then she wheeled me into the chapel, and at this point, you know, I was so excited to finally be able to go to the chapel, 
and she just destroyed all of my excitement. She picks me up, puts me on her lap. She sits in this tan chair at the back of the chapel. Um, there's a photo of that. Um, and she just sat with me there, and then I told her I was done praying. I was very quick in there because I just wanted to go back to my room. Um, and then I was put back into my room. There's many instances, this numerous occasions, like, that she lifted me up and put me on her lap. She, like, clawed through my hair. Um, I was close enough to her, almost, like, at all times, to the point where I knew she had permanent eyeliner. That's not something, like, you know unless you're really close to a person. Um, she would tell me, like, weird details about her life. Um, yeah. Let's show 27, 2597-18. Uh, I believe this is a photo of the chapel. And were you ever curious as to why she had you in the chapel? So one really interesting thing about the chapel is there's no cameras. It's the only place. Were you uncomfortable with Kathy B's advances on you? Objection, Your Honor. Did these incidents with Kathy Beatty, were they upsetting to you? Yes. Did they cause you to fear her? Most certainly, and the whole photo incident truly solidified that. We'll get to that in a moment. And was Kathy Beatty the only one that was tormenting you, if you want to use that term, but during this period of time? No, there were other people as well. I mean, it was the doctors through their words of accusing my mom and I of certain things, or, well, for me, I guess, accusing me of not having my CRPS. And then there was one nurse in particular, Ashley Sumner, who I had encounters with in the PICU. So what happened, uh, tell us about the Megan Trainer incident and Nurse Ashley. Okay, so Nurse Ashley was not, she's independent from the Megan Trainer incident, Ashley Sumner, pick okay. you, and then the other, the Megan Trainer incident was on floor seven. Okay, well tell us what happened on floor seven. Floor seven. Okay, floor seven. So there was at one point where a nurse had come into my room and she informed me that she had looked me up and knew that I liked Megan Trainer. So I had a public Instagram at the time and I was only like 10. And so I like posted um, videos of me like singing and dancing to Megan Trainer, my favorite artist. So I was a little like, I don't know, it put me off that why would like a health professional look up their patient on the internet and proceed to look them up on social media. But I kind of dismissed it until later in the day, she not only came back with herself, but a number of people, I would say like probably six, seven nurses and rec workers, they all stood in a line. The one in the middle was um, next, like in front of my bed, and she was holding a phone camera. And the one next to her was playing a Megan Trainer song called like, I feel better when I'm dancing, one of the ones I posted on social media. They were trying to get me to dance and sing and move my extremities in ways that would hurt me. And when I did not move in the way that they wanted me to, or move as vigorously as they wanted me to, they stormed out of my room. Were they dancing, trying to dance around you? Yes, they were also trying to like get me to do certain movements, but I was in severe pain, so I was barely moving. I smiled a little bit, I did my best, but ultimately they never ended up showing the video to the court because it didn't fit their narrative. So they were, from your perspective, what, what were they trying to get you to do? I think they were just trying. I apologize for interrupting again just for the day. What's the legal basis? I'm objecting to this characterization foundation. Or she can answer. I believe the nurses were trying to make me to look like I was as healthy as possible, that I was living my best life in the hospital. I was listening to Megan Trainer. I was dancing. I was smiling with all the nurses. But that wasn't the case at all. So it was my mistake. I, I didn't realize Nurse Ashley was involved in this. Was there an incident with Nurse Ashley where you were where you were hurt? 
Yeah, so this is, we have to jump back to the beginning. Um, so this is like October. Once my dad and mom were told to leave, I was obviously left alone. And there's one nurse in particular who I had the most interactions with, and that was Ashley Sumner. There was a point where they were moving me up to floor seven, so that called for a bed change. They regularly have to change the sheets and whatnot, it's like policy. But even though I had told her I cannot walk, I cannot stand, I cannot roll, she threatened me. She said, if you don't move right now, like, uh, what did she say? If Or else, that's what she said, or else. If you don't move right now, or else. I remember the or else. And I just started crying because I'm so scared. Like, my parents aren't here. I have nobody that I trust. And this random lady is threatening me. And I can't even perform the movements that she wants me to. So she yelled at me for quite some time, telling me to roll over. I know you can move. I know you're faking it. Just stand up. We all know. Um, eventually, she gave up because I could not do what she wanted me to do. She went out in the hallway, grabbed about three, four nurses. They lifted me up by the sheet of the bed itself to transfer me and she dropped my arm really hard in the bed. Now that's insignificant to most people but to a person with CRPS it's like falling on concrete. Like it hurt so bad. I I remember the feeling just in my body. It was so painful and I just cried. She was just awful and um, I, I don't know. I, I'll never forget her. All right. Um. Getting back to Miss Beatty, then, um, do you like chocolate cake? I do, and I <laughs> ordered that almost chocolate. every night at the hospital. All right. Did Kathy Beatty know that you liked chocolate cake? Yes. Yep. Was she there an aware. incident where that was held out as a prize or something? Yeah. So in PT, as my say went on, they wanted me to improve, but because of their system of doing it, it hurt my CRPS, so I wasn't making the improvements that were typical of other patients that are non-CRPSers. So she thought that bribing me would maybe spark some more motivation for me to start doing different things. On one instance, she said that she would bake me a chocolate cake if I did well in PT. So I tried my best and I overexerted myself um, because the thought of just having something that was non-hospital food for the first time was enough motivation for me to, you know, risk putting myself in more pain. So after the therapy session, I asked her if I could have it and she said no because it's Lent. Now, I have to explain this as well. So I'm Catholic, and Lent is a standard practice before Easter. You give up something for 40 days. And, you know, I'm a kid, so I don't really understand the time of when it was supposed to happen. I just knew that Lent was a thing associated with the Catholic religion, and I've done it before. I was in the hospital October, November, December, early January. That's not around Easter. She knew that I was Catholic and that I was so religious that she held the idea of Lent over my head and saying that I couldn't have the chocolate because I gave up chocolate for Lent. So what about talking to your mom and dad through this period? Now, was this uh, a frequent thing or a infrequent thing? Your Honor, I apologize for Be better on the time, but otherwise it will. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I got it. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, so, let's talk about the graduation of. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but there's another story about Kathy and the PT. Another bribe, if I could share. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. What happened with? I have to answer the question. Okay. <laughs> What else happened with Ms. Beatty insofar as tempting you to do something? Again, it was another religious motivation. Um, she told me again, if I try really hard in PT, she will take me to the chapel. Not the chapel in the hospital, but the chapel outside of the hospital, a couple blocks down. So again, I tried my best. And after the PT session, I asked her, when can we go to the church? 
And she said, I didn't do well enough. All right. I want to talk about in October, how often you were able to talk to your mom or dad. I, well, the visits with my dad and my brother, they varied. There was times where I was allowed to have visits with them um, and then other times not. And then with my mom, I was allowed phone calls at certain points and then again not. It was so on and off, I really have no idea of when it was permitted and when it wasn't. And when you did have the opportunity to speak with your mom, were there any problems with those calls that made it difficult for you to communicate? Or your mom to communicate? There was always a problem. Like what? Well, um, it was always the person who was overseeing the calls, uh, mm -hmm. Kathy Beatty, again. Um, she <coughs> would sit on the edge of my bed, listen in on all the phone calls, and she would limit our conversation to very basic and insignificant things. So I'm going to publish then three clips in evidence for the record, they're 2608 A, B, and C. And you've heard these previously? Yes. Are these, is this, best of your knowledge and understanding, Kathy Beatty's voice that we'll hear coming in? Yes. If we play A, please. <clears throat> Hi, Mommy. Hi, honey. How are you, sweetie pie? I'm hurting. I miss you. I miss you so much, too. I miss you so much every day. Every you know single how, day. You know how happy it makes me feel to hear your voice. Same here. I miss you so much, and I am so happy that I'm finally able to hear your voice, too. Yeah. Yeah. I will how you. What did you say, sweetie? I hope I can see you soon. I, w I would love to see you soon. I would love to see you soon. We just have to wait for the judge to make the decision, okay? okay. As soon as he makes the decision, then I'll be able to see you. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. We're not allowed to talk about the case, okay? Maya, honey, just we're going to talk about uh, what you've been doing, if you need any Shopkins or things like that, if you had nice visits with your daddy, but we can't discuss the case, okay, honey? Was Beatty the only one that would know about those Shopkins? Yes. All right. Because she is actually the one who delivered some of them to me. Uh. When these were going on, what was Kathy Beatty's facial gestures? So you can't obviously see it on the audio recording, but I, when I tell you, like every single time I had a conversation with my mom, she'd be rolling her eyes like that, or she'd be making faces or sticking out her tongue. Like she was acting like a toddler. Let's play uh, B, 2608B. Um, how, how about, how are you doing? How is PT and OT going for you? Uh, not good. Why um, is okay, Bianca, we can't discuss any of those type of matters, okay? Okay. All right, and then uh, 2608C. And what do you usually need help with? My pants. What happens with the pants? I just can't lift them up. You can't pull up the pants anymore? No. <laughs> but when did that start, Maya? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a while ago. I don't know. Yeah. I don't really remember when I started. Okay. PBH. What's PBH? Um, yeah, I'm trying to read my that line of conversation now, thank you. Okay. Now, 
During this period of time, um, are you, or are you aware now that your parents, strike it, are you aware now that through this entire period of time, your parents retained the right to be able to be involved in uh, direct your medical care? Yes. So we're trying to, what, discuss your physical therapy here? I was trying to tell her about it because she asked, but Kathy Beatty put a stop to that. I know. Um, so tell us about the pulling up the pants. And it was good humming. I like the humming <laughs> part. But why is it important that at this point you could no longer pull up your pants? So it's showing how my condition, the longer I stay in, the more of the things I was able to do, I'm losing in terms of, like, me, my independence. Okay. okay. And, again, were you allowed to use any words of Polish in these conversations? No, that's why I wasn't. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to ask you now, um, did your mom and dad still try to get stuff for you during this period of time? You know, gifts, little things, cheer yes. you up? Yes, yeah. Did there come a time that they bought you a dress you always wanted, a, a more formal dress? Yes, so this was pre-John um, Hopkins All Children's Hospital. We were at the Ellington like outlet malls, and we went into Tommy Hilfiger, and there was this really nice dress that I was obsessed with. It's just like white, um, the shoulder, like the, it wasn't like long sleeve, it was just like the width of a dollar bill. And then around it was the navy trim, and then the signature logo was on the breast area. Uh, and so were there attempts made to bring this dress to you while you were at the hospital? Yes. So my dad was permitted visitation, but everything that he, well, to my knowledge, like most of the things he had to, he gave to me, they had to go through a certain people. And the dress that he had brought, it had to be given to Kathy Beatty before it reached me. Did the dress ever reach you? No. And I clarified with my dad because I thought, you know, maybe he didn't know what dress I was talking about. But he was there when I bought it. And I described it to him. He knew exactly what I was talking about. Instead, um, I got a red dress. But to this day, that dress is probably rotting in Kathy Beatty's office. Where? Uh, where? Did it turn out that dress that was not delivered to you, the Hilfinger dress, actually was? Kathy Beatty had it. But, now, um, oh, and I know that because another social worker said she saw it in Kathy Beatty's office. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And so now I want to talk a bit about the day you were supposed to go to a court here, you know, January 6th. Okay. Um, so... On that day, were you excited? I was ecstatic. I mean, not only was I getting out of the hospital for a little bit of time, I was going to see my uncle, and the goal was to see the judge. All right. And were you preparing for it, to get yourself ready? And Yeah, I told people in um, the hospital, the people, like the nurses and whatnot, I said, oh, I'm going to court today, you know. Um, I was excited, yeah. And so... Um, then what happened insofar as trying, uh, what did you have to do before you were allowed to go to the court and see the judge? What happened with Ms. Beatty? So it was my understanding that I was just allowed to go to court because they ruled on it and I was allowed to come in person. So I was just expecting my uncle was going to come pick me up, and Kathy Beatty was going to wheel me down to meet with my uncle and put me in his car. Instead, Kathy Beatty showed up in my room a little bit earlier than the time I was supposed to go. She came in alone initially, and she told me that if I wanted to go and see my mom in court, I was going to have to be stripped naked and photographed by her nude, um, so I could go to court. I cried and cried because I'm a very modest and private person when it comes to stuff like that. I've, I have been, and there's a reason for that. 
I really respect my privacy. And eventually I was able to reason with Kathy and she said that I could keep my training bra on and my shorts. That's when she left the room. She came back with um, nurse Alicia. I don't know her last name, but she came in and she assisted with holding me down and moving me and removing um, some articles of my clothing for the photos. Now, the purpose for these photos, typically, um, DCF takes them. DCF did not take these. And they're supposed to be a side-by-side -side comparison of pre-visit and post-visit. So I was leaving the hospital, so they took the photos before. There was never photos taken after. And uh, has it come to your attention that this was never, this did not end up in any analysis in the medical records or anything like that. That's another thing I was promised in the whole um, reasoning with Kathy about not being nude. She told me that I could keep my shorts on in the training bra, and I specifically asked her to keep these photos private. I asked her if they were just going to be in the medical record, and she told me, yes, only doctors can see them. She actually physically went over to the computer where um, I've seen nurses and doctors put in information, and turns out she never put the photos in there. All right, so let's uh, turn to, first I'm going to publish a photo, uh, 2604. And were you actively trying to keep them from taking off your clothes? No, that's not it. There. Yes, so that, you see my hands right there, and then nurse, uh, um, well, someone else's hand, I can't tell if that's Kathy's or the nurse's, but I was trying to pull up my shirt actively as she was pulling it down. All right, and around this time, where we go into a few more photos, um, did you document this in your My Care journal? I believe I did. I haven't seen the MyCare journal in quite some time, so I would need my memory refreshed. Let's look at this photo here. Now, it has been portrayed that uh, you were uh, somehow enjoying this and just holding hands. Tell the jury what was going on. I was not enjoying this at all. It is true, when the nurse came back into the room, I wasn't crying as much because Kathy had called me down after we made that, you know, agreement we met in the middle. Um, but you can see my cheeks are red, and that happens a lot when I've been crying. Okay, and we can see a little corner of your mouth there. Are you uh, smiling, grimacing, or what? I am most definitely not smiling. And is that a training bra? It is. Now, was there a time that you had to uh, switch out of one bra to another? Yes. So they're trying to maintain the position that, oh, I was in a training bra and shorts. Like, we didn't, you know, see anything. No, Kathy watched as I got naked because I was changing into clothes for court. That's why there's two different outfits. But this was the same time period. There was no one before and after po photos. All right. Uh, let's look at 2604.15. There you are, blue shorts. Now tell us about the shorts. Did you remain in the same outfit during this, uh, this ordeal? No, because I was changing into court clothes. Okay. So which are these, the blue shorts there? That's... Um, I don't know which outfit I ended up wearing to court, but... Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and then let's look at uh, two, three... Oh, no, we're going through these. Let's go through these. And now, now what is that? What kind of bra is that? That's a training bra again. Which came first, the training bra or the... the um... Oh, those are both training bras? Both are training bras, correct. They switched them out. So this wasn't a workout bra or anything? I don't no, know that most much about No, 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 no. Bras. Um, and did you tell them while they were, were they holding you down through much of this? Yes, and some of the photos you could see their hand, but it looks like the photos are mostly zoomed in, so you can't see their hand placement. Did you want to leave and get out of there? Yes. And were they preventing you from getting out of there? They were until the photos were completed. And did you have any control or ability to get out of there? No, Physically? because I couldn't walk 
or stand. And this was against your will? Correct. All right, let's look at the at two, three, six, four, unless there's more of these we want to go through. Let's see. You down? That's it. So. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I wasn't going to cover it, but we will. So let's, uh, what was your relationship with Alicia, the nurse that was in there before this? So I had seen her before and I recognized her. And I mean, my first encounter with her, I trusted her. I had no reason to doubt her as, you know, a healthcare professional. Um, actually here in the My Care Journal, I wrote her name. And the second time I saw her, she was assisting Kathy Beauty in photographing me. Um, and changing me in front of Kathy Beatty. Let's look at 2364009. Is. is this it? This is oh, so she's right there. All right. And so how did you react when you saw that Alicia was now one of the people holding you down? It was a, another complete breach of my trust. Did you feel betrayed? Absolutely. I felt betrayed in the hospital almost every day. Um, now, I want to talk for a moment. Um, I think we've gone over the necklace that you still wear. How did you uh, learn about your mom's suicide? And tell us the first time you felt that this may have happened. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting story. So. Um, on the 7th, I'll never forget, January 7th, I couldn't sleep. Again, it, it was a combination of just pain um, and, you know, my depression from being isolated from my family. So I was up until 2 in the morning. And I swear to God, I am not making this up, at 2 in the morning, I broke out in tears. I was just crying uncontrollably and I called the nurse in and I told her this was a nurse that I actually had a pretty good relationship with and I told her I miss my mom I miss my mom um, I love my mom I want to go home to my mom mm -hmm. turns out she ended her life was that around that time that yeah did? okay that's why I always say that it was really January 8th that she died, not the seventh, because I just it. have this feeling that it was then. You felt it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, how did they go about telling you that your mom was gone? So, I had a visit with my Aunt Wendy, I want to say maybe the day after or so. Uh -huh. um, so, this was the eighth now. And something was off with her. And I asked her what's wrong, and she said, I don't know, just something happened earlier today, sorry. So she didn't end up telling me then. I just enjoyed the rest of my visit with her as usual, and I'm not sure if it was that evening that my dad came in with my brother and Father Jack, but I know it was sometime close to January 8th. And I was sat down on the couch. My dad was direct, well, I think I was in the, maybe I wasn't in the wheelchair, maybe I was on the couch. My dad may have lifted me and put me on the couch, so I'm not sure about that specific detail. But my dad was right next to me, and right next to my dad was Kyle. In front of me was Father Jack. My dad said he had some bad news. And weirdly enough, the first thing I thought of was, they're not gonna let me home or um, that I was going to be put in foster care. And it turned out to be even worse than that. Uh, my mom had died. So I was told that and immediately after my dad had to leave. Okay. How long was your, were your, was your family allowed in there to tell you that your mom had passed? It wasn't a lot of time. If I'm being completely honest, it was actually 
so unbelievably cruel the amount of time they allocated for me to spend with my family after hearing such awful news. So after this now, uh, if your mom was supposed to be the reason why here with this Munchausen thing, and your mom's gone, did they let you go? Objection.
during the sustained objection and the direction she disregard the last question. Let me give you uh, an instruction at this time. At the time of Beata Kowalski's death, Maya Kowalski was still under the jurisdiction of the dependency court, and a court order remained in effect continuing Maya Kowalski's stay at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital could not release Maya Kowalski without a court order. You may continue. To the best of your knowledge, after this, did Johns Hopkins continue to maintain a diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy? Objection to foundation. Overruled. Yes. And are you aware of how they responded to your mother's suicide internally? I am. Um, I actually had one-on-one -on -one interactions with the nurses. So most of the nurses, when I told them, they would say, oh, sorry, and just kind of continue on. And here I am just like crying, no consoling me whatsoever. However, there was one nurse who did, she was extremely kind and compassionate about the whole situation. As a matter of fact, she started crying as well. So let's uh, publish again 2175-004. I'll ask you whether anyone here at the hospital did. Did either of these doctors ever tell you that they thought it was the right thing for you to lose your mother? Object to the statement on the Overall. They never directly one-on-one -on -one told me, but the fact that they kept me in the hospital and they regularly told me that, you know, my mom was forcing this on me, they felt that their whole narrative that they were maintaining, they felt that it was better that I was without my mom. And there on the bottom, uh, did they believe that now life was going to be better for you without your mom in it? Objection and speculation. Overall. It's sickening, but yes. And my, uh, well, we'll get into it in a moment. All right, let's show 1002-001, publish that. Uh, it's, in, it's in evidence, Your Honor. If it's in evidence, you may. All right, I'll ask you now, uh, I asked you a question before about Munchausen by proxy. If you will look down there at the bottom under the admission diagnosis and then the discharge diagnosis, what is it? It's fictitious disorder, still Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and conversion disorder. All right, now, how long was it before you were able to go home? I was released on January 13th, and that's why it's 13 is my lucky number. Okay, so about, what, six days after your mom? Correct. All right, let's show 2528-002 uh, and ask you how things were when you came home. I don't think that's... <laughs> I think it's two five two eight two and three. Mm, that is definitely not, and neither is that. I know, and they're not the right ones. This is the. Uh, Two five eight zero eight two eight two. So it's super backwards. All right. So it's two five eight two zero zero two two five eight two zero zero three. Uh, tell the jury what's happening here. So this is at the very entrance of my subdivision. I am in one of my well. So 
one of my dad's friends, but he also went to the same church as us. He helped pick up our stuff and take all our belongings out of the hospital, so I'm in his car. And it's basically the entire neighborhood with balloons um, welcoming me back home after three months. Okay. And then let's three and a half months. And then let's look at uh, 2582003. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, so this is another sign that um, was part of the homecoming party. Now, in the car coming home, were you able to hold yourself up? No. Can you describe for the jury your condition? Well, physically? I was not doing well. I had lesions, discolorations, temperature changes. Now I physically wasn't able to sit up by myself. Um, as I explained earlier, we had to basically start all over from the beginning. I couldn't even open up a bottle cap. I had to have help using the restroom. That included, um, even later on when I went to friends' houses, I had to have their parents help me, which is extremely humiliating, but it's how my condition was. Um, I could no longer stand up like I did on the walker, like I did uh, previous to entering John Hopkins. And uh, my pain, obviously, was a lot worse. So, now, what did you decide to do in <coughs> strike it? What was it like, uh, although we'll get into damages another time, but what was it like coming home to the house after this? It was very emotional. Um, you know, I remember being wheeled in and having to be pushed to my room because I couldn't wheel myself anymore. I remember... You know how like every house is like a smell? Like when you go into somebody else's house it smells. It was just like so soothing to like have that familiar like air around me I guess. Um, I remember my room it was very different than how I have left it. There was gifts that my dad had to take home from the hospital that I wasn't permitted to have in there. There was um, two notes my mom had written me. Um, that never made it to you? No. And how was it without your mom being there? I mean, as much as I was happy to be home, I try not to complain, but obviously it wasn't as perfect as I wanted it to be. I wanted her there. So now you had a decision to make on your recovery. Um, what did you decide to do? I decided to push forward. And tell the jury how you did it, what you did. I didn't consider my circumstances. I considered my God. I didn't consider what I didn't have. I considered the resources and tools I had. I had to shift my entire mindset. It was so hard, but I did it. And you did it without the use of any ketamine or any other meds? I did. And why not? Why? What was your worry if you did? I was scared that I was going to end up in the same situation I just got out of. And so in terms of going to see doctors and so forth during this period to help you, um, what was your feeling about that? I didn't want to ever see a medical professional again. Not even my primary care physician that I've seen forever. Um, he's such a lovely guy, and here I didn't ever want to set foot into his office. I didn't want to ever go to a doctor. How about Agility Fitness? How did they fit into this? So Agility Fitness, um, it's like a physical therapy center, and the I don't know if he's like the manager or if he owned the place. I don't really know what his title was, but... He went to our church, um, so I trusted him, and he has a really nice family. I've met them all, and that's when I um, I worked with Rachel Young. I previously had some interactions with her, and I really liked her, mm -hmm. so I worked with her um, very frequently. And so how long then this time did it take you, sorry, how long did it take you to be able to start to transition from wheelchair to crutches? So it was 
sixth grade when, um, so this was the fall, I would say August, um, middle August, I was able to get up on crutches and I struggled very much so throughout the school day. I was quite miserable, but I got stronger and stronger every single day. I mean, I truly believe my mom up in heaven really helped with facilitating um, my recovery, but it was not pain-free. It most certainly was not. It was very hard. Was it much, was it significantly harder than when you had the ketamine and the other meds to help you? Oh, yes, yes. Mr. Anderson, within the next five minutes, let's find a breaking point. Yes, within sir. Within five minutes. Yes, sir. And then, uh, I just have two questions. And then, how long did it take you until you were able to start getting off crutches, either to one crutch or completely off of them? It took um, about another year. Yeah. So almost what, a year and three quarters, two years? It was a little bit more than a year, but yeah, I did it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, again, this would not. This would get within five minutes. So just you, you yes, lead sir. us within five minutes. All right. So uh, now, after you had gotten out of the wheelchair and off crutches, did you have a relapse then within a year or so? I did. And when was that? Uh, the record reflects that. It's it was 2020. November of 2020. Yeah, I know it's 2020. I just forget what month. All right. So tell the jury about how this came about. What was it that was triggering you or starting it? Did you injure yourself? Or what? I um, didn't have a physical injury for this relapse. However, I was having um, lots of depots during this time and the stress from litigation really impacted me. No, we won't talk about that part of it. But, but yeah. It, all right. So were, you, were you still having a great deal of pain at this point? Yes. And did you have a stomach issue? That came Again, up? yes, I did. And was this um, the same type of pain that we talked about before with the gut muscles? Yes. In a similar way, yeah. So explain what happened with this. So I had the burning pain again. Um, I was stressed out, so I wasn't eating so much, but the CRPS pain, once I had that relapse, it just amplified the entire situation. Um, it hurt to eat, and I was falling apart. Let's publish 2580-001. And did you dye your hair there, or what's that? No, that's my natural color, actually. It's just the lighting in the room. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, was this during COVID with the mask, or was it just you were in the hospital? It might have been COVID. I can't remember when COVID was. All right. And so um, then let's publish 2580-002. I apologize, Mr. Anderson. Can you tell me what the date of was of the last order? Sure. Uh, this would have been, I don't know that's on there. It would have been in November uh, 2020. Yeah, they all said something. November 2020 or 2022? 2020. 2020. Yeah. All right, so is this you? Yes. What's wrong with this picture? But, um, had you lost weight? Yes, a significant amount. Is that your collarbone there? Yes. How much weight did you lose? I don't know the number, but it was a substantial amount. Okay. And did you have to have something done to eventually stop this wasting away? Yeah, so there was a feeding tube place, and I got sedation for that one. Um, I asked for it, and they had no questions about that. 
Um, and then my dad helped at home with the feeding treatment. And I only stayed in the hospital for seven days. I don't know if that's like, but I know it was like a week or less. Um, and they were very understanding of my situation and um, took care of me. Let's uh, look at 2580-002. That's you again. And your legs are very thin there? Yes. Now, previous to this, uh, had you had a, a port uh, in for infusions? I did, yes. And who put that port in? John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Where on your body was the port? The port was on my right... It, like under my armpit, in a kind of. Um, I didn't want it on my chest, um, so it was placed under my armpit. Was it for the purpose of ketamine infusions? Yes, actually, we told the doctors at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital that the purpose of this was for ketamine infusions at Dr. Hannah's office, and they were agreeable to that. So they performed an operation to help your ketamine infusions? They did. Did anyone question whether your mother was committing Munchausen by proxy by getting a port for her? Object objection, speculation. In the world. No, they did not question it. Well, did they question whether you had CRPS before they put a port in? They accepted the diagnosis. And how did those doctors treat you? Uh, the, those doctors that I encountered at John Hopkins they um, didn't question my diagnosis, and they were ready to put the port in because they knew it was necessary for my infusions. Okay. All right. So, again, you are inpatient here. Um, why? Mr. Anderson, we really need to take a break. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we just take a break here? Yeah. You said to keep going. I got going. I'll give you five minutes. <laughs> Members of the jury, uh, we're going to take an afternoon break. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Let's try to keep it to 15 minutes. All right. Do you want to Okay, everyone, please be seated. Are there any issues we need to address before we take our break? Timing-wise, Judge, I would only point out that we do want to reserve some time today, if we can, for a proffer on the uh, issues ruled out. I don't know if we'll get to it, but... Well, I don't know, but your tomorrow is looking very ambitious. Uh, just, I doubt Ms. Kowalski is going to be finished today. We'll do our best. Anything else? Out from the defense room. Anything further on your motion that occurred here at the sidebar? Uh, yes. Uh, we, we, again, would like to renew our motion for mistrial. This is the fourth time that the plaintiff has suggested to this jury that All Children's was responsible for the separation and the continued separation of Maya Kowalski. Uh, again, this court made very clear to plaintiff's counsel prior to the trial that we were not going to be relitigating Chapter 39 issues. All Children's Hospital has immunity for that. While we appreciate the court's curative instruction, we believe that a mistrial is not only appropriate for the intentional uh, question of that to Ms. Kowalski while she's on the witness stand, but the cumulative nature of this now being, by my count, the fourth time that the plaintiff has suggested to this jury that, um, that All Children's was responsible for both the separation and the continued separation of my Kowalski. Yes. Right, and, and we, are, we do have concern based on counsel's comments at the sidebar that this is going to be a continued theme, specifically to his representation to the court that he believes that all children has responsibility for Maya's continued hospitalization after his mother's death. Her mother's death. Leaving the last part aside, because that will likely be part of a, of a rebuttal. The purpose of the question, as established at the next question, was to point out that instead of changing the diagnosis, 
they kept the diagnosis, and thus Maya had to continue to stay at the hospital even after learning that the cause, the reason why she was there was because of a Munchausen by proxy diagnosis. There was no other reason to leave her there, and yet they continued to maintain the diagnosis, and I corrected that. And the court gave a curative instruction to the extent that there was harm. I, I again point out, as I did up here, that there was a court order, and you knew there was a court order. Yet you asked the question again. So you've got to stop that, or there will be a mistrial, and there will be sanctions. I understand, Judge. Okay. Now, I do, in this particular case, believe that the curative instruction is sufficient to disabuse the jury of any implication that the, the beginning of that question had. But I, 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 I just need to be very clear, Mr. Anderson, that that needle's starting to shift. It's not there yet, but please don't put me in the position of starting this whole thing over, because I will. I understand, Judge. It is a bit of a minefield out there, but I will. Well, well this, one, this, this one is very clear. There is a court order. It, it's, it's, it's not even up to debate. Florida law provides immunity for anything having to do with that, and, and that's been the subject of many court orders, many discussions for the last several years. Please don't test me on it. I will not. Thank you. We'll be in recess. Let's try to take it 10 minutes. All rise. Let's go into recess.
Everyone, please be seated. I guess we get to go home now. Judge, the only one I wanted to bring about, sorry, um, was I'd like a, a brief opportunity to discuss again, ask the court to reconsider the a friend, Jessica, the one that you saw in the picture. And the reason is that the fact of what happened to Jessica, known yeah. to, uh, to uh, Maya and to Viata is important for the notice and the emotional effect of knowing that CRPS effectively killed somebody close to them. And so that's the reason for the connection of bringing it in. It's All I ruled on is the photo, and the photo staying out. So We have one photo in. The photo that I ruled out today is the photo that you're asking reconsideration on, and I said no. Uh, no, not, not so much that, but just the being able to ask questions about what happened to her friend. Again, I only ruled on the photo. Good point. Uh, well, Judge, be, oh, sorry. Sorry. If you don't. No, go right ahead. <laughs> the problem with this line of questioning is, I, I'm almost hesitant to say it with a crowded courtroom because we have some information on Jessica's health information that we would require a cross-examination of when she died, how she died, whether it was related to procedures in Mexico. And I don't, I don't know that anyone here has the authority to be violating another patient's health rights. It would be an entirely collateral matter, Your Honor. That is fine. That goes to the extent of her knowledge, if she knows all of that stuff, but I don't think she does. I think she just knows a friend of hers died of CRPS. Okay. Yes. I mean, what do you want me to say? I mean, the photo is not coming in, and I haven't ruled on anything else. I understand. That's why I'm here. We're gonna have to wait and see what, what the questions are. I understand. I I guess before the jury comes in, if we open the door to this, we're going to be discussing what we understand to be her care and the cause of death, which. Mr. Anderson can invite that up, I guess, if he wants. <coughs> I'm trying to give you the generalized assessment. Well, 
Anything else we need to address before we bring the jury back? No, 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 no. Let's bring in the jury. Not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? And you did not see any media accounts. Is that correct? And no one approached you. Is that correct? Okay, Ms. Mayakowski. Just to remind you, you're still under oath, okay? Thank you. Mr. Anderson. May I please the court? Yes. Now, Maya, uh, there have been, strike it. Are you continuing to have relapses here and there? Yes. Can you tell the jury how and why they come about, if you know, and the length of them? Right, so whether it's from a physical injury or if it's just intense stress or like mental, um, you know, just like problems with um, stress or anxiety, um, it can impact the severity of my relapses. And are you experiencing uh, stresses in terms of going past hospitals, doing, uh, seeing people that look like people involved in this and so forth? Yes. And have you, uh, since the time of being in Johns Hopkins or while you were there, uh, become familiar with the fact that CRPS can be fatal? Yes. Does this have any effect on you? It worries me because I am scared to seek the resources that once had helped me in fear of going back to a situation similar to that of John Hopkins. And um, I've met people who have passed away from CRPS. And my, have you tried different activities that you did before all of this happened, before you went into the Johns Hopkins Hospital this time? Yeah, so there was one instance when I went with my best friend and her brother and also my brother. We went to Ellington, um, the ice rink, and we just skated around. That was when I was um, walking, and this was in middle school. But it wasn't until high school that I started to take lessons. I just wanted to try it out, and it's something my mom and I had done together. So I wanted to revisit it. It became too... Hard. Um, my pain increased, I was falling, and I just didn't want to risk a relapse, so I quit. Okay. And you miss your mom. Yeah, it's hard. We'll talk about that a little later. Your witness. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mike. Hello. Um, before we get started, I want to tell you that I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just kind of walk you through a few timeline events. You might be able to help us with these. Um, so from the time period from, well, let me ask you first about um, when you first went to All Children's Hospital after you had the event on July 3rd. Mm -hmm. Do you remember whether you were walking or in a wheelchair then? I would, on July 3rd, so this is like the first time I went in for asthma? Yeah, so um, it looks like you went to All Children's the first time on July 6th, 2015. Okay. 
First, you had your incident at home on July 3rd, and then you went to Sarasota Memorial Hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And then they took you to All Children's for the pediatric work on July 6th. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember whether you were walking or in a wheelchair? I believe I was walking at the time. Okay. Well, let me ask you, um, Clay, if you can put up Joint Exhibit 1007-26. And at the top where it says triage arrival, and it says mobility wheelchair, does this refresh your recollection as to whether you would have been in a wheelchair at that time? I know they pushed me in in a wheelchair. I had weakness of muscles, but at this point in time, it wasn't like I was confined to a wheelchair at home as well. I Sorry, I misunderstood your question. Okay. From And Clay, you can take that down just sort of fast forwarding this a little bit. From that time around July 6, 2015 until October 7, 2016, you were in a wheelchair over that period of time. Is that fair? I was. Okay. And um, just for comparison's sake, I know, we'll, and we'll talk later about your bravery and your perseverance to get on crutches, but you weren't even using crutches during that time period, were you? No, but I was working my way up to that point. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes it's easier for me to sort of separate this by school year. Uh, for you, fourth grade would have been August 2015 until uh, May 2016, age nine. Is that about right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And you were out of school for that year, correct? I believe, yes, I was out in fourth grade, yes. Okay, and then also all of fifth grade from August 2016 until May 2017, you were out of school as well, is that right? Yes. Okay, let me ask you, we, we got to see some photos of, of you. Um, uh, let me ask you about, and Clay, do you have access to Join Exhibit 2530-41. I'm sorry to interrupt. Maya informed me she's a bit hungry. I would just like to have, let me get this what? chocolate milk. It's fine. And Maya, would you like to take a break while you have a bite to eat? Um, if it doesn't bother anybody, I could just drink this here, but. Okay. It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> but let me know if you need a break, okay? Um. This picture is dated May 21st, 2016? Yes. Okay. And, and I think your testimony, you were feeling pretty good at that time? Correct. Okay. I was getting the ketamine infusions, which lowered my pain. Therefore, I was feeling pretty good. Okay. Um, Clay, if you can pull up joint exhibit 1052-16. This, I'll just to represent to you, this is the first note from Dr. Spiegel. He's the one who did the hyperbaric treatment with you. Okay. And this um, note was dictated uh, four days earlier on May 17th, 2016. And it, and it notes that your exam had to be cut short due to your inability to be examined. Um, is It appears there was a lot of change in your condition back and forth depending on the day. Is that fair? Yeah, that's the nature of CRPS, and a lot of CRPS patients would report the same. Okay. So the photo that counsel showed to the jury, uh, you feeling good one day, four days earlier, you were in so much pain that the exam had to be cut short. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. And um, let me ask you about another one, and I, and I remember that, Council showed you uh, that by the end of July, I think it was July 28th, there was a video of you dancing to Megan Trainer. I think? Yes. Okay. Let's take a look at Joint Exhibit 1028-0020. That's in evidence. That's one of the therapy notes. And at the top, it says Daily Note, July 27th, 2018. <clears throat> And this was uh, the therapist that you were working with. Um, do you see under the current complaints, 
I guess my question to you, Maya, is this accurate? That the day before you had reported constant whole body pain, greatest in upper extremity and lower extremity? Is this um, note the day before of the yeah. video? Yes, the day before. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, when I went to Dr. Hannah's, normally I had an infusion and therapy, um, and the infusions did help a lot, okay. my pain. So, and just so I understand your answer, the day before you were reporting constant pain, whole body pain, greatest in upper extremities and lower extremities, a combination of burning, aching, intermittent stabbing pain, generally exacerbated with movement activities, um, but the next day you were able to perform the activities that we saw in the video. Well, again, when I was administered those ketamine infusions, I did feel better after and was able to perform different movements that I wouldn't be able to without the medication. Okay. So um, I think that you saw... Yeah. Do, do, you, do you know if you had ketamine infusions between July 27th and July 28th? I'm not exactly certain on what days, but again, CRPS is very different on different days, and it's very hard to believe, and I understand that, but that's just how CRPS is. Okay. So uh, the jury heard a couple times, and you've been brave enough to share with us, the discussion about the relapse after you were told that you had to go back to school sometime in August. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Um, in the weeks leading up to going to All Children's, you would agree with me that you were in some of the worst pain of your life. Is that fair? I was in a lot of pain, but it wasn't comparable to what the pain I was experiencing prior to the um, prolonged ketamine sedation in Mexico. So yes, I had relapses, and yes, they were very intense and scary still, but it wasn't as bad as um, how it was before the Mexico trip. So is your recollection that in the week or so leading up to all children's and the end of September, early October, that your pain was getting better? No, I still had pain. I did have the relapse, but that doesn't mean ketamine doesn't work. It's just the disease itself. Let me, let me show you um, Joint Exhibit 1040-249. This is from September 29th, 2016. And if you can expand this a little bit, Clay, down on the handwriting. Um, I guess my first question to you, Maya, is is that your handwriting or is that your mom's? That's not my handwriting. Okay. Do, do you know if that's your mother's handwriting? It looks like my mom's. Okay. If you remember... Is what your mother wrote here accurate, meaning another bad night, difficulty sleeping due to pain, 8 out of 10? Yeah, that um, would correspond with my relapse at the end of September. And that um, you had anxiety and depression, crying and demanding ketamine. Is that accurate with what you remember? I wanted ketamine because that's what had worked for me in the past. It wasn't like, oh, I need ketamine, right this instant, give it to me. It's more so, I know that works, so I would like to have it. At the end of the note, it says um, ketamine was given every three hours. Do you know, does that refer to your mom giving you ketamine at home? My mom did not give me ketamine at home. It was only oral ketamine that was administered at home. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that. I the, the ketamine here, your mom would have given you oral ketamine at home, right? I don't remember if she did or not, but looking at the note. Okay. Um, let me ask you about Joint Exhibit 1040-233. And I think the jury's seen this before, but is this an accurate reflection of what the condition you're in before you went to all children's? Quality of life, non-functional. With the relapse, yes, I was staying in bed a lot, and I did feel hopeless because I was getting a lot better at the relapse, and I really thought I would be able to walk soon, and the relapse happened. I'm sure it was frustrating. Let me ask you about 1040-234. Um, 
And again, this is from a little less than 48 hours before you came to All Children's on October 7th. Uh, is this your writing where it says, No sleep, pain 24-7, hell on earth? No, that's not my handwriting. Okay. Um, the check boxes, are those filled in by you or your mom? Do you know? Um, I think my mom probably would have filled it out, but she asked me. Okay. So th this would be accurate information based on what you had given your mother on October 5th, fair? Correct. Okay. Um, so let me ask you a little bit about some of your time at All Children's, and I'm sure it was uh, tough at times, but let me ask you about some things that you wrote in your journal, which is Trial Exhibit 2364, uh, 005. <clears throat> you, you had a nurse named Amanda. You wrote a heart behind your name. Do you remember what it was that you liked about Amanda? Yeah, I put a heart in front of her name. Um, Amanda was pretty sweet to me. I'm not saying that all the people at John Hopkins are bad, because there are certainly some people who had um, kind hearts, and Amanda was one of them. Okay. There was an Amanda Cook who was your nurse from October 18th through December 26th. Is that the one that you think you're referring to? If I'm being honest, a lot of the nurses, um, they had the same name. So I don't want to say yes, just because I'm not for certain. Okay. Let me ask you about a couple others. It's a trial exhibit 2364-008. And this is also from your care journal. Um, people you really liked at the hospital. Uh, it was a while ago, so let me see if I can help. Do you remember Kaylee, the first one, being um, Kaylee Gay, a patient care technician? No, so um, I have to explain this one a little bit. So in my hospital room, there's a big whiteboard in front of me and there were names of people who were taking care of me. I just filled out the journal and I put their names in there. And part of the reason that I listed a lot of people was because I thought if they knew I liked them, they would let me go home. Okay. Well, you listed uh, somebody named Barb. That was Barb Flatten. She was your nurse in November. Do you remember what you liked about her? Um, I. It's hard to remember. Some of them, they didn't they weren't as regular as the other nurses. Like, I remember Amanda and I remember Lindsay, but the rest of them I'm not very familiar with. Okay. Um, there was one you put Victoria Pagano. Well, I'll tell you her last name was Pagano, Victoria. She was your respiratory therapist in December. Anything particularly you remember that you liked about her? I'm sorry, I do not remember. Um, how about Lindsay? She was Lindsay Arenas. She was your bedside nurse in December and January. Do you remember what it was you liked about her? Yeah, um, I remember I told her about my mom's passing, and she was very compassionate. And um, I liked her because she was funny, and she was nice to me. Okay. Um, on the next page, Clay, which is Trial Exhibit 2364-009. <clears throat> This continued with the list of people you like. There's someone named Debbie. Uh, I'll let you know there's a nurse named Debbie Bill. She was in the pediatric ICU October 10th, 11th, and 12th. Do you remember what it was that you liked about her? Um, this would have been a different Debbie then because I did not list anyone from the PICU. Okay. Do you remember who this Debbie was? I'm sorry, I do not. Um, the nurses, when they wrote their names on the board, it was usually just their first name and then their last initial. The Billy, um, that was Billy, if you remember, was that Billy Cecil, your physical therapist? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, Billy Cecil gave you 19 physical therapy sessions between October 9th, 2016, and January 4th, 2017. Do you remember what it was you liked about him? Um, I remember, like, little snippets of our therapy sessions. Again, most of these people I just listed names because I was trying to get out of the hospital, and I'm 10, so I'm thinking if they think I like you, then I'll get out. Um, beneath that is um, Alicia, and we talked about she was the one that was with Kathy Beattie when the photos were taken, right? Yes. And then below that is someone named Nicole. Uh, she was another nurse in the pediatric ICU. Do you think that was her, or do you think it, it was a different one for certain? Um, but I'm not 
Sure. I don't remember, Nicole, but I didn't, I don't remember listing anyone from the PICU. Okay. Uh, there's a Sylvia. Do you remember who that Sylvia was? I do. I had her on a few occasions. Um, we didn't really talk much, um, but she was friendly. Okay. Um, do you remember, uh, sh she was your nurse uh, for about 14 shifts from October through December 27th? Does that seem right? That seems about right. Okay. And I think you told us about a nurse named Sam that you also liked? Yes. Okay. Um, there was, um, let me ask you about trial exhibit uh, 2364-11. You were asked about the things you liked while you were at All Children's. You listed uh, good nurses. We talked about, I think, 11 of them, but you mentioned good doctors. Do you remember which doctors you liked? Again, I just listed that in hopes of getting out. You have to remember the hospital is the one who gave me this My Care Journal. It wasn't something I had brought from home. And I was under the impression that they were going to be reading it after I completed it. So I thought if I made them out to seem good, then they would consider releasing me back to my family. Um, you listed RJ's Activity Center. Do you remember what you liked about going to RJ's? Yeah, that's where I met the girl Natalie. What types of activities did you do in RJ's? There were arts and crafts activities, and then at one point there were these, I call them the bead ladies, because um, they would physically come up to the room and help you make bracelets. I actually made some for my mom. During your... Um, hospitalization, you did receive sacramental rites, correct? At a certain point, yes. Okay. Um, you, you received sacramental rites from not just uh, your outside um, uh, mm -hmm. preach, uh, um, uh, from, thought from your father at your church, but you also received them from uh, Father Coover at All Children's. Do you remember that? Would that be... Tom is his first name, right? Yeah. Okay, that's how I knew him, Father Tom, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, I used his last name. I apologize. It's all good. I just want to make sure. Yeah, okay. Father Tom also administered on more than one occasion sacramental rites while you were at All Children's, right? Yes, I think it was like once or twice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but he, I just wanted to say the first time he came, he did not give me the sacrament, actually. It took, I think, about like a month until I was actually able to receive the body of Christ. Um, and then he told me some things about his past, so I didn't end up seeing him again. Okay. The, the records I have show that you received sacramental rites at least twice from Father Tom. Does that seem accurate to you? Well, the first time he didn't show up with it, it was only the second time. So I did see him on two occasions, but it was only one occasion that I actually received the sacrament. Um, <clears throat> the if we could go to joint exhibit one zero zero one dash one eight three four, and at the bottom the comments section, it, at least according to this, it, it said that Father Tom had visited you on both Saturday and Sunday and provided sacramental. Uh, sorry provided the sacramental rites on at least two of those occasions. Does that help refresh the time period for you? Honestly, I am certain that it took a, at least a couple of weeks before I received the body. I know that for certain. I know that I visited with him, and again, the first time he didn't have it, but it did take some time. Um, during your hospitalization, you had the chance to nominate a nurse for a DAISY Award. Is that right? Yes. Okay, and, and what's a DAISY award? Um, I think it's just like an award that you give to a nice nurse. You write somebody's name down. Okay. Um, let me show you exhibit. Uh, actually, this is not in evidence yet, um, so mm -hmm. if I could hand it to the witness. May I approach? May I approach? Thank you, Your Honor. Let's show it to Mr. Anderson first. That would be good.
on the second page of the exhibit, Maya, um, maybe you could help me with your handwriting and tell me what you wrote about your nomination. Well, first, who did you nominate for a DAISY Award? It was that Lindsay I said um, earlier that was nice. And, and what were your reasons for nominating Nurse uh, Lindsay for a DAISY Award? I could um, take the word nice, I see. Sorry, it's going to take me a minute to read this handwriting. <laughs> I know it's my own, but it's very messy. Sure, take your time. Okay, I said fast and super nice. The reason I mentioned fast was that in the PICU, if you remember, Ashley Sumner, she would always yell at me to wait um, to use the restroom. So when nurses actually took the time to answer my call and take me to the restroom, I was very appreciative of that. And then she was nice. Um, she didn't yell at me. And actually, the example I used here was I use the bathroom um, or anything. She will come as fast as possible. It's actually quite sad that that's what I appreciated because I feel like that should be standard for every patient, even in the PICU. Let me ask you a little bit about um, the photographs. Were, were you, are you aware that the photographs that we showed the ones that were taken before you could go to court, you remember those? Yes. Um, you are aware that there were a second set of photographs taken after you returned from court to document the differences. The truth is, I feel like I would have remembered that, and I don't have any recollection, uh, recollection of a second set of photos being taken of me. Okay. Um, so at least as you sit here today, you don't remember whether two sets of photos were taken but it's entirely possible there were two sets. Is that fair? I really don't think there is two sets. Um, there was only one set taken, Kathy and Alicia, Alicia. I remember a group of doctors coming into my room and asking if I would be ready for the second set, and I told them, no, I don't want to, and they didn't do it. Okay. And I guess the reason I ask is the photos that the jury were shown um, do you know whether those were all taken at one time or whether they, in fact, reflect photos taken before court and photos taken after? To my recollection, it was that one set I was changing from my pajamas to a court outfit. Um, and I guess you wore a dress to court, if you remember. I think my uncle may have brought a dress or something, yes. Okay. So let me transition a little bit with you after you got out of all children's, Okay. Um, and we all had the chance to meet Rachel DeYoung, your therapist? Yes. Okay. Um, it, it sounds like from a time frame, and you'd still, you would be finishing sixth grade, although doing it virtually, from January 2017 when you were out of all children's until August 2017, what you did to make your recovery was physical therapy um, and... and that was it? Fair. No, I did the warm water therapy as well, and I believe I was seeking counseling at the time to help with coping with my mom's passing as well as my disease. So from that period of time, January through August of 2017, physical therapy, warm water therapy, and cognitive therapy with grief counseling. Is that fair? Yes. And that, plus your courage to work through the pain, was able to get you to a point that from the time of your discharge from all children's in January, that by the time school started in August, which would now be going into um, sixth grade, that you were able to get out of the wheelchair and be on crutches. Is that right? I was on crutches, yes. Okay. From that time that you shed your wheelchair, you haven't had to use it again for ambulation. Is that fair? No, but again, I still have pain. There's days where I literally stay in bed all day, and that could, it's not just a single day. I'm talking days on end. So um, seventh grade comes around, and that would be August 2018 through May 2019, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you were off crutches by that summer, correct? Correct. And then, um, if I recall, what you told me was you actually went back into 
a seventh grade and picked phys ed as an elective? Um, yes. So sixth grade, it was required that I take it, which was weird because I was on crutches, but I just did physical therapy exercises up on the stage. And then seventh grade, um, I did start PE because, you know, you're walking. It's like the first time you've ever walked in such a long time. Obviously, the first thing you want to do is play. So if I understand what you're telling the jury, by eighth grade, you were participating uh, in phys ed with no restrictions, correct? Not with no restrictions. Um, there were tests that we had to do, um, physical tests that I think the county is just required to do. One of the tests is running a mile, which seems really like it doesn't seem very difficult, but I was unable to do it because of an asthma flare up. And as well as I didn't have the physical ability at that time, you know, even though I was able to walk, it doesn't mean I could run for long distances like a mile. By um, eighth grade, uh, you were fully participating in all sports, true? Um, well, not all the sports I was, like figure skating or gymnastics or ballet, but in P, I don't think I took PE in eighth grade. It was I think it was just seventh. In the eighth grade, you were president of the choir? I'm sorry, what was that? President of the choir. Yes. And you were president of Students Against Drunk Driving? Um, students Working Against Tobacco. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I gotcha. SWAT. Uh, you were National Junior Honor Society? Yes, I was the president of that. You were uh, back scuba diving? I believe so, yes. I got my scuba certification. Okay. And you don't recall having any CRPS flare-ups in the 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, correct? Nothing to a point where I wasn't able to walk or anything, but it's not fair to say that I didn't have pain because I definitely did. And my dad heard a lot of that. Okay. Yeah, and the reason I ask is because when we had a chance to talk um, and I had asked you whether you had any flare-ups in 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, you had told me no. Is that true? Right. That's what I'm saying. It's not a flare-up to the point where I couldn't, like, do anything, but I did still have pain. And by, um, and this was uh, the time period of 8th grade would have been August 2017 um, to... Uh, Sorry, August 7, 2017 to May 2018, and then May 2018, um, sorry, August 2018 to May 2019 would be seventh grade, and then August 2019 to May 2020 would be uh, eighth grade, right? Yes. And then just to get a sense um, of your workout routine, the, the recovery that you were able to make by August 28th, 2020, you had talked to me a little bit about your workout routine. Uh, it, do I recall correctly that you were getting up around 4.30 in the morning for your workouts? Yeah, so at the time, I mean, I still struggled with sleep and everything. So I woke up early anyway. Um, it's just like an internal alarm clock. So I thought I would use that time because I was in school. I would use that time to work out, and then I would go to bed as early as I can um, following school. But I was really dedicated to keeping my strength and maintaining my muscle tone. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like by then, through your dedication to this and the recovery, you were able to do about five and a half miles every morning? Um, I did about like five laps, but I don't think mm -hmm. the entire circle is a mile. It's like a little bit less. I don't know the exact. May, may have been closer to four miles every morning. Yeah. And you were also able to do high-intensity interval training as well? Right, but not for prolonged periods of time. Again, it was just, you know, challenging myself. Um, and then, unfortunately, in August 2020, it looks like you broke your finger playing sports. I did. I caught a football in a weird way. Okay. Uh, it's happened to all of us. So um, you had surgery to repair your broken finger. Is that right? I got a pin placed. Okay. And fortunately, that did not cause any CRPS flares or relapse, correct? Correct. So not every injury is going to bring on a CRPS relapse. It, it's just not the nature of it. I mean, some people are more sensitive, but for me, there's been times I've been injured, and there's been times I've endured stress and haven't had a relapse, and that's normal too. And so, um, again, on the calendar, from the period of time from 
uh, when you came out of All Children's in January of 2017 until this time when you talked about the broken finger in August 2020, the only medications that you were taking were Flonase and Claritin. Is that fair? Well, I was discharged with about 14 at All Children's Hospital, so I took those um, until they weren't prescribed anymore. And then slowly I was um, weaned off of pretty much everything. And um, there was, I'm also, it's like different medications. I have one for sleep that I didn't mention, and that's my bad. Okay, so for the period after you finished the medications that you were discharged with from all children's, that period of time, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, the medications that you were taking would have been for allergies and to help sleep. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you talked about returning to figure skating. Um, you mentioned doing a jump called a sal cow. What's that? It's um, a special kind of jump. I really can't explain it in terms that would like make sense, but I was working on it, yeah. This was in high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is it like where you drop your skate into the ice and flip in the air? or You do um, pick your toe into the ice, and then you do a little twirl in the air. Okay. Uh, you won a skating competition? I was against like five year olds, if I'm being completely honest. It's okay. so embarrassing, but my skill level was not of that that it used to be. Well, you got to take credit for it. You, <laughs> want, you want a competition. Okay. Um, fast forwarding to high school, uh, by 2022, you were um, a sophomore in high school, right? Yes. Okay. And you're still doing physically better in 2022 than you were before you went into all children's. Is that fair? I'm doing, yes, I'm not, I didn't have an active relapse at the time. Okay. And then um, 2023, you would have finished at the end of the summer, uh, your junior year in high school. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, and that's when you got a job at Cracker Barrel? I did, yes. And then um, it looks like, you know, you, in general, you're going to the gym about five days a week? I tried my best, but most of it was just walking um, on the treadmill. And then when I started working, I didn't go to the gym as much. And then in terms of medications, again, in your junior year, it looks like you were taking Claritin, Flonase, a sleep aid, and seeing a doctor for eczema. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, let me ask you uh, about some photos, and I'm just going to approach if these are not in evidence yet, but I was just going to ask about some authentication. Show them to Mr. Anderson first, please. Yes, sir. Um, Yes. May I approach your honor? Yes. Maya, at the bottom of the photos, there's those things you've probably gotten used to. They're like exhibit numbers. Mm -hmm. You see? Okay. Yeah. The first one is exhibit uh, 001. Um, do you know when that photo was taken? I don't know the exact date, but it was... Uh, fairly recent. Do you know if that was part of the People magazine photo shoot? It was. Okay. Um, what about photo 002? Yes. Was that also part of the People magazine photo shoot? Yes. And what about uh, 003? Do you know when that was taken? It was also part of that. What about 007? Just skipping ahead a couple. Yep. That's not part of um, that shoot. This was taken at a different time. Okay. Do you know approximately when that photo was taken? I have the date in my phone, but I don't want to make any assumptions. Okay. What about 008? That was part of the People magazine. Okay. 
Okay. What about zero zero nine? Um, that was in New York at the Tribeca Film Festival. I don't know the exact date again. I don't want to make a mistake. Okay. May I retrieve the documents, Your Honor? You may. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you seen um, Dr. Barr as a patient since you were discharged from all children's? I don't remember. Okay. How about Dr. Spiegel? Have you seen him since you've left all children's? And just, I'm sure it's hard to remember everything. He was the one who did the hyperbaric yeah, oxygen yeah. treatments. Um, no, I haven't. Again, I've just, I'm very afraid of going to doctors. And unfortunately, I think it's a fear I'm going to be living with. Okay. I'm sorry, what was the I said, unfortunately, I think it's going to be a fear I'll be living with. One moment, Your Honor. Uh, Davis Warren's last question. Tough one. Um, when we last spoke, you were telling me you were thinking Duke or Florida State. Have you narrowed it down? I have not. Now I think my options have even gotten bigger. I'm thinking about, I don't know, maybe New York. Uh, any particular college or field of study? My kids hate when I ask that, but I got to do it to you. Um, no, not yet. I'm keeping my options open. Okay. Best of luck to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. We can pull up. Let's see. 101, 1001-1930, please. Now, I am through these different notations they had you make on your what was it called the uh, my plan my special care journal. All right, they gave that to you. Correct. And they were pretty insistent that they wanted you to fill that out. Yes, um, the nurse who gave it to me before. So I went to her and I was complaining that. I haven't seen my mom, and I haven't been able to talk to her, and see, she suggested that I write a note to my mom, so she came back with a special care journal. But at the same time that they were trying to get you to talk uh, about them in a good light, you were telling them that you were in too much pain and you hate this hospital. That's very okay. true. Oh, oh sorry, I'm sorry. I'm I'll sorry. rephrase. Thank you. At this same period of time, if you look down here to this note, uh, right next to the bottom, did the hospital document how you were truly feeling about them? Yes. All right, let's pull up then 100-0313. Uh, <coughs> Okay, this is from uh, November 5th, and here you are telling them what? That you want to go home, and you did not want to participate in rec activities? Yeah, Your Honor, again, we object to the meeting of the question. Yes, sir. What, if anything, were you telling them? about your desire to be there and to do this stuff? Well, I know from experience that physical therapy um, that I've had in the past, like very intensive and not at my pace and tailored to my needs, actually ends up hurting me as well as my CRPS. Let's pull up 1001-0510. Scroll down. And what did you tell them, as documented in this, this note, about what your stay was like? 
Can I have one second to read it first? Yep. Okay. This definitely accurately depicts my mindset at the time. You know, everything that I thought they were doing was hurting me. And even though I was telling them what the right course of action could be, they were not willing to listen and instead actually laughed at me. There is an instance where a doctor literally laughed in my face. Well, while they were documenting you saying this in their records, uh, did it appear almost like they had a plan to develop evidence that you really did secretly like them? What, if anything, did it appear? They were trying Can I just, I'm, I'm sustaining the objection. What if, what, if anything, did it appear to you they were trying to do with all of these notebooks and tell us what's good and tell us why you love it here so much? Well, I think it's important to note that with the My Special Care Journal, you all did not see the entirety of the journal. Um, there's a page um, with saying like things I liked about the hospital, but there's also a page that depicts what I did not like about the hospital, and the page is full. And along those lines, you had been to a lot of outpatient doctors, is that right? Correct. Um, are you referring to the John Hopkins? Mm -hmm. yes, 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 I have. Mm -hmm. And so when you're referring to some of the doctors here, were you referring to those outpatient doctors that were trying to help you? Yes, I believe so. And did they, were the outpatient doctors uh, questioning your CRPS or accepting your CRPS? They were generally very understanding of my CRPS. And insofar as whether Father Tom was appropriate for you, um, did he make you comfortable or uncomfortable? Initially, he made me comfortable. Um, I confided in him, and I told him about my situation at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital and the way I was being treated and how I wanted to go home. Um, then he relayed to me that he had a very um, traumatic experience of his own. Um, I don't know. He didn't give me a time frame, but he said in the past, and I come to find out it was something extremely inappropriate, which I don't know if I'm. So, did you want your priest that you regularly knew and trusted? Yes. After finding out um, what he had done and the things he had, I definitely wanted my priest back. Did they ever explain to you why they were going after your mom for this? Um, for these medications instead of the doctors, licensed Florida doctors, experts in the area, yeah, that, sure. can I get the question out? What's the legal basis? Okay. Obviously. Well, let's work on our pronoun usage. Let's eliminate pronouns. Did the Johns Hopkins doctors that you spoke to ever explain why they were going after your mom if they had a problem with your treatment as opposed to the doctors prescribing it? I apologize, I would have
objection is overruled. Uh, Ms. Kowalski, you may answer the question. Can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. Did any of the doctors at the hospital ever explain to you why they were accusing your mom of these things, if it indeed was all about the prescriptions and the treatments you were getting, instead of the doctors, licensed Florida doctors that were prescribing it? Same objection. Overruled. You can answer. They never directly explained to me. Is that does that complete your questioning? Right, right, Judge, but we have a proper office. Okay, right, so you're finished with redirect? I am. Any recross? Uh, no, thank you, Your Honor. And members of the jury, do you have any questions? We received all the questions because I know we adult proofed the uh, <laughs> legal pad. Okay, members of the jury, it's going to be easier for us to do this if I send you to the, your room. Uh, do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do the investigation. Receive no information. We'll try to do it faster this way. All right. If the jury is out of our presence, um, the lawyers can stay up here because you might have to physically look at this. I'm going to do what I've been doing in the past and just... Ms. Kowalski is out of the courtroom. Uh, question one. You stated documentation shows additional photos of Maya were taken upon Maya's return from court, a before and after photo documentation. Are there, in fact, quote, after, end quote, photos in Maya's Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital medical records? Yeah, and I think if I peeped, it says Judge and Mr. Shapiro not to the witness, um, but I don't object to you asking her. So. I don't object to asking her. I think we all, unless there's some mystery photos that no one has ever seen in this case, I think the court would be, it would be appropriate to instruct that none have been submitted as potential ex exhibits in this case. Well, for, yeah. for, for, for now, we'll ask if she knows. Yeah. And then the lawyers can do whatever you need to do to address that particular issue. Uh, red number two. Um, did the jury hear correctly the series of photos before court or not in your medical records? Please clarify. No objection. No objection. 
Mr. Shapiro, this one says Judge C or Mr. Anderson or Maya. Okay. So we'll ask that one. Next question, red number three. Uh, Maya, doing, during your stay at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, uh, you were at some time not able to view TV and only a ticking wall clock was available. While you were at uh, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, did staff inquire if they could assist you in any way such as adjust the TV channel, the volume, bring an item closer, further, adjust your bed, uh, not, not counting the 48-hour EKG? Uh, when it comes to creature comforts, were you made to feel comfortable or were you made to or just felt you were in a hostile place? There's that one. No objection. No objection. Okay, let's see. ask this one. Number four, red four. Judge C, Mr. Anderson or Maya? As hospitals may and do use both colors and even symbols to identify patient conditions, statuses, treatments, and even restrictions, do you have any photos that may reveal these placards on Maya's room, uh, deliberate or even by change in the background? There's that one. We can ask her if she knows, but I, so far in this, there's been nothing put in the record to my knowledge about that. I mean, it's well outside her scope of knowledge, but that's fine. No If she knows. Red number five. You stated. Dr. Kornberg recommended first boots to straighten feet. If that fails, then surgically break and set feet straight. Uh, you said the boots were tried but failed. Is that correct? Jack and or Beata and or you agreed to boots. Is this correct? Surgical remedy not done. Maya, do you know why surgery declined? It could simply be it is very expensive, or sorry, evasive. Or did your mother find via research of some kind that your dystonia was a symptom of CRPS and surgery to realign your feet was not a proper remedy for your condition? I don't know what this next word is. So surgery was not a valid remedy, and that's the unknown word here. Y'all can figure it out. Well, uh, stump. stump the judge day. Objection, compound meeting. <laughs> I don't know what that word is either. Symptom. 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 Questions from the jury. It looks like they want to know options, so we have no objection. Well, the jury is bound by the same rules of evidence as the lawyers are, so I'm going to sustain as to that. Certainly, Mr. Anderson, you can um, follow up. So, what, what so I'm going to I'm going to end with Maya. Do you know why surgery was declined? That will be the last question on this sheet. Do you need to see the sheet again? No, Your Honor. Uh, okay, I got it. Okay, that was five.
five, number six. What are the dates that Beata stopped being allowed in the hospital that goes to the um, dependency? Yeah, that we need to at some point get a instruction on. Mr. Altenberg. Yeah, we'll, we'll confer with Mr. Altenberg, okay. but we would object to that question at this time. And then the next one is what are the dates Jack was not allowed in the hospital? And, and maybe the, the court can let this jury know that those answers will be coming. Yes. So, next one, red number seven. And there's, well, a lot of questions. How long did Dr. Kirkpatrick spend with you before issuing the CRPS diagnosis? No objection. Was it the same day you met him? You said the ketamine was effective. Must have been a relief to experience some relief. Did you find that as the effects wore off that the contrast made it more painful? Mm. You mentioned in testimony that you had open dialogue about treatment and that parents did not pressure you. Can you describe a treatment you discussed? How did you articulate that as a child? What specifically did you turn down? Next question. Dr. Cantu mentioned that even touching a CRPS patient could develop lesions. Had that happened to you or for you at all? Next question. Why doesn't a single expert connect CRPS to digestive issues? Uh, next question. Please elaborate how you overheard the nurse speaking to your mom. Where were you Standing, why were you there? How did you know it was your parent? Next question. Describe how opioids made you feel. Next question. Are you Catholic? Do you carry your rosary? What was your last mass? Confession, communion. Uh, all the, of those only, questions. the only one that I would object to, I believe, would be... Yeah, why doesn't a single expert connect CRPS to digestive issues? I, I believe that's outside the foundation of this witness. No, well, I, I, thought, I thought we did have testimony on that from Dr. Chopra. Jeez, a novel. Well, whether we did or not, we would object to it being outside the foundation. It's the number eight on this one. Oh, oh, oh sorry, the Dr. Cantu was number seven. Dr. Cantu mentioned that even touching a CRPS patient could develop lesions. Had that happened to you at all? Okay. okay. Um, the, the Catholic question, though, Your Honor, I think is a bit too involved. I think asking her if she's Catholic is fine, but going into all of her background and the last time and all that, I don't understand how that would be relevant. There's been a lot of discussion about Catholicism. I think those are fair game questions. All right. Next uh, would be red number eight. You mentioned being denied communion, fear of contamination. Did your priest offer to use or bless the products to accommodate DCF needs. Did they provide hermetically sealed wine or juice 
and wafer for communion. Next question. Uh, I think the word is relevance to Lent. Did the chapel shown have a tabernacle? Did you ever see the Eucharist? Uh, next question. You mentioned that, quote, most, end quote, of the things your dad gave you had to be reviewed. What things were not required to be reviewed by Miss Beata? Miss Beatty, I should say. Uh, how? Next question. How did you become aware of diagnosis after your mom passed? You didn't find this info out as a patient, right? Here is the and start that, those questions. So we, we, we do object to question number three because it blurs the lines between what was ordered to be uh, reviewed by DCF versus what Miss Betty would have had discretion over. And I'm afraid by the asking of that particular question, we could be inviting a witness to speculate on the distinction, especially one who would have no knowledge of it outside what she's learned during the legal process. I mean, the orders that speak for themselves. And then question one, and also mentioned the DCF do you object to that one also? The only reason I don't is because it clearly says DCF, where the other one mentioned Kathy Betty without the layer. So anyway, I'm making the objection to number three if you are making the objection to one. That's a two, sir. Yeah, I agree with number one. That's way too complex into the DCF thing based on the court's rulings, but the rest of them are fine. What's your position on number three? I'm sorry, I shouldn't remember all these. But Defense has objected to number three, so what? I think it's fine. So you're opposed. Uh, you, you are okay with the, the question being asked? Yeah. Is okay. there any stuff that she was able to get? I think the answer is going to be no. But. I'm going to sustain the objection with respect to question number three, and Mr. Anderson has objected to question number one. What's the defendant's position as to number one? Yeah, I think number one's proper because it clearly delineates that um, who was responsible for uh, products coming in with regard to DCF. So, <laughs> it says, one says DCF, one says BD. So if one's objectionable, the objectionable. I'm going to uh, sustain the objection with respect to number one. Neither one nor three are going to be allowed. Two and four, okay, but not one and three. Two more pages. Number nine. Um, red number nine in the top left. Uh, clarification in 2020, when you had a relapse and in the hospital, I, I don't understand what that word is. Uh, were you in J Hatch and was another port installed or was this a prior port? And then the second question, did Kathy Beatty console you when your mother passed or even say she was sorry for your loss? And I'm gonna underline in red the one word I couldn't see, I couldn't make up. I think they mean a, a, um, approximately a 
approximately. I, I believe the question reads, clarification, in 2020 when you had a relapse and in the hospital approximately one week, were you in JHACH, question mark, and was another port installed, or was this a prior port? I think they put a P instead of an X, but I think they just talked about I don't think it's objectionable particularly. Okay, so you, you think that that translation of that word is approximately? I believe so. Okay. Um, we, we do object to number two as a statement of remorse. It goes exactly to the causes of action. Well, let's have one person talk at a time. Let's hear the defense objection first. The defense objection, statement of remorse, and 403. This, we, yeah, we, well, not as a party admission, but also we have the tort of outrage on two different levels, and it goes to exactly how uh, Beatty was treating her even in times of the worst emotional outbursts, or, or not outbursts, but emotional levels that she could have. And so the juror wants to know what the baby's. I'm going to overrule the objection, and I will ask the question. Uh, last page. Looks like only one question on this one. Do you know if you discontinued the use of opioids that you were prescribed the times of the alternative treatments, uh, parentheses, ketamine treatment in Mexico, hyperbaric chamber, etc.? I'm not sure I understand that one. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I think mm -hmm. it's like, do you know if you discontinued use of opioids that you are, were prescribed the times of the alternative treatments? I mean, I think during the times. It, it, yeah, it's an either or question. It. They want to know whether there is. I think she was objection. But she stopped opioids like six months before. I think it's missing a comma. Is the confusion? Something. Yeah. During okay. the treatment, but. Oh. I'll ask it and see what happens. Okay. Anything else before we bring the jury back? We jury. just have 30 seconds to conclude. It. Sure. And someone can bring back uh, Ms. Kowalski. Yes, ma'am. It looks like the plaintiff's lawyers are ready. Are the defense lawyers ready? Yes, ma'am. Let's bring in the uh, jury. Yes, ma'am. And Ms. Kowalski, I'm going to remind you you're under oath, but I'm going to do that in front of the jury. Okay. Fresh legal pads and fresh pens. <laughs> Everyone, please be seated. Hey, members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not see any media coverage. And uh, you've not been approached by anyone. And that you did not uh, discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation. You received no information. Is that all correct? Okay. And Ms. Kowalski, I just want to remind you that you're still under oath. And so the jury is aware, since I didn't have the white noise machine on, we did ask Ms. Kowalski to step outside, so she did not hear the discussion I had with the lawyers. Uh, and I am able to ask almost all of them, but there's a few that I cannot ask. Okay, we're going to start. Uh, um, you stated documentation shows additional photos of 
Maya Kowalski were taken upon Maya's return from court, the before and after photo documentation. Are you aware if there are any after photos in your medical records at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? To my knowledge, the photos weren't even entered into the medical records, so there's no proof of, as far as I'm concerned, of a second set of photos. Okay. Uh, did the jury hear correctly? The series of photos before court are not in your medical record. Please clarify. Yes. So when I talked to Kathy Beatty, I asked for her to only put them into the medical records because it was my understanding that that was a secure place where only doctors can access that as opposed to anyone who had access to the camera that they took the photos on. She told me that she had put them there, but as of last weekend, I figured out that that was not the case, and I was infuriated because she made it seem like she was entering them into the medical base. The next question, uh, during your stay at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, uh, you were at some time not able to view TV and only have a ticking wall clock was available to you. While you were at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, did the staff inquire if they could assist you in any way, such as adjusting the TV channel, the volume, bringing an item closer or farther, adjust your bed, um, and this is excluding the 48-hour period. Gotcha. So this was during the PICU where I wasn't allowed, well, I didn't have access to the TV, so I really just sat there and watched the clock, and it was extremely depressing. I did have the call button, but for a nurse to not even want to assist me to use the restroom, I was highly doubtful that she would go out of her way to turn on the TV. She was very aggressive with her answers about me using the restroom, and most of the time she declined. Therefore, I didn't want to waste my request on pleasure activities like watching TV versus necessities like using the bathroom. When it comes to, quote, creature comforts, end quote, were you made to feel comfortable or were you made to or just felt that you were in a hostile place? Um, the creature, is that about the stuffed animals? I would assume. I, I'm assuming it would include uh, stuffed animals, but any sort of uh, creature comforts that would make you feel comfortable. Okay, so um, there was a point where my dad was able to bring some of my stuffed animals at home, and those did provide me comfort, but obviously I would prefer my family there. As hospitals may, and this is if you know, mm -hmm. um, as hospitals may and do use both colors and even symbols to identify patient conditions and status treatments and restrictions, um, are you aware of any photos that may re reveal these placards on your room? So my dad, I don't believe, was allowed to take photos of things outside of the room because of it might have been a HIPAA violation to other patients in adjacent rooms. It was just standard protocol, I guess. Um, but again, I did see the name tags of other patients there, and they looked very different. So they had stickers on theirs, but... It was like stickers of princesses or um, trucks, but mine were circular, solid colored stickers. Um, and again, I asked what they meant and they wouldn't tell me. The next question from the jury. You stated Dr. Kornberg recommended first boots to straighten feet. And if that failed, then surgically breaking and setting your feet straight. Um, First, on that line, you said the boots were tried but failed. Is that correct? Yes, because the dystonia only advanced. Um, as there was more agitation of the nerves, it just got worse. Okay. Did your dad, Jack Kowalski, or your mom, Beata Kowalski, or you agree to boots? We did agree to trying the boots. Even I agreed at the time because I did not know I had CRPS and I didn't know that it would ultimately hurt me. They were painful, but 
I wasn't against trying it. Uh, it seems the surgical remedy was not done. Do you know why the surgery was not done? I know my parents immediately when that statement left Dr. Kornberg's mouth, they objected to that. They didn't think that was the right course of action and they wanted to wait. And the balance of the questions I cannot ask. Okay, the next uh, sheet. Um, I'm not asking Ms. Kowalski these questions, but members of the jury, there, there's been another request about dates relative to the court orders, and I will in the future get that to you, I promise. Okay, the next uh, series of questions. Um, how long did Dr. Kirkpatrick spend with you before issuing the CRPS diagnosis? It was multiple hours, and this stays true with all of the doctors I've seen for a full examination of CRPS. I would argue it was about, I know with uh, most of them, it was around the range of like five full hours. And not only did they just do the examination, but they also spoke to my parents about the symptoms and me individually as a patient. Was this the same day, i.e. the date he issued the CRPS diagnosis, was this the same day that you met him? I believe so, yes. You said that ketamine was effective it must have been a relief to experience some relief. Did you find that as the effects wore off, that the contrast made it more painful? That's a good question. I think I was so used to pain at the point and I was so used to it coming back that I didn't really notice, like, I don't think the contrast itself made it worse because I've experienced the contrast pain before as well, if that makes sense. So I was familiar with the pain. I don't think the contrast itself made it worse. I think it was just um, whether there was a trigger involved that made my CRPS worse, or if it was just a matter of the drug not working as long as we would have liked it to. You mentioned in your testimony that you had open dialogue about treatment in that your parents did not pressure you. Can you describe a treatment you discussed? How did you articulate that as a child? And what specifically did you turn down? So this would align more with the whole Mexico treatment situation. The doctor spoke to my parents first about whether they were considering that as an option and then the doctor spoke with me individually to just check and see how I felt after explaining all the risks. Obviously, he dumbed it down a little bit to a level a 10-year-old could understand so I can make an informed decision. And be again, because of the pain, with it being so terrible, I decided to go forth with it. And my parents listened to me and ultimately decided to make the trip. Dr. Kantu mentioned that even touching a CRPS patient uh, could result in lesions. Has that happened for you at all? So every CRPS patient is different. Um, for me personally, my CRPS wasn't, um, that wasn't a thing for me. It's something I haven't noticed. I did have lesions, but it, they didn't sprout from just a touch. Now, the next question in that series I cannot ask, but the following question is, please elaborate how you overheard the nurse speaking to your mom. Where were you standing? Why were you there? And how did you know it was your parent? So um, I learned about that conversation. I wasn't actually near the nurse or doc I actually don't even know who it was, but I know it was somebody at the hospital because my mom had called the hospital itself. I learned about the conversation through an audio that I listened to. Describe how opioids make you feel. 
I honestly don't really remember the feeling of like opioids. I know I took them initially early on, but they didn't do anything for my pain at the time. I didn't notice, um, like there's nothing notable about them that I could pick out and tell you. And I apologize. It was a really long time ago. Um, but I know that the ketamine worked and I know the opioids didn't. Next question is, are you Catholic? Yes. Yeah, so it's a little interesting. So I was, I grew up Catholic and after my mom passed, I became a little less religious just because I, I didn't really understand how God could take someone from my life so important, but eventually I came back to my faith and I understand that was just part of my grieving process. Do you carry a rosary? I have one in my pocket. <laughs> when was your last mass? My, I actually haven't gone to church in a while and I'll explain that. Um, I used to go to Epiphany Cathedral and it's in Venice and the four of us have gone as a family, my mom, Kyle, my dad and I. We did go back multiple times after her passing, but it's just very difficult because you get looks from people and you know they know that your mom's not there and it just doesn't feel right without her. Um, there's a lot of activities like that and that's part of the reason I stopped skating as well. When, when is your last confession and communion? I, um, last communion, that was more recent. I don't have the date on that, but someone came to my house and this is a, kind of weird, but my grandma, she's very Catholic. She lives in Illinois. She'll send me communion through the mail um, from her church and it's blessed and whatnot. And I'll take that confession. I have not had confession in a minute. And again, that's because it's at the same church I used to go to with my mom. The next uh, page of questions, uh, I'm only going to be able to ask two of the four on this one. Um, the question, relevance to Lent, did the chapel shown have a tabernacle? Did you ever see the Eucharist? Um, so there was at one point where I was given the Eucharist. It was uh, That's when I was talking about the body, like, it was a month after the priest had come and visit me, but um, I didn't see a place in the chapel. I f don't know how to say that, but wait, the big word that you just said, uh, it was not in that chapel, no. How did you become aware of diagnosis after your mom passed? Um, diagnosis of... No, I'm just reading the question. Yeah, yeah, good. Um trying to think of what diagnosis that could well, be in reference to. Did, did you find out a, a diagnosis as a patient while you were as a patient? Oh, okay. I see. Okay. I got it. So, um, it was only after I had left the hospital that I was able to review the medical records. And that's when I saw the conversion disorder and fictitious disorder. When I was in the hospital, I just had to assume that's what I didn't know the technical term because I've never heard of such a thing before. Um, but the way that they were treating me, I knew that they thought I was making it up. So I knew whatever they thought was going on, it was a disorder in which I was making it up. And then when I reviewed the medical records, I was finally able to attach a name to what they were thinking. Okay. The next question is a clarification. In 2020, when you had that relapse and you were in the hospital for approximately one week, um, were you at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? No, I believe the name of the hospital is Ar Arnold Palmer um, in Orlando. Okay. Was another port installed or was there already a prior port? So there was no port, I just had the nose tube. Did Kathy Beatty console you when your mom passed? She did not um, like touch me or anything. She just said she was sorry, and she said she had another patient to see and left the room. That was probably 
the only time I saw her not really wanting to stay in the room. Given the answer, I'm not going to ask the balance of that question. Okay, the last question uh, from the jury. Do you know if you discontinued use of opioids that you were prescribed the times of alternative treatments such as the ketamine treatment in Mexico or the hyperbaric chambers, et cetera? Yeah, I think there was some testimony about um, after Cantu, um, there was no need for any opioids because the treatment had worked so well that my doctors at home who were comfortable prescribing them, they decided to stop prescribing them because of my progress. Okay. Mr. Anderson, uh, any follow-up? Uh, take it then that Ms. Beatty actually did not stay to try to console you and make you feel better. Object about this. Same objection, Your Honor. Overruled. You can answer. Can you just, I'm sorry, one more time. Kathy Beatty did not hang around to console you, make you feel better. She just said, I'm sorry, and left? Yes. Um, you were asked about creature comforts, and I think you were talking about your dad bringing you stuffed animals. The question might have been, did the hospital give you creature comforts, make you feel comfortable? I do not recall. I know I did arts and crafts and such, but nothing, I don't know. They did not give me any stuffed animals or anything like that. Those were all from home. And then there was a question about the surgery to break your legs. Um, have you learned enough now about CRPS to know whether going in with someone who has CRPS, breaking their legs, then trying to pin them back would have any beneficial effect? That would not be beneficial whatsoever, no. Um, let's see. And as to Dr. Kirkpatrick, now, uh, he, did he follow you for several weeks, months after the first visit? I believe um, we kept in touch with him, yes. All right. And did he continue to keep up with how your symptoms were doing? In other words, was it helping or not? Yeah, the improvements, um, especially after Mexico. He was one of the first people to know. Well, I think the jurors are wondering, did Dr. Kirkpatrick uh, continue to... Uh, mentally challenged the CRPS diagnosis such that, you know, if things didn't clear up or got worse, maybe it wasn't CRPS. Object to the leading room. Sustained. Was Dr. Kirkpatrick sure it was CRPS and why? He was sure it was CRPS because of his in-depth examination, his um, observations, and the symptoms that aligned, I mean, there were so many questions I had to answer. And then he also questioned my parents. And he's seen a bunch of patients before, both pediatric and adult. So he was really good at identifying that. He actually, his whole place is a research institution as well. So he really understands CRPS. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Defense, any follow-up? Oh, sorry. There's some confusion on the timing of the port for the infusion port. And I ask it in a strange order because I was asking it with yeah. the Arnold Palmer. Mm -hmm. uh, just remind me. In any event, was the port that you were testifying to that was involved with the infusions of the ketamine in the spring of 2016 as opposed to you know, well after at Arnold Palmer? The port was placed after Kirkpatrick, after Cantu, but before Hannah, like or around the time of Dr. Hannah. And it was to facilitate the ketamine infusions? Sure, yeah. Sure. Overall, you can answer. Yes, and that's what we told the doctors at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital, and they installed it. Now are we finished? I believe so. Defense, anything further? Um, Maya, just on the photos, there's the two sets that you were asked about. Um, again, do you know, if you recall, whether 
one was taken before you went to court and one was taken after? Objection. Ask and answer it and proper predicate. Okay. Overruled. You can answer it. Again, to my recollection, it was just one set of photos. I really don't remember the second set being taken. Okay. The, you were asked about when you learned about certain diagnoses. Do you remember whether your parents shared with you what the diagnosis was coming from Lurie Children's Hospital? I know that they recommended me for intensive PT, and that's what we did. I had heard that other doctors in the past have thought that it may be in my head, but they never confirmed the diagnosis. Okay, and I guess that's the reason I'm asking you. I'm sure, you know, you've had a lot of growing up to do throughout this trial, talk with Mr. Anderson. I don't want to know about that. But back then in 2015, did you, were you told about what all of the diagnoses were coming out of Lurie Children's? Did your parents tell you that? Again, I knew as much as I did. I knew that they weren't entirely sure. And I know that they may have believed that there was a psychiatric component. However, there wasn't. How about from Tampa General? When you left Tampa General in around August, end of August 2015, did you know either from the doctors or from your parents what their diagnoses were? I know Bonnie Rice, the nurse, she suspected conversion disorder. Okay. And just last couple questions. Um, you, do you recall that there was a T, so your bed in the, in the pediatric ICU, we use the word PICU, but PICU, your bed in the pediatric ICU had a call light with a remote control to your TV, right? I know of the call light, yes. Okay. It also contained a remote control for you to watch TV. I believe those were separate. Okay. You had access to a TV in the pediatric ICU. There was a TV, yes. Okay. And there was a TV that you could access with remote control in the EEG monitoring room? I I'm having a hard time remembering that one, but I know about the PICU. Okay. If I represented to you that you had a TV with a remote control in the EEG room, would you have any reason to dispute it? Well, I know that there were TVs in the rooms, but it just depends on how far away the remote was from my bed. Okay. Do you remember that the remote control to the TV was with the same paddle as the call light? I remember on um, floor seven, yes. Okay. And whether it was the same in the EEG room, you don't remember one way or the other? I don't. Okay. I appreciate your time. Members of the jury, do you have any further follow-up questions? So we're finished with questioning. Okay. Members of the jury, I think this is going to be a good time for us uh, to call it a day. Please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation. Receive no information. I'm going to want the jury coming back in at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Okay. All rise. Go to Texas. Thank you. The jury's out of our presence. Everyone, please be seated. My understanding, Mr. Anderson, you wanted to do a proffer? That is correct. Okay, so uh, the, the court reporter should just mark the transcript that this is the beginning of a proffer. Maya, do you recall a time at Johns Hopkins Hospital when a doctor came in and made you feel uncomfortable? Yes, I do. And approximately how far into your stay did this happen? To my understanding, it was um, fairly early on. I want to say October. Mm -hmm. So it was in the beginning-ish. And you've subsequently seen a note by Dr. Katzenstein, the psychologist there, that documented it, meaning it had to happen before that. Correct. I confided on her a few days after about the incident that occurred at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. All right. 
the record reflects that was October 17th or 18th. So now tell us what happened on that day, beginning with approximately what time of the day was it? I want to say it was a little bit after the morning because typically I had PT in the morning. I don't remember if I had PT during this time, but I know that it was light outside regardless. And this doctor, he opened up the door. And typically with a doctor, there's either nurses. Um, he walked in alone, which struck me as odd, but I didn't question it at the time. You were 10. Exactly. I didn't really know like how it's supposed to go. I've been to hospitals before, but I just assumed maybe this is normal. What happened? He shut the door. Um, then he came over to the left side of my bed, and he like bent down a little bit and asked if he could take a peek. I did not answer him because I was waiting for further elaboration, so I paused like I didn't say anything hoping that he would get the idea, like, tell me more. Instead, he removed my covers, he pulled down my pants, he looked at my private area, um, then he proceeded to pull up my pants, and he then quickly said, thank you, left the room. So there was no chaperone? There was no chaperone, no. I know that for certain. And he physically touched you as he was pulling down your pants and then underwear? Correct, because I could not do that by myself. And the amount of time he spent staring or looking at your private parts, was it longer than what a doctor would, you would normally think if someone was to do, yeah. do that? Sorry, Your Honor, I apologize. I object to the leading, the speculation. For roll. Well, I've never had anything like that happen to me before, so it was unusual like period, especially because he did not ask for my consent. After he left the room, I just hysterically started crying. I had no one to tell. I had no phone calls with my mom. Um, I didn't really feel comfortable telling my dad in the presence of my brother. So I told that doctor. All right. And can you describe who it was? Strike it. At this age, you had yet to reach puberty, right? Correct. So you had never had an exam down there? No, never. So did you have any idea what he was doing? No, I was very confused, and I was confused on why I was feeling so uncomfortable about it because I've never heard of something like that happening. And honestly, I was, like, ashamed because I didn't think it was... I felt like I shouldn't be complaining or I shouldn't be feeling the certain way. It wasn't that big of a deal. But the fact that it made me feel that way and the fact that I still think about it to this day shows that it was a big deal. Describe who the man, what the man looked like. To my under, like from my recollection, I remember the man having tan pants on. What, did he have a lab coat on? or He... I don't remember their, let me think about that, hold on. I don't want to say yes or no to that because I really don't remember about that specific detail, but I remember he was really like skinny and he was tall, well taller than me and I was 10, but he was tall to me and he had glasses and like dirty blonde to brown hair in that range right. and he was white. What made you think he was a doctor? He had that um, stethoscope. Stethoscope. And he had like a little um, clip that the doctors all had. But I did not read his name because I didn't think that event was going to be significant. And after you told Dr. Katzenstein, did you tell anyone else up until, say, 2022 and Dr. Henschke? I had told my ex-boyfriend um, in seventh grade and I started crying um, but because I told that doctor at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital and nothing was done I was kind of made to believe that it didn't matter what I went through so my ex-boyfriend was like the first person I told after that and he knew it wasn't okay and that's when I finally had an understanding of 
you know, that was not right. That's not acceptable whatsoever. And uh, marked into evidence at Joint Exhibit 1001-3817, if we can bring that up. But I can uh, read it in the interim. She denied history. This is Dr. Katzenstein's psychological progress note. Um, and uh, this is dated... Uh, I'm looking at where they put this. I think it was the 17th, but let me look. Yes, uh, October 17th. And there at the bottom, do you see the uh, what was put down by the psychologist? Yes. Now, was there ever any follow-up by anyone at Johns Hopkins when you said uh, previously a doctor had looked at her private parts but did not touch her and it made her feel uncomfortable did anybody follow up to ask you more about this? No. And since that time, uh, what happened with your memory of this? I mean, I've remembered it throughout the entire time. It's not like it, you know, just disappeared. I just have chosen not to speak up about it because, again, I thought it was silly that it, I felt that way because... When I told somebody and nothing was done about it, it made me feel that it wasn't significant. It wasn't a big deal. And without waiving any attorney-client privilege, then it was only about uh, ten days to two weeks ago the first time you told me. Again, yeah, it's because I didn't think it was a big deal because they made it out to not be one. Okay. And they, I mean, the hospital. That's mm -hmm. I should clarify. And so you, did you feel embarrassed by? I was. I don't know why. I just, like, even talking about it, it's just so personal and weird. So. But you did eventually tell Dr. Henschke. I did. I, she, she, I gained her, like, she gained my trust, and I told her. Okay. Your witness. Oh, I, I don't have any questions so does that complete the proffer? It does, Your Honor. We move the court to reconsider. Okay. You can go ahead and have a, a seat. You. And, and, and follow up to that, we've moved the court to reconsider uh, the testimony uh, as previously moved by the court to amend. But, but Mr. Anderson, we get back to the same issue, which is why I denied it before, is this was not in the pleadings. We did not discuss this during uh, jury selection. I've handled many sexual assault cases, and I understand that th that type of questioning is very particular, and it generates a lot of challenges to a lot of jurors. This jury has not been uh, addressed with that issue, and to interject this issue after we started the trial is fundamentally unfair. I'm not saying that... Ms. Kowalski is any way creating this. And like I said the other day, I assumed everything that you were telling me that what Ms. Kowalski was telling you was the truth. It's just at this time, because of we already started the trial and the pleadings did not reference this, it's too late for this particular trial. It has nothing to do with what she testifies to. It's the fact of fundamental fairness, fundamental due process rights. Um, and, and so, I, I, I mean, I, I don't see how we're going to change that specific issue. And you can ask me to keep reconsidering it, but it's going to come back to the same issue. I just had to make a record, Your Honor, and, and you did explain it thoroughly the first time. I felt necessary to at least try. Well, and and I, I appreciate that. And certainly I would encourage you to make a report to law enforcement of this particular issue in the jurisdiction of where it occurred. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about uh, where we are. The shot clock is as follows. Today, the plaintiffs consumed four hours, 15 minutes for a running total of 29 hours, 55 minutes. The plaintiffs, or sorry, the defense used an hour, 15 minutes for a running total of 10 hours and 50 minutes. Who do we have tomorrow? Um, we have Dr. Brewerton. Uh, we have uh, 
Dr. Kirkpatrick, uh, briefly Dr. Hanna, and I think that will fill the day. Yes, and if by some miracle uh, council is able to complete the new burger uh, edits and then get to you, then we would try a new burger, but that doesn't sound like it has much of a chance. Well, I don't think Ms. Crowell's has had an opportunity yet to address it since she's been sitting here all, all day long. Yes, I understand. Correct, Your Honor. And, and, and what I reviewed, to be clear, in Volume 1 was all about Dr. Sally Smith. So counsel said that he did not designate those. So I would ask counsel to just kind of double check the designations Absolutely. that were sent over to us to make sure I'm looking at the right ones yes. so that we're, you know, on the same page. Yes, I, I, I will. And most of that, uh, counsel, I don't think is relevant to this case. So I will go back and double check it within an hour getting home and tell you. Okay, that'd be great. And, and while we're talking about depot designations, are there any depot designations rulings that I owe you all, or have I ruled on all that have been given to me with depositions? Well, Judge, I don't think you ruled on all of Dr. Vo's. You ruled on one. Well, there, there was one depot that I didn't have. I think there are two you don't have, Judge. There's three total, my recollection. But it would be helpful, actually, I think, to know there's been a lot of depths designated. If plaintiffs, count, plaintiffs counsel know which ones are actually going to read in, so we can focus our energy on that, that would be particularly helpful. If, in other words, if you've already decided that some of them are not going to be submitted, and just and you're focusing on these, then that would be helpful. I will advise as soon as we can. It's been a hectic pace, and I mean, now we're trying to get our case in, but I will. Understood. Because you know. I some point I need some time myself to be able to review and, and make rulings and then get it to you and then have your IT folks cut the, the video. Yes, sir. Your Honor, do you recall reading volumes of Sally Smith's depositions? I think I have ruled on three volumes of Sally Smith of defense, or was it five? Or There's five volumes, Judge. I, I think I've only ruled on three, but I, I, okay. I think I've only been given three and I've only seen designations for three. And I think I've only received objections by the defendants because there's a lot of people that I didn't get any objections from the plaintiffs that I've made rulings on, uh, especially the ones this weekend. Yeah, we'll check that. I haven't. Uh... And I was trying to be clear in my orders saying, you know, I had plaintiff and defense objections, and this one I only had defendants' objections. So, I mean, I think I was trying to be clear in the orders to kind of help what, what I thought was missing. I will check and find out if we are if the court is owed objections, and we'll get those to you promptly. And perhaps our our teams could co communicate to me with each other to see if we're on the same page about this. So we only submit one packet to the court as opposed to dueling packets, I think would probably be helpful. Well, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's my, the same. It, it is what it is. It is that we use the full size. <laughs> yes. The full size. Yes, Judge. Depo as opposed to the four pages to one. We got that one. Have we got that I, one? I, I can clarify some regarding who we intend to read or play. Sure. Uh, we intend to play the depositions of Dr. Perno. Dr. Napolitano, that's been discussed. Uh, we intend to play the deposition of Dr. Vos, the most recent deposition regarding her text messages. We intend, as the court's aware and defense is aware, to use Dr. Neuberger, a mixture of reading and playing, because I think only his third was by video. Uh, we intend to use portions of Dr. Sally Smith. And the last that comes to mind at the moment would be a deposition taken recently of Amy Jones, who I believe um, is sort of some sort of HR person at the hospital. Uh, that's those are over top of mind at the moment. So can I clarify just the last votes? Because I think that's been ruled on. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not ruled on. I'm just announcing. No, I, you're not worried about the first two votes. That's no, all. No, we're not. Okay. Amy, I mean, it's Amy Jones. Oh, sorry. Well, on Dr. Vo's, I don't think I received any plaintiff's objections. I think I only received defendant's objections. I, and I don't think there were any counter designations. Okay. And then for 
Is it Amy Jones? Or whatever. I don't think I received a deposition. I think there was some objections. There will be a general objection to her. Judge, she's not an eligible witness for publication. She's a hospital employee, but not designated as any corporate representative or that sort of thing. So we'll object to that. But I haven't, I don't remember seeing the designations on her. I could be wrong. No, we don't object. I don't think I've seen that. We did object. Yeah, my recollection is there were only like three objections for that one. I was like, that was going to be the easy one. There weren't that many, Judge. But I think we both need to just regroup and double check what's been sent so that we can clarify that with the court. Anything else before we talk about what time for tomorrow? I see Mr. Altenburn popping up. Just a quick question, Your Honor. In light of the jury's questions about when specific people were under orders and your observation that maybe that could be an instruction, it seems to me that maybe then rather than trying to describe these orders in an omnibus fashion, that I might be able to grab something that could explain to the jury when Mr. Kowalski and Kyle could visit under what circumstances. I might be able to do something that's sort of a simple English explanation of those visitation parameters if that is something you're interested in. I'm not opposed to that so long as we have from this state to this state. Right. And then it becomes clear for the jury so they don't have to guess what we're talking about. I haven't tried to study these orders to see if I can make it clear and specific that way, but if I can, maybe that would be useful. Anything else before we talk about what time for tomorrow? Yes, Your Honor. If the court has had an opportunity to consider our motion for rehearing as to Dr. Brewerton and Dr. Kirkpatrick's last visit, again, citing the binger and the fact that we do, the court has generously allowed the defense to have another expert who could comment on it. I have not heard or read anything that changes my mind on that issue. So I guess the answer is no, no reconsideration. So maybe we can make a record tomorrow and the court could actually hear the circumstances and make a decision at least as to Dr. Brewerton to begin with. Well, if you want to do a proffer, we can do that. Do you want to do that before? I was, you know, it's just you've got to come earlier. I think we got here. Yeah, I recognize that, Your Honor. I don't think we have to get here super early. It'll only be a five minute proffer just as to why. Well, how many exhibits are we going to not agree on for tomorrow? That's a new question. I mean, that's a new question, I think. I think tomorrow actually is pretty straightforward because for each of them, there are medical records and evaluations. Have you already given them the? Well, yes. Well, typically we get some and then at six o'clock we get more and then at 9 p.m. we get more. So we've gotten, I think, three listed so far. What time do you all want to be here tomorrow? 830. 830. 830 it is. Okay. We'll be in recess till 830 tomorrow morning. Have a good day, everybody.